Chapter One of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Fisher. Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. Africa, like India, seems often to cast a spell over those who visit it, and certainly at the end of 1909 I found myself under this curious fascination. I had spent some years soldiering in West Africa, and had often wished to explore the ramifications of the Upper and Middle Niger, but the difficulty of obtaining sufficient leave had been an insurmountable obstacle. My chance came at last, however, when I found myself quartered at Freetown, the capital of our British colony of Sierra Leone, and due for six months' leave. I determined to spend my furlough in a journey down the river from its source, making shooting excursions at suitable points in its basin, and directing my steps towards Timbuktu. From Timbuktu I proposed to cross the Sahara Desert, striking almost due north for Algiers. The strange tales I had often heard of this desert, and the curious wandering tribes who inhabit it, interested me, and made me wish to ascertain for myself the truth of them. The first thing to be done was to get leave. In due course this was obtained, and at the same time I was informed that the French officials along my route had been told to offer me every facility for my journey. In the meantime I had not been idle, as I was well aware of the time required before official sanction would be received. I calculated the kind and amount of stores necessary, and these, with my ammunition, were on their way out from England. In the Niger Valley, almost every kind of West African game is to be found, including elephant, lion, and giraffe. My armament consisted of a three o three magazine sporting Lee Speed rifle, a four fifty cordite express, and a twelve bore shotgun. I took good care to be amply provided with ammunition, not only for sporting purposes, but also for self-defense, as my journey was not wholly without danger. I calculated on getting a good supply of fresh meat by my gun, and so my stores consisted chiefly of such articles as flour, tea, jam, and some soups. I reckoned that the journey would take about five months, and had sufficient supplies to last me that time. One of the chief difficulties was to find a servant who could speak the requisite languages, and was willing to accompany me to Algiers. In West Africa, the language problem is always a difficult one. Tribes are so numerous, and all speak different languages. In many cases, these languages bear not the slightest resemblance to one another, and are exceedingly hard to acquire. By a stroke of good fortune, I succeeded in procuring a Susu native, who had a fair idea of cooking for white men, and, according to himself, Savied plenty all the talk master want. This, being interpreted into plain English, meant that he could speak fluently the languages I required. Having had some experience of the West African Negro and his capacity for lying without turning a hair, I took the precaution to put him to the test. He was made to discourse at some length with a Malenki and a Bambara, these being the two languages most necessary, and, as he quitted himself fairly satisfactorily, I engaged him forthwith. After crossing the French frontier, these two languages were those most widely spoken, until I should enter the Sahara. Here only Touaregs and Arabs would be met with. I had a sufficient colloquial knowledge of Arabic for practical purposes. Further, I knew that at the big French centers I could always procure an interpreter if necessary. At the same time, I wished it possible to avoid having any dealings with these gentry, as they have gained a not undeserved reputation for being first-class rogues, who, in the name of their masters, extort presents from the ignorant natives of the villages through which one passes. In West Africa, baggage is made up in loads not exceeding sixty pounds, is carried by native porters on their heads. Consequently, all my possessions had to be arranged in a manner suitable for this kind of transport. Most West African bush paths are not more than three or four feet wide at most. Hence, carriers have to walk in Indian file. Indeed, so accustomed are they to this mode of progression, that even where the government has built wider roads, they can never be induced to walk otherwise than one behind the other. 
as paths are usually so narrow, being closed on each side by dense bush, loads, besides not being too heavy, must not be too bulky. I had altogether fourteen carrier's loads. My plan was to follow the Sierra Leone Railway to its terminus at Pandembu, where I arranged to pick up my carriers. One of my chief difficulties was to arrange for money on the journey. To carry a large sum, such as would be required for the whole expedition, on my person or in my baggage, would be highly imprudent, and only act as a tempting bait to the numerous thieves and highwaymen who are always met with in these countries. There was the further complication of requiring English and French money. After some trouble, I settled with a French firm at Freetown for drafts payable at two different places on my route, and a further draft to be paid at Marseille. I was the more easily able to arrange this as, after leaving Sierra Leone, the whole of my journey would be through French possessions. As it would be impossible for mails to reach me, I resigned myself, not altogether regretfully, to being without letters for the next five or six months. At last my preparations were complete, and, on the 6th of January, I left Tower Hill Barracks to catch the seven o'clock morning train from Freetown for Bow, where a halt is made the first night. It was with feelings of joy at getting away from civilization, and the delightful pleasure of knowing I should spend the next few months in close contact with all the beauties of nature, that I set forth that glorious tropical morning. It is somehow easier to cast aside the gnawing cares of the world when one is alone with nature. In tropical Africa, nature is so beautiful that the most unimaginative being can hardly fail to be stirred by her fascinating charms, and forget for the time the existence of sordid civilization. The scene that met my eye at the station was a busy and amusing one. Most of the people present were the so-called Creoles. These people are the inhabitants of Freetown, who have become civilized, more or less, and are fond of aping the European dress and customs. The young men wear stiff collars and starched shirts with the gaudiest ties and handkerchiefs imaginable, while the ladies vie with one another in the brightness of the hues of their frocks. On their heads they wear the most brilliant colored handkerchiefs, and this is the prettiest part of their dress. The crowd around the little train is so great that it is only with considerable difficulty that one is able to approach one's carriage. Everyone is talking at the same time, so the noise is deafening. It must be understood that not one-tenth part of this crowd is going in the train. Most of them are only idle spectators. The departure of the train is always a great excitement for the Sierra Leone native, and invariably attracts a large and fashionable mob. At last, all preparations are complete. The guard blows his whistle. Those who are passengers are unceremoniously bundled into the train, whilst the spectators are as unceremoniously bundled out of the way, and amidst final goodbyes from the assembly on the platform, we steam out of the station. The babble of voices having ceased, comparatively quiet now reigns, and at last I have a chance of collecting my thoughts and observing my fellow travelers. We are three in my compartment, all going together as far as bow. Each of us is provided with an ample chop-box, or luncheon basket. In West Africa, it is a well-established maxim never to get separated from two articles, namely one's bedding with mosquito curtain and one's chop-box. These two things are most necessary to one's comfort, if not to one's existence. Without the bed and mosquito curtain, you'll be devoured by mosquitoes with the almost certain result of a bad dose of fever. Without the box of provisions, one runs the risk of starvation. One of my companions is a trader who is going up-country to investigate the advisability of starting a new store in a district recently opened up by the railway. The Sierra Leone line has done much to increase the trade of the colony and hinterland during the past few years. Trade in palm kernels and ground nuts is brisk, and the railway has quite as much as it can do to cope with the goods traffic. The other is a bank official going to bow on some duty connected with his bank, which has large interests in the protectorate. The Sierra Leone Government Railway is a line of narrow gauge running almost due east from Freetown for 220 miles. Its terminus is at Pendambu, close to the Liberian frontier. Officially, the railway ends at Baima, 212 miles from the capital of the colony, the last eight miles being called a tramway. 
but practically there is no difference between the railway and the tramway, and both are of identical gauge. There is also a tramway running from Boya into the Yoni country. Trains run three times a week in both directions. Traveling is not comfortable judged by the standards of English railways. The compartments are small, the seats of the carriages are uncommonly hard, and the line is roughly laid. But greater comfort will no doubt come in time, and it is an undoubted boon for the traveler to have a railway of any description. In the olden days, these two hundred odd miles used to take him fourteen or fifteen days with carriers, instead of only two. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. The country of Sierra Leone consists of two parts the colony and the protectorate. The colony is mountainous and runs out in a peninsula from the protectorate or hinterland. Roughly speaking, the colony is the civilized part and the protectorate is, in West African parlance, the bush. In the peninsula, a quantity of ginger is grown, and through these plantations the train wends its way for some twenty miles. On the left is the Sierra Leone, or Bunts, River, and on the east is a rocky range of hills. After leaving the colony, the line runs for about 120 miles through typical West African bush scenery to bow. For those who have never seen it, it may be of interest to say a few words about the West African bush. It generally consists of a tangled mass of small trees and undergrowth, never more than some thirty feet high, so thick that it is impossible to see more than two or three yards inside it, and so dense that without cutting a path it is not possible to force one's way through it. This bush is often the haunt of the smaller species of wild game, such as several cats, bush pigs, and small antelope, but these are difficult to see, and still more difficult to shoot, on account of the thickness of the foliage. Every three to five years the bush is cut by its owner, for all bushland has a proprietor, who will make himself known soon enough if anyone else attempts to appropriate his particular piece of land. The landlord then clears the ground and makes a farm, planting rice, ground nuts, or whatever is suited best to that locality. This clearing process is often considerably helped by first burning the undergrowth. Bush fires for this purpose are started in January or February, when the vegetation has been dried by the hot tropical sun and by the dry winds called harmattan, which blow about this time of year. After getting his crops from the land, the native allows the bush to grow up once more, and so rapid is this growth in the luxuriant damp atmosphere that, in a few months, after the rains have commenced, the untutored eye can discern no trace of the previous existence of a farm. In West Africa, the area of land under cultivation is relatively small. For miles upon miles there is this dense bush, with here and there a clearing for a farm or a small village. Although vegetation is so luxuriant, flowers are not often seen. We steamed into Bow about eight o'clock that night, very much shaken and extremely glad to get out of the train. We arrived in pitch darkness, the train was late, and no such luxuries as lamps exist at this station. After much altercation between my boy and the native guard, my baggage was produced from the van, and I made my way towards the rest house, where travelers are accommodated. My recollections of that night are not altogether pleasant ones. After dinner, I sat down in one of the Madeira chairs belonging to the rest house, thinking I would enjoy a quiet pipe before turning in. I had no sooner sat down, however, than a curious scrunching noise in my chair made me start and jump up pretty quickly. I had disturbed a scorpion, and only just discovered the fact in time to prevent the horrible brute from biting me. The rest house had evidently not been inhabited for some time, and the scorpion had no doubt made himself a comfortable home in that particular chair, so nearly to my discomfiture. An amusing scene ensued while my servant and two other natives pursued the luckless scorpion with sticks, boots, and anything that came handy, shouting and hurling anathemas at him all the while. After a considerable number of lucky escapes, owing chiefly to want of skill on the part of his pursuers, he was finally laid low by a blow from one of my heavy marching boots, and after this he was soon dispatched. 
allowing me to pass the remainder of the night undisturbed. The train left at eight o'clock the following morning, so I was up betimes to secure a seat in the very small compartment which was all that was now allotted to travelers. Our train was to take us to Daru, a distance of eighty miles. I was met at Daru by two officers of the West African Frontier Force, who have their headquarters there. I was kindly invited to stay at the barracks during my sojourn at Daru, an invitation of which I gladly availed myself. The barracks are picturesquely situated on the banks of the Moa River. The officers have a very nice mess and comfortable quarters. They have an English-built four-oared boat on the river, where fishing and bathing are also to be had. In addition, there is a tennis court in the mess grounds, so that, for West Africa, they are extremely well provided for. The Frontier Force Battalion in Sierra Leone is recruited from West African natives, and is a colonial corps, the officers being seconded from their regiments for short periods of duty under the colonial office. The officers are keen soldiers, and the men, under their able instruction, form excellent fighting material. They have done a lot of good service for the Empire in West Africa ever since they were first raised, a good many years ago. I spent that night at Daru, and next morning dispatched my servant baggage to Pendembu by road. In the afternoon, by the courtesy of the railway officials, I was provided with a trolley, on which I had arrived at the end of the railway, where I found my baggage already installed in the rest house by the faithful Surrey, my servant. That night was passed in parading my carriers and allotting to each man his particular load. These men were to accompany me as far as the French frontier, where I had arranged to be met by a fresh gang. The next morning, the ninth of January, at daybreak, all was ready for a start. My escort, consisting of a non-commissioned officer and three men, kindly supplied by the officer commanding the frontier force, were well accustomed to their work, and had all the loads with their respective carriers ready. It was a curious sight to see these strange figures, each man squatting behind his load, waiting for the order to raise it up upon his woolly head. Their attire was of the scantiest and raggedest description. One man proudly displayed a threadbare frock coat, so tattered as scarcely to hang together on him, while another had a red and yellow tam o shanter jauntily placed on the side of his head. These carriers are a very merry, cheerful bunch. However long the day's march, however hot the sun may be as they trudge along with a heavy load on their heads, they seldom grumble, but chatter away to each other and crack jokes with their neighbors. Of course, carriers vary a great deal, both in their value as porters and in their disposition. The best carriers in Sierra Leone are the Mendi tribe. These people have been accustomed for centuries to carry heavy loads from the interior down to the big native markets near the coast, and are hard to beat as porters. Our road now lay nearly due north, keeping just on the British side of the Anglo-Liberian frontier. Very soon after leaving Pendembu, we came into the mountainous region, which extends almost uninterruptedly along the border. The bush path here was very rough, and led us, for the most part, up and down steep hillsides. This country did not appear to be much populated. Occasionally a small village was seen half hidden in the bush. At rare intervals we passed a man carrying a load of palm kernels on his back, probably on his way to the nearest station of the railway, where he would dispose of his burden at a good price to the local trader. These people were Kisis. They have a peculiar way of carrying their loads. A kind of basket is first made of twisted palm leaves, in shape rather semi-cylindrical. This basket is packed with the kernels, and is then slung in the following manner over the back. Two braces are made, one to pass under each armpit and over the corresponding shoulder, while a third brace leads from the top of the basket and passes around the forehead. It is very noticeable that men who carry loads in this fashion are not half so well set up as the men is who always carry the loads on the top of their heads. We reached the small village of Mafendu about three o'clock that afternoon, and here I decided to halt for the night. The chief was summoned and told to provide myself and my party with accommodation for that evening. I did not much relish the idea of sleeping here, as it was a very dirty cattle town. The houses looked like pigsties, and were evidently the inhabitation of cows as well as human beings. However, it was not feasible to push on any further that night, 
as the next village was a long way off, so I had to make the best of Mafindu. The village itself is half in British and half in Liberian territory. The center street, or alleyway, divides one country from the other. Each portion has its own chief with its own set of laws. A little cotton is grown in this part of Sierra Leone, each village producing sufficient for its own needs. Cotton is grown in small clearings close to the villages. It is picked by the women, who also clean it and spin it. The process is as follows. The cotton pod is rolled between two smooth stones in order to crush out the cotton seeds. It is then spun onto wooden spindles, and at the same time rubbed with bone dust to harden it. Cloth is usually woven by the men. West African cotton is very short in the staple, so that cloth is made in narrow strips about nine inches wide. To make a garment, it is necessary to sew a dozen or more of these strips together. The cloth is coarse, but of good quality. In some parts of the country, exceedingly pretty colored cloths are made. Some of these are quite handsome as tablecloths and similar ornaments. The people themselves have few wants in the way of clothing. The men wear a scanty loincloth, and the women have a somewhat larger one, which is thrown round the body, enveloping it from the breast to the feet. The children of both sexes run about naked until they are thirteen or fourteen years of age. Most of the wealth of the peasants of this region is in their cattle. The animals are small, and the cows give little milk, but the cattle are sturdy, hardy little beasts, and seem seldom to suffer from sickness. At last the chief came to tell me that all was ready for my inspection, with many humble wishes that I should find my abode comfortable. My friend was not a very imposing-looking individual. Although a chief, he was no better clothed than his dirty, scantily-dressed fellow-citizens. He appeared to be very old as he hobbled up, leaning heavily on a stick. His chief pleasure in life was to take snuff, and his delight when I gave him a small present of tobacco is not easily described. Tobacco is a most useful article of commerce in these countries. Travelers should be careful to be amply supplied with the fragrant leaf. It will buy most things in the bush, as natives are fond of it, both for smoking and snuff-taking. The country here is the northern limit of Mendiland. The Mendes are pagans, and are, to a great extent, governed by the secret society called Poro. The Shis frame the laws of the country with the help of the society, and all land under cultivation is subject to the Poro laws with regard to the gathering of crops. When Poro is put on a crop, the owner is not allowed to gather it until the Poro is taken off. For a civilized person, it is hard to understand the signification of Poro, or to realize the tremendous influence it has on the Mendi people. Medicine is often placed at the entrance to a farm to scare away evil spirits. This is usually a little rice, or a few bananas, or it may be some eggshells, which are either laid on the path or placed in an old calabash hung over the entrance, supported on two sticks. Forms of juju, or medicine, are varied and peculiar. Charms are also common among these people. The Mendes hold two particular charms in great respect. One is called Suk, and is warranted to bring the lucky possessor good fortune. The other is called Hor, and is used to protect the owner from evil influences. It is made of a plant which is fairly common in the hinterland, and which is boiled into a thick greenish substance. This is then eaten, and has the property of increasing the drinking powers of the consumer. This property enhances the prestige of the individual, as the Poro society is much given to drinking. The usual form of charm in West Africa consists of a few verses of the Koran written on paper and clothed in a leathern amulet. These amulets are worn round the neck, on the arms, or hung up in the house. They are also frequently found tied to horses' tails and manes. The Mendes, however, not being Mohammedans, do not often indulge in this special kind of charm. The Poro Society is not entirely a good one. For instance, the Human Leopard Society, at which the object is the murder of persons who are undesirable to the society, is an offshoot of Poro. Boys of twelve to fourteen are circumcised by Poro, and these are the youngest members of the organization. Every village has a portion of bush in the vicinity allotted as the Poro bush, and kept sacred for the rights of the society. Anyone who penetrates it is killed without mercy. 
A candidate for initiation must obtain the consent of his relatives, who are required to stand surety that he will not flinch or attempt to withdraw while undergoing the ordeal. He is then confined in the poor bush and not allowed to leave it or speak until the conclusion of his initiation. He is unexpectedly subjected to trials of fire and attacks from wild animals. After this period of probation, he is washed, a white cap is placed on his head, and he is given a staff decorated with beads. He is then made to swear a solemn oath never to reveal the secrets of the society. This oath is usually administered on a tortoise shell, which is regarded with special veneration by West African natives, for the tortoise is supposed to be a beast of exceptional wisdom. After this, he is taken to the lodge of the society, which is ornamented for the occasion with palm leaves and other foliage. He then has marks cut on his back in the shape of triangles, with the apex on the spine and the base on the ribs. Circles are also cut on his breast. The members of Poro are summoned by a messenger bearing a branch of a tree, on which are tied a number of pieces of stick. The number of these sticks denotes the number of days to elapse before the meeting will be held. Cold nuts are used as symbols of peace and war. Two red colas signify war, whereas a white nut broken in two indicates peace. Another curious custom which exists among the Mendes is that many families claim to belong to different species of animals. Many say they are of the bird family. These will not eat eggs. Again, Others claiming to be descended from crocodiles will not kill these animals. Another secret society is the Bundu. This has for its object the education of young girls. The teachers are mature women who instruct the students in the duties they will have to perform as wives and mothers. This society is a very old one. Every village has a Bundu bush in the same way as it has a Poro bush. Men are not allowed to enter under pain of death. There are many other societies of a more or less religious nature, but these are the most important. Women are regarded as of small consequence by these people. They are made to work in the farm and cook food for the husband while he remains idle. When a man wants a wife, he goes to the parents and haggles over the price to be paid. In Sierra Leone, a wife costs three to four pounds, but the price varies a good deal. The sum is paid in the presence of witnesses, and the woman becomes his wife. Polygamy is the rule among pagans as well as among Mohammedans. The wife has no rights. The husband can flog her or maltreat her without the woman having any chance of redress. Girls are married at twelve, and, in many cases, even at nine and ten. On the 10th of January, I left Mafindo, crossing the picturesque Moa River. The inhabitants were now Kisis. The river is crossed in dugout canoes. These canoes are simply made from the trunk of a tree, which is roughly hewn out in the hollow form of a boat. In the hands of a native, these cumbersome and untrustworthy-looking craft are most handy in the West African rivers. The boatman manipulates his canoe with a single paddle, which serves not only to urge it forward, but also to steer it. I must own that I never feel very safe in a dugout. One has to sit uncommonly still for fear of capsizing, and an immersion in the swift current of the crocodile-infested streams of this region would be a far from agreeable experience. The Kisis have three different masters, as a portion of their country lies in Liberia, and yet another portion is under French jurisdiction in Guyana. The Kisis are a warlike tribe who have given a good deal of trouble to the British government. They were constantly at war with their neighbors in Sierra Leone, the Mendes and the Konas. They also joined King Samory's sofas in 1891 and raided the Protectorate. Their power was finally crushed in 1905 by an expedition carried out by the Sierra Leone Battalion of the West African Frontier Force. A great deal of the Kisi country is under cultivation, for they are good and economical farmers. In their farms are to be seen flourishing crops of rice, maize, and bene seed. Their villages are badly kept and the houses are very small and dirty. The following day, we cross the Mali River, which separates Kisi country from the Kona tribe. Transport across this river is done by a still more hazardous method than on the Moa River, on rafts. These rafts are made of roughly hewn logs lashed together with 
tai tai. Tai tai consists of supple creepers growing in profusion in the bush, which are most useful in a country where no rope is available. One's baggage is first deposited on the raft, forming a dry and fairly steady platform. After this, the passenger climbs warily onto the top of his worldly possessions, seating himself cautiously so as not to upset the somewhat delicate equilibrium of the craft. The raft is worked by a native with a long pole, who directs its unsteady course from the stern end. If you have any holes or weak spots in your boxes, this method of transport will unfailingly find them out. Water rushes through the wide gaps between the logs of the raft, and miniature waves frequently wash over the platform. Kona country is decidedly mountainous. It is intersected by broken ranges of hills, rising to a height of nearly 3,000 feet above the sea. The valleys between these ranges are covered with grassland, the haunts of bush cow, as the small West African buffalo is termed. The Konas are an offshoot of the great tribe of Mandingos, which inhabits a vast stretch of land from the middle Niger to the Gambia. Their country was devastated by the Sofas about 1890. Consequently, a large number of the people were exterminated or taken into slavery. Peace now reigns, however, and the people are regaining confidence, and the population is increasing. Mohammedanism is making rapid progress among them, although a large number are still pagans. Missionaries are scarce in these parts. During my travels, I do not recollect seeing a single Christian among these people. In the village where I stayed that night, I saw what is an unusual sight in Sierra Leone, a horse, or, to be strictly accurate, a small and weedy-looking pony. The proud owner was the chief, whose dignity and authority were considerably augmented by the possession of this quadruped. The disease called tryptophanesomiasis, conveyed by the tsetse fly, is very prevalent in the protectorate, and is fatal to horses and cattle. It is, however, extremely local, certain districts being quite free from its ravages. This probably accounts for the fact that cattle can often live where horses cannot, for cattle never wander very far, thus possibly not getting into the infected area whereas horses naturally cover greater distances and would be more likely to pass through a tsetse fly zone. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood Read by Robert Fisher In the northern Kona country, some good bush cow shooting is obtainable. In the grasslands before mentioned, these animals are wont to feed at night and during the early hours of the morning, and this is the best time to come up with them. When the sun gets hot, they retire into the bush, where they remain till late in the afternoon. They are generally to be found near water, and appear to drink in the evening and early morning. I spent a couple of days after these fine beasts, but did not have as good sport as I should have had a month or two later, when the grass is burnt. Bush cow shooting is certainly one of the most exciting forms of sport with big game. This animal is probably one of the most dangerous to tackle. A wounded bush cow almost invariably charges and is extremely vicious. In cover, such as long grass or bush, he is exceedingly dangerous. Indeed, it is very foolish to follow a wounded animal into such places. He will lurk under cover with his head turned in the direction from which he expects his enemy and charge when within ten yards or so. Many serious accidents have occurred to sportsmen of late years in this manner. Finding the grass still so high, I did not linger long in this district, but pushed on for the Tembukunda range and the sources of the Niger. The following day, I had an unfortunate mishap. It was early in the morning, and I had stopped to have a little sport with some pigeon in a farm. My sole caravan, with the exception of one carrier, had gone on. I was turning sharply to shoot a bird flying off to my right when I struck my leg against a stump of a tree. A sharp piece of wood, about three inches long, penetrated just under the kneecap, causing me to fall down in agony. The stick was firmly wedged in the flesh, so that the united efforts of my carrier and myself were unveiling to extract it. I accordingly dispatched him at once to stop my caravan and summon my servant with my small medicine case. After cutting the flesh, 
I was able to withdraw the piece of wood, but my leg was now so swollen and painful that I found it impossible to walk. The sergeant of my escort and my boy managed to rig up a hammock by utilizing one of my blankets and a bamboo, and in this I was slung, feeling more like a sack of goods than a human being, and thus transported for the remainder of that day's march. The next few days were anything but a pleasant experience. I developed bad blood poisoning in the knee and was confined in my hammock. The road was extremely rough, sometimes leading up the side of a mountain, which was so steep as to appear like a veritable precipice. When going up these inclines, in my uncomfortable conveyance, my leg got jolted unmercifully, and I suffered excruciating pain. I think the worst day was on the 15th of January. Between the villages of Kandamdu and Kandama, there is a stretch of bush for about eight miles, which contains some of the thickest, most impenetrable cane break it has ever been my lot to encounter. The path I was following was evidently little frequented, and was some miles east of the usual trade route, from the north to the south of the protectorate. Our road lay along a swampy valley, much overgrown with a stiff, unyielding reed. The native matchet, which is universally used for cutting bush, was quite useless against the stubborn, fibrous stuff, and the only alternative was to force our way through it. Progress was very slow. The carriers in front of me with loads on their heads had the greatest difficulty in making a path for themselves, whereas my hammock men had a far harder task in getting the unwieldy hammock through without upsetting me in the bush. I had to be carried by two men, whilst the other two bearers hurled their weight against the reeds and made a path for us to follow. On the 16th, I arrived at a small village in the Tembukunda Range, about three miles from the spot where the Niger rises. Here, I had a great disappointment. I was informed that there was no path leading to the river source, and that the track lay over exceedingly rough, precipitous mountains. This information proved to be only too correct. I was quite unable to walk, and to carry a hammock up those rugged precipices was quite impossible. I therefore had reluctantly to give up any idea of seeing the actual source of the great Niger River. The river is said to rise in a big rock, which is also the source of four other rivers. These are the Felico, which flow into the Niger in French Guiana, the Bagwe, and two smaller rivers. The Bagwe is one of the biggest rivers in Sierra Leone. The Niger here is known by the name of Tembuku, or Joleba. In the Susu language, much spoken on the upper reaches of the stream, the word Jolaba means he who can run faster than any other man. There is a curious legend attached to the source of the Niger. The natives have a superstition that a devil lurks inside the rock where it rises. It is said that any man who is intrepid enough to approach the rock and gaze on it will be killed by this demon. In consequence of this sinister reputation, it is the habit of the local savage to shun the neighborhood of the source. By judicious bribery, he can be induced to show a stranger the spot, but his manner of doing so is peculiar. He will, on nearing the rock, turn around and walk backwards towards it, at the same time covering his eyes with one hand so as not to see the haunted place, while with the other hand he indicates the point where the river rises. This rock forms one of the boundary marks on the Anglo-French frontier, separating Sierra Leone from French Guiana. The stone has inscribed on it, upon the western side, the fact that that portion is inside the British border, and the names of the members of the Boundary Delimitation Commission are here written. On the eastern side, it is stated that that portion is in French territory, and the names of the Boundary Commission are also here similarly inscribed. The Niger rises at a height of under 4,000 feet, in a very wild, uninhabited country. The Tembukunda range is exceedingly rocky and precipitous. It consists of a rugged, broken mass of peaks. In many cases, hills are separated from each other by steep, narrow valleys or gullies. The sides of these mountains are covered with thick, grassy bush. This grass grows to a height of 12 feet and more in the rainy season. When ascending a peak, it is impossible to see the summit not because it is so high, but merely because the vision is obstructed by this tall grass. Bushfires were just commencing when I passed through the country. 
It was a beautiful sight at night to see the huge flames working their way up the steep mountainsides, just like fiery serpents as they coiled and twisted themselves around some piece of bush a little greener than the rest and able to resist them for a short moment. These fires are started by natives in order to clear the ground by burning down the bush so that they can plant their crops. When the harmaton wind and the sun have dried the vegetation, it burns with ease. A fire thus started rapidly spreads over many miles of country. It certainly does a considerable amount of harm by killing a number of beautiful trees every year. Where trees are numerous, and many are thus burnt to the ground, the tendency is naturally to decrease the rainfall of that district. On the other hand, it is argued that burning the bush fertilizes the soil through the medium of the ashes of the leaves and burnt vegetation. In any case, it is a very old custom among West African natives, and one which would be extremely hard to repress. The Negro is naturally a lazy man. Consequently, this mode of clearing the bush peculiarly appeals to him, since it demands so little effort on his part. Bird life is not so abundant as might be expected in Sierra Leone. The large expanses of almost virgin bush one would imagine to teem with wild birds, but this is far from being the case. In the forest country, the hornbill is very common. These birds are generally seen in large flocks and assimilate well with the solitude of their surroundings as they hover from one tree to another with their peculiar flight, uttering their weird, mournful cry. Their flight reminds one forcibly of a switchback, working very slowly, as they flutter first up and then downwards, in the motion towards their goal. Hornbills often build their nests in the trunks or branches of trees. When searching for their nests, it is a common sight to see the young birds peeping out of a snug nest, almost hidden inside the hollow of an old branch. The violet plantain eater is a beautiful bird, which is also common in forest land. It has a gorgeous coloring. The body is violet and green, while the wings are a brilliant crimson. This handsome bird has a peculiar raucous note. It is a curious fact that singing birds are exceedingly uncommon in West Africa. I never recollect hearing any bird with a voice to be compared to our nightingale or black cap. In the region of the palm tree, the golden oriole is frequently met with. This little bird builds its nest suspended from the branches and leaves of the tree. On a single tree, as many as twenty or thirty may be counted. They strip the tree of all its foliage and in time kill it. Among game birds, the most widely distributed is one of the Franklin partridges, commonly known on the coast as the bushfowl. It is found anywhere in the vicinity of a farm and particularly delights to feed on cassada. This bird feeds in the early morning and again late in the afternoon, but during the heat of the day it takes refuge from the sun in the thick bush. It has a curious hoarse note, by which the cock is often heard calling to his mate in the early morning. The best time for shooting these birds is after the grass is burnt, from March to June. Besides, the young are full grown by then. They appear to breed in the late autumn, and birds hatch out in November and December. Guinea fowl are found in many parts of the protectorate. Coveys of twenty or thirty are by no means unusual. Their favorite haunts are the rice fields, in which they feed in the morning and evening. They prefer a feeding ground which has thick cover on at least one side. In this, they rest during the heat of the day and at night. Guinea fowl, like bush fowl, are often seen roosting in trees. Indeed, with the former, it is more usual to find them sitting in trees than on the ground. A guinea fowl is perhaps the most wary of West African game birds. He has very keen eyesight and hearing. He will generally have discovered your presence long before you are aware of his, and in that case he takes alarm and is off immediately. Guinea fowl run far more frequently than they fly. Once they have taken to their heels, they are extremely difficult to overtake. The only plan is to cast dignity to the winds and run at your best pace after them. Even then, your chance of getting a shot is very remote, and perhaps the wisest course is to leave them alone. Guinea fowl in the bush country are excellent eating, 
but I have noticed that these birds, when shot in a sandy region, are generally very tough. This is probably due to the different nature of food they live on. In open country, unless the sportsman is very keen, it is usually a safer plan to take a long shot with a rifle rather than attempt to stalk these very cunning birds with a shotgun. In the grass country, on the eastern frontier of Sierra Leone, I came across one or two button quail, but I think these birds are uncommon, and I never saw more than one at a time. A bird locally called the gray pigeon, but in reality a large ring dove, is very common. It feeds on maize, millet, and rice, and is seen in large numbers when the crops are ripe. In some parts of the country, a native is on duty all day in a farm when the crops are getting ripe, his business being to scare away the birds. This individual takes up his position on a raised platform, built of rush bush sticks, and placed at a suitable spot in the farm. He is provided with a whip of some supple bush creeper, which he cracks with considerable noise and effect, thereby driving away any bird which contemplates an attack on the crops. The green pigeon, or at any rate one variety of it, is found in certain localities. It is partial to water and high trees. Frequently seen on the creeks near the sea coast, it is also found upcountry in the forest belt. This bird is very swift of flight, generally flying at a considerable height. It affords some sporting shots. The coloring is a beautiful combination of green, canary yellow, and French gray. The beak is crimson, while the legs are yellow. It always appears to be in excellent condition, and is a dainty morsel for the sportsman's table. In the grass country, the lesser bustard is occasionally found. The bird is sometimes seen in pairs, but more frequently single. Its flight is slow, making it easy to shoot. The wings of the male are rich black and white, and the breast is mottled gray and tan. A strange bird, which frequents the open rocky bush country, is the standard-winged nightjar. It has a peculiar habit of crouching flat on the ground, with which its nondescript khaki color well assimilates. I have often been startled of an evening by the sudden, silent way in which this creature has risen up from my feet. During the mating season, the male bird has two curious black appendages to his tail, which add considerably to its strange appearance, and are evidently meant to attract the female bird he is courting. The cowbird is found in all localities where there is much cattle or game, it serves the useful purpose of consuming the ticks and lice on the bodies of these animals. It is black, and much resembles a starling in size and coloring. Its beak is sharp, enabling it to pick out these insects from their hiding places. The sight of one of these little birds, perched on the back of a cow, or climbing up its flanks, is distinctly comical. The widow weaver is so common that I had nearly omitted to mention it. This is a very small black and white bird with a tail consisting of two streamers, about twice as long as itself, whose habit is to flutter about from one wisp of grass to another in a curious labored fashion, just as if its unwieldy-looking tail were too heavy for a small body, and threatened every minute to weigh it down to the ground. These tails, like that of the nightjar previously described, grow to their full length in the mating season. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. In the Tembakunda Mountains, I found the variations of temperature between night and day extremely trying. The maximum by day never exceeded 90 degrees, but at night the temperature used sometimes to fall under 50 degrees. The greatest height I reached was 2,480 feet. The fall of temperature was evidently caused by the dry harmattan wind, which always blows at this time of year. This wind is said to come from the Sahara. It blows from the northeast for more or less long periods during the months of December, January, February, and March, all over the west coast of Africa. The theory that it comes from the Sahara appears to be supported by the fact that it contains a quantity of fine particles of sand. Its extreme dryness 
is particularly noticeable in the otherwise damp coast atmosphere. Books and papers curl up, and the skin gets uncomfortably parched at this season. Natives are especially susceptible to chills and pneumonia while the harmaton is blowing. In spite of sleeping in a native hut, a place not usually remarkable for its coolness, I used to shiver under my three blankets. Finally, the only way I could keep sufficiently warm to get to sleep was by lighting a huge log fire close to my bedside before retiring to rest. Of course, the cold was not really so intense, as the thermometer was several degrees above freezing, but the sudden fall in temperature between night and day had the unpleasant effect of making it appear like midwinter in England. A curious fact about the harmaton is that, owing to the sand carried by it in suspension in the air, a kind of haze is produced, which considerably restricts one's range of vision. The effect is very similar to that caused by a London fog. Indeed, when watching the sunset while a strong harmaton was blowing, I could easily imagine myself gazing at that particular appearance seen in the sky on a foggy winter's afternoon in town. At times, this curious wind blows with great violence. This is particularly the case in the early morning, when even on the march, a thick overcoat can be worn without feeling in the least degree too hot. The country in which I was now is inhabited by the Korankos. Their territory is a large one, extending for a considerable distance north and west of the Niger watershed, while a small portion of the tribe overflows eastward into French Guiana. The whole country is very mountainous, and the people are extremely poor. Most of them are pagans. These Korankos suffered considerably during the wars of the Samori, when many of them were exterminated by Isofas. The principal town is Kruto, lying about forty miles due west of the Niger source, and a trading center of some importance. At the small village of Mansun, I arrived on the day of the burial of a chief's son. The ceremony which takes place on such an occasion is somewhat remarkable, and it was my good fortune to witness it here. The whole burial rites take three or four days, the body not being taken to the grave till the last day, by which time, as can be imagined, it is in an unsavory state of decomposition and not fit to be approached by a white man. Immediately a death occurs, the women folk start lamenting. In the meantime, messengers are dispatched to all the slaves and relatives in the other villages. As this takes some days, the body is kept in the house till they have all arrived. In the case of a poro man, his body is deposited in the poro bush. No woman is permitted to look on the corpse. Dancing, singing, and tom-tomming are vigorously kept up the whole time. The women take a leading part in this portion of the ceremony. A woman's body is taken to the bundu bush until the day of burial. On the burial day, all the mourners plaster themselves with white clay and follow the corpse to the burial ground. Country claws are buried with the deceased, the number varying directly with his personal wealth. The favorite hour for the interment is sunset. After the burial, guns are fired by anyone possessing a firearm, with the intention of frightening away all evil spirits. At the same time, a sacrifice is made on the grave, of a fowl, a sheep, or a cow, according to the wealth of the dead man. These sacrifices are also offered for the purpose of propitiating the dead man's ancestors, who, tradition says, are otherwise in the habit of torturing his soul. Directly after the burial, the deceased property is taken possession of by the heir, who then invites his friends to a feast, on the principle, I suppose, of le roi est mort, vive le roi. At a burial or a marriage, the one aim of the native seems to be to spend as much money as possible. Some Korankos are members of the mystical Kufang Society. The Kufang Society has a large organization among the Limba people, who inhabit the north center of the protectorate, but it also has some influence over the western tribes. Its rites are of a mournful, morbid character. A candidate has to simulate death and is supposed to be made to return to life by the officiating members at the initiation ceremony. As he lies on a litter, apparently dead, the members dance around him, raise him up, and wash his eyes with a lotion prepared from the bark of a cork tree. 
When the dance is ended, the candidate stands over a fire, the chief of the sect then holding a burnt stick before his eyes and making him swear the sacred oath of the society. There are several Masonic signs by which a Kufung man may be recognized. He frequently has a brass ring on his toe, thumb, or wrist. One man may be recognized by a brother in the order if he crosses his arms or crosses two twigs. Every member is supposed to have an attending spirit who can be summoned, if required, by uttering certain magical words and calling the spirit by name seven times. Kufang men believe they can transform themselves into animals. If, however, they are tied up to a piece of corkwood, they believe they no longer possess this power. As far as can be ascertained, the Kufang society is not dangerous to the community. Murder does not appear to come within its scope. It seems merely to teach a highly superstitious doctrine, such as the mystery-loving pagan soul delights in. Even when these people adopt Islam, they never seem wholly to give up the mystic rites of their former pagan teachings. They certainly never lose the superstitions of their particular tribe. In cases where pagans have been converted to Christianity, exactly the same failings are almost invariably to be noticed. Amongst many of these pagan tribes, a curious superstition exists with regard to the birth of twins in a family. The twins are killed, and the mother driven out into the bush. Her twins are said to be a curse from the god the people worship, it being supposed that if the foregoing brutal procedure be not carried out, the whole family will become mad. On the 17th of January, I set out to cross the border into French Guiana. Our road lay across small mountain paths, more like goat tracks than roads, which wound laboriously up the precipitous rocky slopes. The scenery here is very wild and beautiful. As far as the eye can reach, there rise up a series of rugged peaks, clothed in light bush and tall elephant grass. Numerous mountain torrents rush down in their headlong course to the plains of San Caran, which can but faintly be discerned many miles below in French Guiana. Some of these tiny streams are destined to grow into important, if not mighty, rivers. Such a one is the Niger. To see this insignificant rivulet, here only a few feet wide, as it dashes down the eastern slopes of the Tembekunda range, who would dream that it is to develop into a wide, splendid waterway, destined to fertilize large tracts of country in western Sudan, and to carry innumerable craft on its broad bosom before it finally throws its waters into the sea twenty-four hundred miles away. My hammock boys had a rough time carrying me over these mountains. We climbed up to a height of three thousand feet, according to my aneroid barometer, before commencing the descent to the plains below. Once or twice, I must own, I felt as if my last hour had come, when, having arrived at an unusually difficult place, my satellites had to raise the hammock to the full extent of their long black arms in order to clear some huge boulder blocking the path. At these moments, I used to gaze down at the yawning precipice at my side, knowing that if one of those arms should waver, be it ever so slightly, I should in all probability be hurled down some two thousand feet into the chasm below. Fortunately for me, my bearers were brawny fellows, and we arrived at the frontier village of Farakura without any mishap. The good people of this little place were evidently not used to visits from white men, and were much astonished at my sudden appearance. The trade road between French Guiana and the east of Sierra Leone is a considerable distance north of this place, and go to the important station of Kabala, which is the headquarters of one of the Sierra Leone district commissioners. On my arrival at Ferracora, the inhabitants fled precipitously, and I found myself in undisputed possession of the village. I at once sent my servant with reassuring messages to the chief, who had taken refuge in the neighboring bush with his followers. My escort was no longer with me, for I had sent the soldiers back to Daru that morning. After some palaver, the old chief was induced to show himself, and finally led his people back to the marketplace, although it was palatable that his suspicions of us were not quite set at rest. I halted an hour here to give the carriers a little well-earned repose, and, while they were resting, 
I thought I would try the effect of a present of tobacco on my old friend, the chief. He was magical. No sooner had he got possession of this highly prized article than his face became wreathed in smiles. All suspicions either vanished or were forgotten, and we were on the best of terms. The old man produced some bananas for myself and some rice for my carriers, so that everyone was in the highest of spirits. Food has a most remarkable effect on the negro. If his stomach is well cared for, he is a cheerful rascal and will follow you almost everywhere. Whether he wants it or not, he is always ready to eat. Indeed, the amount consumed by a black man at one meal is something prodigious. I recollect seeing one of these men devour his ration, one and a half pounds of rice, which, when boiled, swells to a considerable volume, and is itself more than a meal for two very hungry Europeans. After this, he bolted two large yams, which are also a very satisfying form of diet. And finally, he ended the meal with a leg of goat. Strange to relate, after a few hours' peaceful slumber, he appeared to be none the worse for his huge repast. The road now improved considerably, and two miles farther we finally left the mountains, emerging into the broad Sankaran plains. The change in scenery was really remarkable. Broad rice and maize fields stretched on every side. In place of the wild, rugged hills, we were in a smiling land of peace and plenty. Habitations were numerous, peasants were everywhere at work in the well-cared-for farms, and one was at once struck by the general air of prosperity. We soon came to a comparatively wide road, which we followed to Serafinian. The country was now decidedly open. Bush there was, as there always is in West Africa, but it was all of the nature of very low scrub and grassland. On my arrival at Serafinian, I was greeted by a French official, who proved to be the customs officer. At certain places along the frontier of French Guiana, there are customs stations established in order to prevent smuggling of dutiable articles across the border. In charge of these posts, there are one or more Europeans. They are provided with a small staff of native policemen who assist them to carry out their duties. My friend had to supervise a section of over sixty miles of frontier. The work is arduous and not unattended by danger. Would-be smugglers naturally choose the night for their dashes across the border, so a considerable portion of the work has to be done after sunset. Even the best-behaved smugglers are not men to hold human life of much account, so that the task of capturing them is attended with a good deal of risk. The existence must be a very lonely one. Situated as he was in a desolate spot, thirty or forty miles from the nearest white man for twelve months or more, and leading a life of some danger, it requires a man endowed with particularly high spirits not to get depressed at times. This French official was blessed with a large share of his country's native vivacity. He had been fourteen months by himself at this little station, and during this long period had only seen one white man. Yet his good spirits never seemed to have failed him. He welcomed me most warmly, and was kindness itself during my short stay at Serafinian. I was glad of an opportunity of resting my leg here. The knee was much swollen, being so painful I could not bear to put my foot to the ground. For the first time I had a chance to get it well dressed, and by the nineteenth it was so much better that I decided to push on upon my journey northwards. Here I paid off my Sierra Leone carriers, whose shining black faces beamed with delight at receiving so much wealth all at once. I think, too, that they were rather pleased to get back to their native land. These people are generally eager for a job in their own country, or even perhaps anywhere in the protectorate, but as soon as they get into a foreign region where food is different, and the laws and customs are not the same, they begin to fear, which, being translated into plain English, means that they are nervous of what may happen to them. My new gang of carriers were local natives. They were not in the least anxious to be engaged, but the promise of high pay and the glowing pictures painted by the customs interpreter of the way they could enjoy life on the proceeds thereof when they returned were effective in producing a sufficient number of stalwart porters for my needs. 
the carrier in Sierra Leone is paid nine pence, but the French Guiana carrier seldom gets more than six pence per diem. My offer of nine pence, therefore, was to these men a munificent one, and the tempting bait of so much wealth was more than they could resist. The chief of the town was present while the bargain was being made, as it is the custom for all such dealings to be done through the medium of the chief concerned. He was highly interested in the question of the amount to be paid each man. In fact, so eager was he that I am afraid he had in his mind some material gain for himself rather than the welfare of his people. This chief was a strange, uncouth individual. His hair was very long and matted. He also wore his beard long, but this was twisted in a miserable thin plate, hanging down below his chest. He looked so dirty that it would have been necessary to scrape him with a spade for some time before he could possibly be washed. Finally, he had an inordinate craving for absinthe or any kind of alcohol, and, according to my French acquaintance, he was usually the worse for liquor. How he managed, in this remote little place, to get so much European liquor was an amazing problem to everyone. Few traders came that way. Besides, absinthe and such like dainties are expensive luxuries in French Guyana, where import duty is exceedingly high, and our worthy friend was a poor man. This was apparently a secret known only to himself, and one he would never disclose even when he was in his most confidential moods. So the problem is, and appears likely to remain, unsolved. Of course, there is also a great deal of native alcohol drunk by the Negro in West Africa. In all the districts within some two hundred miles of the coast, there is a broad belt of palm trees. These trees produce a wine which, if allowed to ferment, is highly intoxicating. The wine is obtained in the following manner. An incision is made near the top of the tree, close to where the leaves sprout. A calabash is then hung in such a position as to catch the liquid as it flows out. At convenient times, the owner comes to remove the contents, which are a very cool and refreshing beverage when not fermented. The mode of climbing a palm tree is peculiar. It reminds one of the proverbial monkey on a stick to see the native as he ascends a tree. Matters are not used for this purpose, but a loop is made with a supple creeper and placed round the trunk of the tree. The climber then seats himself in the free end of the loop, placing his toes against the bark of the palm. By digging his toes firmly into the tree trunk, he is able to relieve the loop of his weight sufficiently to permit of the loop being pushed further up the tree. In this manner, the top is gradually reached. The natives generally climb their trees to fetch the wine in the early morning. The liquor is then left to ferment in the sun till the evening. About sundown, the men assemble in a hut and drink the intoxicating stuff while squatting by the fireside. Women, as a rule, do not drink. At any rate, I never remember seeing a woman under the influence of palm wine in the bush. Soon after leaving Seraphinian, I crossed the Niger. It was here about ten yards wide, and not more than three feet deep. The stream at this stage is, of course, of no importance, but is of interest purely on account of the greatness which is to be its portion later. Between this spot and Farana, the stream is crossed three times, gradually widening out as it has room to expand in the comparatively flat Saracaran plain, till at Farana it is about seventy yards broad. It is fordable all the way, and until this town is reached, no canoes are seen on its waters. The banks are lightly wooded, sloping easily down to the water's edge. As the little river meanders peacefully through the bush country, it might well be a trout stream in some quiet spot in England. That day's march was a long one, for I only reached camp at six o'clock. The carriers were all behind my hammock, and some did not get in till long after dark. About eight o'clock, the headman arrived with the pleasant news that two of the porters had thrown the loads on the ground and bolted several miles back. As might have been expected, these two loads were just the most important ones of my caravan, one of which was my camp bed. I immediately ordered two men to be dispatched to retrieve them, inwardly praying that they had not already been stolen by some rapacious negro on the road. This habit of throwing down one's belongings, 
and running away when they feel so disposed is a common one among West African carriers, and is particularly annoying to their unlucky employer. However, in that land, one soon gets philosophical about such trifles, and comes to the conclusion that life is too short to permit of them being taken too much to heart. So, making the best of affairs, I lay down on a blanket, and soon was fast asleep. The next morning, having enrolled two fresh men from the village where I had slept, we were once more up to marching strength. The sun was now getting decidedly hot. The country was undulating bush, but fairly open. We had not gone many miles, when dense clouds of smoke and huge flames became visible on the horizon. It was evident we were marching towards a bush fire. The heat grew more and more intolerable as the wind drove the flames in our direction, and the porters instinctively began to run forward in order to dash through the burning zone as quickly as possible. It was the first time I had actually marched through a large bush fire, although I had, of course, often been close to a patch of burning bush country. In spite of the terrific heat, the spectacle was so splendid as to make one oblivious of the discomfort. For miles in front of us was a huge wall of leaping, hissing flames. Through the center there ran a narrow path from which the blazing fire seemed to have been hurled back to the right and left, thus giving us a free passage through the scorching bank of flames. The fire was approaching with amazing rapidity. In front of it darted out many terrified inhabitants of the bush, such as hares, field mice, and partridges, all wondering, no doubt, what was this infernal blazing demon which thus relentlessly drove them from their homes. While the ground was covered with these poor, frightened creatures, the air was full of equally terrified insects, attempting to get out of danger before their wings should be singed by those cruel flames. In many cases, their attempted flight only drove them into the clutches of their arch-enemies, the hawks, who, seemingly oblivious of the heat, circled in the air above their luckless victims, every now and then pouncing down on a tempting morsel. Once we started running, it did not take long to get to the other side of the fire, for it sweeps forward with extraordinary speed burning up the grass and small bushes in a few seconds, leaving in its wake only charred remains, and here and there a tree or bush more tenacious of life than the others, still wrapped in a sheet of flame while the fire is disappearing in the distance. Big trees are often to be seen still blazing some days after the bush fire has passed that way. After emerging from the flames, we were all begrimed with the soot and ashes, even the natives' dusky faces showed signs of having been through something blacker than the color of their skins. The change which had now come over the surface of the landscape was remarkable. In place of the waving bush, which had existed but a few minutes before, there was now an open plain, almost devoid of vegetation, carpeted with smoldering ashes. Under the heat of that tropical sun, one missed the grateful shade afforded by the bush, and the perspiration rolled in big drops from the faces of the carriers as they trudged stolidly on under the weight of their loads. On the 21st of January, our bush path merged into the main road, which runs from Ferna to Kisandugu. This is a highway, fifteen feet wide, and kept in good repair by the French. It was far superior to any road I'd yet come across, and made a very decided difference to our rate of marching. There is one great drawback to these wide roads in West Africa, that is, they are much hotter to march on, as there is no shade available. But that is, after all, a minor disadvantage, as the communications of a country are obviously greater facilitated. Here I saw a telegraph line for the first time since leaving the Sierra Leone Railway. To a visitor in French West Africa it soon becomes apparent that our colonial neighbors excel in the matter of public works in their colonies. Roads, railways, bridges, and telegraphs have the most careful attention, and a vast amount of money is spent on their construction. That night I camped at the village of Camaria. The inhabitants are an offshoot of the Corancos of Sierra Leone, and are similar to them in their habits, but as the country is more fertile, they are more prosperous. The evening was beguiled by some native music. The musician played an instrument called Baleni, 
It produces a melodious and rather liquid sound, and was one of the most musical native instruments I heard. It is made of a gourd partially covered over with goatskin, and has narrow cross pieces of bamboo nailed over it. The musician produces the different notes by hitting these cross pieces with a small stick. Most natives have a good ear for music, but their repertoire of melodies is extremely small. A man will be quite happy, however, in sitting the whole evening repeating the same bars over and over again to an admiring audience. I regret to say that I was not so easily amused, and after half an hour had to tell our friend to finish his performance elsewhere. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. By the twenty second of January, the date of our arrival at Farana, I had so far recovered as to be able to walk a few miles each day. My usual plan was to walk in the early morning until the sun got oppressive, when I retired to the hammock until about eleven. About this hour I used to halt in a shady spot by a stream and have my breakfast while the carriers cooked their food and rested. A halt till two or three o'clock gave my boy time to prepare my meal and have his own food and a rest before we again set out. On one of these occasions, just after I had halted, I noticed the unusual spectacle of two Europeans in hammocks with a number of carriers coming toward me. One of the two proved to be a lady, while the other was her husband. They stopped, and we had a few minutes' conversation. They were on their way to Kisidugu, a large French post in the south of Guiana. He was the director of the telegraphs, and they had but lately arrived from France. The lady had the characteristic vivacity and charm of her countrywomen. She was nursing a young bushfowl which they had picked up on the road, and which had hurt its leg. The poor little bird's bright eyes wore a terrified look, but this soon began to disappear under the gentle treatment of its kind mistress. The lady had never been out of her native land previously, and was much interested in the strange sights of West African bush life. Farna is the first place of any size and importance on the Niger. It consists of a native population of about two thousand, and a dozen Frenchmen. The native town lies in a hollow, close to the banks of the river, while the residency and European quarter are on a hill above. Farna does a small trade in rubber and cattle, most of which are sent down to the coast port of Kanakri. There is a caravanserai, or rest house, in the town. This useful construction is found in nearly every village of any size in French Guiana, and is a great boon to the traveler. The headman of the place is charged with the duty of keeping it clean, and, as it is constantly inspected by a French official, the house is usually in the best of order. The houses at Farina are built of mud, with walls about two feet thick and thatched roofs. They are very cool in the hot weather, but are rather cold and drafty in the rainy season, when it is a good plan to light a fire in the middle of your room. At Farina I stayed with the French district commissioner, who was a most hospitable and courteous host. Here I was delighted to be able to discard my hammock, as my knee was nearly healed. A two days' halt was necessary to collect fresh carriers, and to get information of the shooting prospects in front of me. My intention had been to march as rapidly as possible to Kurusa, and strike eastward from that place into the Zulu country, which lies between the Niger and the Ivory Coast. At Farana, however, I was informed that there was some excellent shooting to be had on the Mafu River, a tributary of the Niger, which is crossed on the road to Karusa. I therefore determined to halt at this stream on my way and sample the big game shooting in the vicinity. On the 24th, bidding good-bye to my kind hosts, I set out. The road follows within a few miles of the Niger, which here takes a northeasterly course. The country is rather thick bush, but is well populated. Villages occur every three or four miles most of the way. The people who inhabit this part of French Guiana are Malenkis, and they are dark of complexion and stoutly built. They are a higher type than the coast negro, having probably intermarried with the Fulanis, to whom 
they no doubt owe their more regular features and thinner lips. They are chiefly an agricultural people, but are not fond of work in any form. The majority of them are Muslims. The king of the tribe is called the Alamami. He has a large court, chiefly composed of his relations, who all expect to profit, either directly or indirectly, by their position. They are the channel of communication between him and his people. His council is composed of the headmen of the villages and rich native traders. The council decides all matters of dispute with other tribes. The decision for making peace or war rests with them, and, in the event of the king's death, it is this body who elects a new Alamami. Villages are organized on the same lines, each village having a chief, assisted by his council of influential villagers. The tribe is divided into two portions, those who are free and those who are captives. The free portion of each tribe is again divided into five castes. One, the Horos, who are citizens. Two, the Sores, weavers. Three, the Garanges, or shoemakers. Four, the Harabas, or blacksmiths. Five, the Yalmanes, or jesters. The Horos are the only caste from which chiefs and headmen can be selected. They are the predominant caste, and all the others are their menials. Horos can only marry in their own class. The other people can marry amongst themselves as they please. The Harabas are looked on with great contempt, corresponding in caste to the sweeper class of India. It is uncertain what was the origin of this, but there is a story connected with Muhammad and a blacksmith which probably accounts for it. It is said that the prophet was once pursued by some infidels and concealed himself in the trunk of a tree near the spot where a blacksmith was at work. The latter was on the point of betraying Muhammad's hiding place when he was struck blind by God. Muhammad, when he issued from the tree, is supposed to have cursed the blacksmith and all his kind. The Yelamanis are a very obnoxious class. They spend their time in abusing those who do not give them any money while they sing the praises of their patrons. Every chief has an entourage of these jesters. They are often equipped with musical instruments and form a sort of band which precedes him wherever he goes. Families always have some animal which is their particular aversion or evil spirit. It may be a lion or leopard or crocodile or some such beast. For example, it is supposed that if a man's evil genius was a crocodile and he should eat some of this animal's flesh, it would give him some terrible skin disease, such as leprosy. The captives, or slaves, are, of course, not now officially recognized by the French. Any man who is a slave can at once obtain his freedom by applying to the nearest commissioner. It shows how contented these captives usually are with their lot when it is noticed that they very rarely ask to be made free. They are well treated, are not hard worked, and get free board and lodging. These slaves were taken from various tribes during the intertribal warfare which raged in this part of West Africa for many years. In most cases, these people have quite forgotten the country of their origin and are perfectly content to remain with their masters. A slave, when he has gained his freedom, can be permitted to join any of the above-mentioned castes, or may marry into any of them. His position is therefore superior to that of a harabi. The captive lives with the members of the family and is in every way treated as one of them. On the 26th of January, I arrived at the Mafu River, where I had great hopes of getting some elephant. These animals were reported by the natives to come down here at this time of year. On the river, there was a certain palm of which they were very fond. Native information is, of course, frequently the only kind available, but it is also far from reliable. The negro, when interrogated, will give the answer that comes easiest to him, and will usually say what he thinks will most please you. So I was far from placing too much faith in the reports. Having procured two native hunters, I sent them out to get news of the whereabouts of the elephant, and in the meantime decided to try my luck with the third hunter after Waterbuck and Cobb, of which I had seen traces in the neighborhood. The banks of the Mafu River are swampy and the ideal home of Cobb. Here I managed to secure a fine beast, with the best head I had yet shot in West Africa. Pleased with my day's sport, 
I returned to my camp at the village that afternoon, hoping to get some good news from my hunters. I was therefore much disappointed to be told that the elephant had not been seen in that district for some weeks, and the tracks seen by the hunters were at least a month old. I had myself that morning seen elephant tracks close to a place where they had evidently been in the habit of bathing in the Mafu River. These tracks were likewise some weeks old. If there seemed no prospect of elephant in the neighborhood, I decided to follow my original plan of pushing on with as little delay as possible to the Wasulu country. The next day, I continued my journey to Kurusa. It was always my custom to set out in the morning, just before daylight, and to have a start of about half an hour on my carriers. In this way, one often got a chance of a shot at game while it was speeding within range of the bush path, and had not been disturbed by passers-by. I used to wear boots with noiseless soles, finding this a good plan for enabling me to approach without being heard. A bush path is a very sinuous affair as a rule, and it frequently happens that one suddenly turns a corner and comes in sight of game, quite as unaware of the proximity of man as you are of its presence. One morning, while walking thus ahead of my carriers, I suddenly espied a small diker dart across the road, and was fortunate enough to get a snapshot at it before it disappeared into the bush. It proved to be a crowned diker, a beautiful little animal, only fifteen inches high. This small antelope is of a bright yellowish fawn color, with remarkably long and pointed ears. The tail was short and blackish, more like the tail of most Oribis. The horns were very small and delicate, but this little beast is uncommon, so my delight at securing it was great. Moreover, I had never before seen it wild. The habit of all dikers is to conceal themselves in the bush. Consequently, one does not often see them unless a drive is organized, and this to me always appears rather an unsportsmanlike procedure. This little antelope derives its name crowned from the dainty crown-like tuft on the top of its head. The diker probably falls a victim, more than any other kind of antelope, to the native hunter. His method of killing game is distinctly brutal. When the bush is ready to be burnt, a number of hunters collect together and proceed with the boys of the village to the scene selected for the sport. The hunters line up at a suitable place on a path downwind. The boys are sent to drive the game in the direction of this path out of the bush. The procedure is as follows. Each person, being equipped with a tom-tom, an old tin, or some similar article capable of producing a noise, sets to work to make a tremendous din. At the same time, the grass is set on fire. The unfortunate animals in the bush, scared out of their senses, dash the only way open to them, namely, towards the path on which are the hunters. As they appear, at a range of a dozen yards or less, they are received with the volley of scraps of old metal, iron nails, and sharp stones, fired from the flintlock guns of the sportsmen. The din is deafening, missiles are flying in all directions, and the carnage amongst the luckless little beasts is great. At the same time, the shooting is decidedly wild, and it is a matter of congratulation that this is the case, for the slaughter is not so terrible as it would otherwise be. It is a marvel that these people do not often kill one another by their wild shooting. It is true occasionally a maimed native is seen who admits that he has been crippled in this manner, but on the whole the casualties are not so large as might be expected. Another favorite method of killing game is by trapping it. The ordinary form of trap is a long barricade of sticks and palm leaves, built up to a height of several feet. At intervals in this hedge, there are narrow openings with a running noose cunningly concealed on the far side. A drive is organized, and the animals are frightened through the bush in the direction of this barricade. On finding the openings, they naturally endeavor to escape by them, but are caught by the noose as they struggle through. Traps of this nature are set for birds as well as other small game. These barricades are frequently built as much as a mile long. Yet another form of trap I have often met with is simply a pit dug to a depth of six or seven feet, at the bottom of which is planted a stake, having the sharpened end sticking vertically upwards, ready to impale the unfortunate animal which falls upon it. The pits are usually covered over with leaves, 
and are thus invisible to the unsuspecting victim. These snares are often as dangerous to strangers as to game on account of this invisibility, and it is dangerous to wander in the bush of a hunting country without a local guide. On one occasion, one of my porters strayed away from camp after dark. In the morning, he was not forthcoming to carry his load when all was ready for the start. A comrade suddenly recollected that he had gone towards the bush the previous night, and it transpired that he had not since been seen. Search parties were at once organized and dispatched in search of him. After some time, they returned with a very pitiable-looking object, whose clothes were torn and whose nether garments were smeared in blood. This proved to be the lost carrier. He had fallen into a hunter's pit some distance from camp, and all his cries for help had not been heard. Fortunately, he was more frightened than hurt, and certainly profited by his experience, for he never wandered into strange bush again. We had now left the belt of oil palm country behind. The chief product of this district was rubber. The rubber is sheared the product of the rubber vine, and is seen in some quantities growing in the bush. But the majority of the rubber of French Guiana is grown in the east of the colony. In the farms, one notices particularly rice, maize, and groundnuts. The latter is a pretty little plant with a small yellow flower. The nuts themselves grow on the roots in the ground, something after the fashion of a potato. The fruit is ripe after the plant is flowered. On one plant will be found as many as fifty nuts. They are much relished as a form of diet by the native, while the oil of the nut is a valuable thin oil much used in Europe for making fine soaps, scents, and as a dressing similar to salad oil. In the bush, it is of the greatest use as a lamp oil, but must first be purified by straining to a thin cloth. For about three months I used nothing else, and found the light as good as that of a kerosene lamp. The trader one encounters in the bush is the native trader called the Dayula. The European trader is only met with on the coast or in the biggest markets of the interior. The term Dayula merits a word of explanation. These people are supposed to have originally been wandering Mohammedan merchants, but now the term applies to any traveling trader. The Dayula is a very thrifty individual, usually commencing life in the most humble way. He probably leaves his village with only a few francs in his pocket, which he exchanges at a suitable opportunity for some article of commerce, such as salt. He then travels a bit nearer to the coast, exchanging his salt for rubber or perhaps ground nuts. This process he continues, constantly bartering one article for another, until he finally reaches the coast. Here he purchases cloth or some such European goods and works his way back to the interior bartering as he goes. These traders often accumulate quite big fortunes by their keen business instincts. Carusa lies on a bare open plateau overlooking the Niger. It is the center of the district of the same name and is increasing in size and importance daily. The cause of its growth is the Guiana Railway, emanating from the coast port of Conakry and destined to reach Carusa in a very short time. The total length of this line will be about 400 miles. The object of the railway is to tap the trade of the Futa Jalan region and the fertile country on the banks of the Niger. As the Niger is more or less navigable from Kourousa for canoes and quite small lighters, this will also open out a line of communication from the interior of the Sudan and French Guiana to the coast. When I arrived at Kourousa, I went to pay my respects to the commissioner. I found him contemplating a ruined building with a rueful eye. It was all that remained of his house. When I had introduced myself to him, he proceeded to explain that the previous night his house had been burnt to the ground. The act was attributed to the spite of a native, who had been punished by him for some misdemeanor. Unfortunately, it was difficult to collect proof against the man, and it appeared as if he would escape from the hands of justice. The people of this town are a strange mixture of several tribes. At or near this point, three great races meet. The Sousas, from southwestern Guyana, the Malankis, from the south of the colony, and the Fulanis, from Futatalan in the west. 
The consequence is that a hybrid race formed by the intermarriage of these different clans has sprung up. The natives are perhaps a higher class than the ordinary Negro of Guyana. They inherit from the Fulanis a finer type of features, thinner lips, and more aquiline noses. Their hair, however, remains woolly and stamps them as undoubtedly Negroid. They are chiefly agriculturalists. Some, however, are cattlemen, owning considerable herds. They are distinctly lazy. This, perhaps, is hardly to be wondered at, as their country is fruitful and it needs but little work to get a living out of the soil. Besides, a man need only gather a small quantity of rubber in the bush to gain a livelihood. At Carusa, the French officials have a fine garden. Almost every kind of European vegetable is grown by them. The garden is personally supervised by one of the officers who has a large number of native gardeners under his orders. From one year's end to another, they are never without some sort of vegetables. The garden is planted on the banks of the Niger, so that a constant supply of water is available. There is also a well-stocked fruit plantation, where one can enjoy a variety of tropical fruits, such as oranges, pomegranates, bananas, etc. The French show a particular aptitude for gardening, and it was a point which struck me very forcibly, that in almost every station where there was a European, a good garden would be found. On one evening of my stay at Carusa, I witnessed the interesting and rather weird spectacle of a native dance. This particular dance was performed by some young girls to the accompaniment of much tom-toming and cheering from the assembled throng of admiring onlookers. These girls were dressed in short skirts, much resembling a ballet dancer's skirt, but made out of a sort of bulrush very common in these parts. The bodice was a brightly colored native cloth twisted gracefully round the breast and waist. On the head was worn a bonnet of plumes of various hues. We were escorted to the place of honor by the side of the chief, who then clapped his hands as a sign for the performance to commence. The spectators were thronged in a circle round him, many being provided with tom-toms and musical instruments of all descriptions. At the given signal, the dancers dashed into the ring, joining hands and advancing with a graceful swinging step towards the chief, the tom-toms all this time playing a slow measure. The music gradually became faster and faster, while the dancers increased their pace in unison with it. Turning and twisting their lithe bodies, they now retired, in every step the music waxing faster and their pace becoming more frenzied. This performance was repeated many times, and while the pace was so rapid and the dancers had got so exhausted, as to no longer be able to keep time with the music. At this moment they flung themselves on the ground before the chief, and the tom-tom simultaneously ceased beating. It appeared evident that it was now we were expected to show our appreciation of the skill of the dancing girls, so we rewarded each one with a small coin, after which they retired. Similar dances were executed by individual girls. In several cases, they displayed remarkable agility and grace in their movements. The spectators were untiring in their tom-toming and applause, and it was evident that this dance was a most popular one. Dancing is a very favorite amusement among West African natives. Every tribe has its special dances, some of which are far from graceful according to our ideas. There is, however, an undeniable fascination in seeing these weird black figures leaping and pirouetting in their picturesque costumes with the strange glow of the firelight casting mysterious shadows on them as they move backwards and forwards. In the vicinity of Carusa, the natives keep a number of beehives. These hives are frequently seen stuck up in high trees. They are made out of reeds bound in the form of a hollow cylinder, having the ends clothed with plastered mud. One of these mud doors has a hole in the center, providing an entrance and exit for the bees. The negro has a great liking for sweet things, so a quantity of this honey is consumed. Before it can be eaten by the European, he must be strained through a piece of muslin, as it is exceedingly dirty. When properly cleaned, however, it is excellent. Wild fruit is scarce, and in any case should be partaken of with great caution, as there are several poisonous varieties. There is a kind of wild plum which is fairly common in this part of French Guiana, and has a pleasant flavor. 
Occasionally, wild bananas and pawpaws are met with. They almost invariably indicate the site of an old, abandoned village. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. Mention has several times been made of King Samory and his sofas. Carusa was for some time the centre of his plundering operations. It will therefore be advisable to give some account of this enlightened chief's history before describing his doings in that country. Samory came from the neighborhood of Bobadjilizu, an important town between the north of the Gold Coast Northern Territories and the Niger. He was a Mohammedan and became a very influential chief on account of his strong personality. He collected an army of between 30,000 and 40,000 men and ravaged practically the whole of what is the colony of French Guyana, as well as a portion of the French Sudan and Sierra Leone protectorate. His troops were first composed of Mandingos from the middle Niger, but gradually, as he advanced, he absorbed large numbers of other tribes whom he had subjugated, and the whole army was designated by the name of Sofas. For fifteen years he spread terror throughout the land, on several occasions even inflicting severe reverses on the French troops he encountered. He was finally captured by the French in 1897, and died in captivity three years later. His army was too large to be concentrated for any time, so had to disperse to obtain supplies. This resulted in wholesale plunder and wanton devastation of the land. The natives hated the sofas, who pillaged their homes and carried off their wives without any mercy. Large districts were depopulated by their ravages. Indeed, to this day, the ruins of villages, which were abandoned during the sofa wars, are frequently seen in the bush. It is only during the last few years that this part of West Africa has begun to settle down peacefully after the long period of plunder and wholesale murder which existed during the reign of King Samory. A further cause of this prolonged warfare at this time was that when the Sofa lieutenants were not employing their soldiers on behalf of Samory, they were in the habit of letting their services out to anybody who was willing to pay for them. This system naturally led to a number of local small wars thus further aggravating the harm done by Samory and his followers. This chief was certainly the biggest native general ever encountered by European troops in West Africa. Many of his soldiers afterwards enlisted in British and French colonial corps and proved themselves excellent fighting material. In Caruso Marketplace there is a large boabab tree under which Samory used to hold court. Here he used to try his prisoners, and here they used to be executed. That tree must have seen some horrible sights in its day. What tales it could tell of murder and injustice committed under its shady boughs? Boabab trees are common in these parts. Nearly every village possesses one. And it is under these spreading branches that the chief and his followers are wont to sit and gossip during the heat of the day. One of my carriers about this time was an oldish man who had been a young warrior in Samory's army. He used to relate some blood-curdling stories over the campfire at night of the atrocities committed by that chief. The carrier had himself, it appeared, been a participator in some cruel acts. On one occasion he was sent with a party to exact tribute from a refractory town, with orders to inform the people that they would be plundered and their town burnt unless they complied. He described with a great show of pride how he first extorted twice the required sum, and then proceeded to massacre the unfortunate, helpless inhabitants. Little wonder that Samory's soldiery was feared and mistrusted in those days of plunder and bloodshed. On the morning of the 31st, I had given my boy particular orders to call me early, in order to start on my way to Cancan. About five o'clock I woke, and could see no signs of my servant. This surprised me, as he was usually very punctual. I called, but receiving no reply, went out to investigate the cause of his non-appearance. Entering the kitchen, it became evident that he had run away, for all his personal property had been removed. I never saw him again, and can only conclude that he had found the journey rather harder work than he had bargained for, and had decided to return to his native land before it was too late. This incident was extremely annoying, 
just as I was about to start for my shooting ground, and I was much afraid that it would be impossible to get a boy suited to my requirements in the place. Fortune, however, favored me, and the district commissioner assured me that he would be able to procure a cook who could speak French and Bambara in a few hours. I decided to march off on the understanding that the boy would follow and meet me that evening in camp. True to his promises, the commissioner sent me the servant, who remained with me until I reached Timbuktu. His name was Mamadou. He had many faults and was hardly the sort of boy I should have chosen, but I was lucky to get one at all, and after all he possessed one or two good qualities and could bake bread better than any native servant I had yet had. Mamadou's chief fault was his irrepressible tongue. I made many efforts, both by gentle and strong means, to curb this bad habit while he was with me, but have to acknowledge complete failure. Incessant chatter is a failing of most Negro tribes, but I never met such an inveterate talker as Mamadou before, nor am I likely to do so again. At night he would be talking when one wanted to go to sleep, and in the early morning I was generally wakened by his unceasing chatter. When he slept, and what he had to talk about, were two problems I never succeeded in solving. At Carusa, the Niger is about 250 yards wide, and here there is a canoe ferry to the point on the opposite shore where the Can Can Road commences. As I mentioned before, the Niger is partially navigable from here to Bamako, a distance of about 200 miles. Navigation is frequently interrupted by sandbanks, which are fairly common in this part of the stream. At such places, canoes have to be unloaded and the contents carried to the other side of the obstruction, where fresh canoes are in waiting, a somewhat tedious and slow process. There is a remarkable scarcity of waterfall on the Niger above Bamako. I do not recollect seeing a single duck or goose on this section of the river, although occasionally I saw a few teal. It is true that the river was rather dry at this time, but I was informed by French officials that it was very unusual to find duck at any time of year in the upper reaches of the Niger. The country between Carusa and Cancan -Can consists of rather thick bush, except for a stretch of more open grassland between the Niger and its tributary, the Nyandan. Rice is rather scarce in this region. The native lives principally on sweet potatoes and cassada. The Nyandan is a stream of no great size, but with a very rapid current. It is not too deep to be fordable, but the swiftness of the current makes it dangerous to try the experiment. It was here that I first saw horses in any numbers during my journey, so we were evidently out of the tsetse fly belt, which is so fatal to these animals. An old chief rode up to the stream as we arrived, mounted on a horse with gay trappings, and his toes thrust into the curious heavy iron stirrups always used in West Africa. The saddles are made of wood, with a high back, and are extremely hard, although not otherwise uncomfortable. The wickedest part of the saddlery is the bit. This is made of rough iron, having a ring through which the animal's tongue is thrust, and a cruel spike so fashioned as to stab the roof of the horse's mouth each time the reins are pulled. The inevitable consequence being that a horse's mouth is almost always spoilt when he was young, and is usually in a lacerated condition. Malankis are good riders, but atrocious horse-masters. Horses are generally ridden too young, frequently getting their back strained from this cause. Animals here average about thirteen hands or less, and it is seldom that a good beast is seen, owing to the system of interbreeding which prevails. The horses in this part of the country are not bred locally, but are imported from the south of French Sudan. Indeed, I much doubt if horses are ever bred in French Guiana, or anyhow, in the eastern half of the colony. The native's chief delight is to gallop. He will often be seen careering along at racing speed, for no reason whatever, except that he appears to think that the horse is only born to carry him at the top of its pace. These people are very fond of horse races. Here, too, their one idea is to gallop hard the whole distance. Their knowledge of the staying powers of their animals seems to be strangely lacking. The result is that their horses finish at a snail's pace and are quite exhausted. Besides, horses are generally gas-fed and consequently very soft. In spite of all the bad treatment he suffers from, 
the native pony is frequently a hardy little animal, capable of doing a long day's work, making one wonder what he might not be able to do if breeding were carefully attended to, and the animals were well looked after. I had no difficulty at all this time in keeping the larder well supplied with birds, while an occasional buck brought joy to the carrier's hearts. Bushfowl and guinea-fowl were sufficiently numerous in the farms on the roadside to provide for my wants. The day of my arrival at Cancan, I started in the morning, as was my custom, before the carriers, with my shotgun on my shoulder, intending to do a little shooting on the way. Having secured all I wanted, I pressed on to the town, accompanied by one man to carry the birds. I have no doubt I looked an extremely uncouth and grimy figure, for I had been walking for some hours, and the road was hot and dusty. My costume, too, no doubt looked strange, consisting, as it did, of khaki shooting breeches cut short at the knee and a rough khaki flannel shirt open at the collar, with the sleeves rolled up to the elbow. In spite of my curious appearance, however, I was much amazed to be mistaken for a villain intent on taking the life of the French commissioner. Yet such was the case. On approaching the European quarter, I observed a native policeman whom I asked to direct me to the commissioner's house. This individual, to my surprise, immediately seized me and attempted to wrench the gun out of my hand. It was with difficulty that I restrained my anger in time to prevent myself striking him, so sudden and unexpected was the onslaught. Fortunately, at this moment, the commissioner, hearing the commotion, came out of his office, and matters were satisfactorily explained. It appeared that some time previously, a native who bore a grudge against the commissioner had attempted to shoot him. Hence, the policeman had been on the alert in case of another attempt. My black friend, in the zeal of performing his duty, had jumped to the conclusion that I was a would-be assassin, and had lost no time in trying to deprive me of my gun in consequence. I was much sunburnt at that time, and it is possible that I looked to his excited imagination almost as dark as his colored brethren. That evening I dined with the official and his wife, and we laughed heartily over the dramatic nature of my arrival into Cancan. I was rather surprised to find a French lady so far from the haunts of civilization, but was informed that there were two more ladies, the wives of French traders, in the town. The traveler in the bush cannot but be struck with the refinement brought by a woman's presence to a lonely West African station. Colonials necessarily grow rough in their habits when removed from the gentle influence of woman's society. In her presence, the roughest of mankind feels softened, and its better nature seems brought to the front. Cancan is a large town of twelve thousand inhabitants. It owes its importance to its position in the center of the rubber-growing district of Guyana. Moreover, before the appearance of the white man and the consequent development of the rubber trade, Cancan had for many years been a large native market. Probably the reason for this is that it lies on the Milo River, one of the few tributaries on this bank of the Niger which are navigable to any extent. From Cancan, the French traders are enabled, by using the stream, to send boats of produce direct either to Bamako or Carusa. There are no less than fourteen French trading firms established at this place. Their chief business is, of course, done in rubber. In addition to rubber, a large quantity of groundnuts, rice, millet, and gum will pass through this large market, while Moors from the north of the Senegal River and Fulanis from the middle Niger bring herds of cattle for sale to the town. It is indeed an amusing sight to wander through the marketplace in the morning, when it is crowded with a cosmopolitan collection of colored races. People of every shade of color will be seen. There is a negro from the coast, with a face almost as black as coal, jostling against the reddish complexion Fulanis and the pale-colored Moors, while men and women of every intermediate hue are also to be seen. The babble of voices in many different tongues is most remarkable, and the French traders used to tell me that they require interpreters in about half a dozen different languages in their stores, for so varied is the speech of their customers. At Cancan, I saw for the first time those curious bars of salt transported from the desert salt mines of the Sahara. They are brought many hundreds of miles for sale in the interior of Guyana, where salt is an article of considerable value. These bars weigh fifty to sixty pounds, and are here sold for as much as thirty francs. 
In the district of Can Can, nearly every native is employed collecting rubber in the bush, which he brings to the French merchants for sale. The rubber vine grows in extraordinary profusion to the north and east of the district. On the latter side, its range extends into the north of the Ivory Coast colony. The vine should not be tapped before it is four years old, and the plant is about as thick as a man's wrist. Unless it is cut in a spiral fashion, the plant will be killed. Much harm was done to the rubber trade by the natives a few years ago by the wasteful manner in which they tapped the vines. They used to make deep, circular gashes completely round them, and by this means they were able to get the sap out more easily, quite heedless of the fact that by so doing they were killing the plants. Strict legislation has now been introduced to prevent this wasteful and wanton destruction. When I first saw a man tapping rubber vines, I was surprised to notice they invariably rubbed the place where the incision was made with some dirty-looking liquid. I was informed that this liquid was lime juice and water, the object being to cause the rubber to agglomerate as it exuded from the incision. Rubber is collected in balls, which have a dirty, grayish appearance, and it is in this form that it is sold to the merchants. To increase the weight of these balls, it is a common practice for the wily natives to mix water with the rubber, or to place mud or some heavy substance in the interior. These tricks are now becoming well known to the European trader, who is not often deceived by them, although, when the ruse was first started, I understand it met with considerable success. It is probable that the large portion of French Guyana will be entirely devoted to the rubber trade in the future, for it is mostly a rather scrubby bush country eminently suited to this particular commerce. Owing to the large increasing demand for rubber at the present time, Guiana rubber, which is of good quality, commands a high price in France. At Cancan, I had to change my carriers, and here I arranged to send all the kit which I did not require on to Bamako, while only taking a month's stores, my rifles and camp equipment on my shooting trip into a Sulu country. After an interview with one of the French trading firms, it was settled that my surplus baggage should be forwarded in their lighters by river to Bamako, where I would find it on my arrival at that place. My carriers were now reduced to eight, and with this small party I set out on the 3rd of February. For the first few miles, the road was the main route to the gold-mining district of Seguiri, a fine, broad highway which joins Can Can to the town of that name, a distance of sixty miles. After leaving this road, we turned into a small bush path, striking nearly due east into the heart of the Lusulu country. At Nyan Sunana, the Nilo River is crossed. It is a stream about a hundred yards wide, which we found affordable at the season. That evening, I have heard a big drum in the chief's compound, and thinking it might be of some service to me, I inquired whether the village would send word of my approach to the town of Falama, and ask if the hunters I required were ready. The chief readily acquiesced, stating that within an hour the people of Falama would have knowledge of the message. Falama was nearly fifty miles from Niam Tsunama, so that I was anxious to see if the experiment would really be successful. In less than three hours a reply had come from the hunters to say that they were ready awaiting me. These drums are much used for signaling in this part of the country, and without doubt account for the rapidity with which news becomes known at a considerable distance from the spot where it originates. The drums are made of a rough piece of log hollowed out, often as much as four feet long, with the ends covered with goatskin, fresh taut. The drummer beats on the end with a couple of sticks, or with his hands. It is wonderful how skilled they are about sending quite long messages in this way. Of course, every native does not understand the drum language. An expert ear is necessary to send, as well as to read a message. When war is declared, the inhabitants of the surrounding villages are all made aware of the news by a drum message. In fact, when rapidity is an object, the natives refer to send their messages this way rather than by messenger. The drum is in common use in many West African countries. It is frequently used to call the people together for a palaver, and can be heard by men working in the most distant farms, who at once obey the signal, leaving their crops to return to the town. We were now getting into a more open country, watered by numerous streams, most of which flowed northwest into the Niger. Villages were becoming scarcer, and it was evident that the country was more thinly populated. 
I was careful at each village I passed to make inquiries for game, but it appeared that the game country hardly started before the San Karani River, which I had crossed before arriving at Falama. Cattle were far more numerous here than I had yet seen them. The milk was exceedingly rich, and I was always supplied with a large bowl of it on camping near a village. The people were mostly cattlemen, and were a fine stalwart race. The men must average five feet ten inches. The women are considerably smaller. The latter go in for a great deal of personal adornment. Their hair is dressed in small ringlets, screwed up tightly to the side of the head, giving them a decidedly comical appearance, and hardly enhancing their rather doubtful claim to good looks. The wealthier women wear a large amount of cheap jewelry. Their fingers and toes are decorated with silver rings, generally about as thick as a lady's bracelet in England. Their necks are freely adorned with necklaces of large yellow or blue beads. Like most native women, they are extremely fond of bright-colored dresses. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood the Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. At Falama, I found the two hunters I had engaged for my shooting expedition. They were the head hunters of the district, one of them being a man from the big hunting village of Dia Lakoro, who was reputed to know every yard of the game haunts in the Wasulu country. So it was with high hopes of good sport that I began to talk over plans with these two local celebrities. The San Karani River runs in a semicircle round the village of Falama, at a distance varying from one to three miles from the place. I was informed that there was a hippopotamus pool in the river, so I decided to bend my steps thither that afternoon, on the chance of getting a hippo, and also with a view of seeing the nature of the country from a shooting standpoint. Taking Brahma, the expert from Dia La Coro, with me, I set out about 3 p.m. We traversed a patch of grass country, in which I saw traces of cob and waterbuck for about a couple of miles before reaching the river. Brahma led me to a well-worn hippopath in some rather thick undergrowth near the river bank, on the off chance of finding a hippo on land. After twisting and winding for some time in this thicket, I heard the movements of a ponderous body in front of us. This was without doubt the beast we were hunting, and sure enough, in a few minutes, after some careful stalking through the bush, I caught sight of him. He was within fifty yards, and had just turned broadside on to listen, with his pig-like eyes looking in our direction. His massive form was plainly outlined at that distance, as fortunately the bush was a little thinner here. A shot from my four fifty rifle rolled him over, hitting him in the heart. After this we made our way to the pool, taking up a concealed position on the river bank. Three or four hippos shortly appeared, frolicking in the clear, cool water of the pool. For some time I lay in the shady refuge of the bushes, watching their playful antics. It was an amusing sight to see these huge monsters gradually and lazily raising their big heads out of the water, until finally, with a snort, the whole head was thrust out to full view, when, after drawing a deep breath, they would suddenly disappear beneath the calm waters of the stream. After for some time watching this pretty scene, and regretting that I had not brought my camera, I decided to have a shot at a big bull who was in the party. The best shot at a hippo in the water is one directed at his nostrils, which can be seen when he thus raises his head. Consequently, the next time my friend appeared, I fired at the spot. He took three shots before I was satisfied I had killed him, and then I turned away rather disgusted with the sport. For hippos are harmless creatures, and the amusement derived from shooting them does not give one much satisfaction. I have heard some men give the hippo credit for being vicious, but personally I am of opinion that he will never willfully harm anyone. It is true they have been known frequently to overturn canoes on a river, but I cannot help thinking that, when this does occur, it is purely an accident, for the hippo is very blind, and it is quite conceivable that he may often raise his big head just underneath the canoe, without being aware of the latter's presence. On leaving the pool, we soon picked up the tracks of a herd of cob, which had recently passed that way. There was still an hour and a half before dark, so I decided to follow them. 
We were now once more in the open grassland, where the grass had been burnt in patches. Proceeding cautiously upwind, for these antelopes have a very keen sense of hearing and smell, we espied the herd peacefully grazing in the distance. After a careful stalk of four hundred or five hundred yards, I managed to secure a fair-sized male. It was now nearly dark, so we proceeded towards camp. Parties were sent out to bring in the meat of the first hippo and of the cob, and all the village was full of joy at the prospect of plenty of beef. The second hippo would have to be left till the following day, for they sink when shot, and the bodies do not float for about twenty-four hours. A message was sent to the fishermen downstream to look out for the animal, and to bring it in as soon as it was found. They were to have the meat on condition that they brought me the tusks, an arrangement which pleased everybody. I had arranged with my hunters to proceed the next day to a place called Duolajan, sixteen miles east, where they reported that I would be in the center of the elephant country. As my chief object in visiting the Wasulu country was to hunt elephant, and my time was limited, I was anxious to reach this locality as soon as practicable. That day, after making my plans, I had already dispatched a second hunter to Dulajan to get all news of the elephant's whereabouts at that time, and to meet me on my arrival at camp, or as soon after as possible. The next morning, as we set out, my heart was light at the prospects of some really good sport, for I had every reason to believe I was within easy reach of the elephant, and from all accounts there were some fine tuskers among them. That day, however, was doomed to be a day of annoyance and disappointment. Leaving my carriers to follow by the ordinary road, I and Brima were to leave before dawn by a small hunter's track, known only to himself, which will lead us to a favorite haunt of waterbuck. I ordered my boy to meet me at a place where the two paths crossed, at eleven for breakfast. After a very hot and disappointing walk, during which I saw not a single trace of waterbuck, we arrived at the place where I proposed to breakfast. My carriers and servant had not arrived, so I got a hut swept out by the chief and composed myself for a little sleep. I was feeling fatigued after the early start and the heat of the day, so I slept for some hours and woke to find it was three o'clock and still no sign of my carriers. I began to be uneasy that some might have run away and could not be replaced. I was also by this time uncommonly hungry and decided to get some food from the chief and then set out with Brahma to look for my boy, Mamadou. After a refreshing meal of fresh milk and pawpaw, I felt fortified once more and departed with my hunter in quest of the missing carriers and boy. We had gone three or four miles, I suppose, when I heard a chattering proceeding from a tree close to the path just in front of us. On turning a corner, we came into full view of Mamadou, the carriers, and the loads all under a shady tree. The men seemed to be enjoying themselves vastly, and not to be in the least concerned about me. My wrath can be more easily imagined than described at the spectacle thus disclosed. Here I had been waiting several hours for these lazy scoundrels, and imagining all sorts of disasters that might have befallen them, when all the time they were simply loafing and enjoying a rest on the roadside. They jumped up pretty sharply on my appearance, and proceeded to place their loads on their heads. Mamadou was, of course, full of excuses to account for the delay, but I fear he so perjured himself as to lose any chance of a seat in heaven. The most annoying feature of the business was that I should not now be able to reach my shooting camp at Julichon that night, and it appeared that the only reason for all this delay was that my servant might enjoy a silly habit of chattering. It was quite dark when we reached the village where I should have breakfasted, and here another disappointment awaited me. The hunter I had sent to Dulajan had arrived with news, as I hoped, of the elephant. His information was distinctly disheartening. He stated that some hunters from the south of Utsulu had been among the herd a few days previously, and had driven them some distance east of the previous feeding ground. In fact, he stated that it was rumored the animals had gone almost to Odian, which I knew to be five or six days' march from Dulajan. The only thing to be done was to go on to Dulaja next day and follow up the elephants if there seemed any chance of overtaking them within a reasonable time. The place I selected for my camp was on the banks of a small stream, about five miles from the village of Dulaja. 
year, I pitched my tent, which had hardly as yet come into a requisition. The spot was a delightful shady place, where seemed a veritable haunt of wild game, judging by the numerous tracks of animals coming down to drink at the stream hard by. I had procured a third local hunter, and now sent two men off to get more definite news of the elephant, while I kept one with me for shooting purposes near my camp. These hunters are strongly imbued with ideas of fetish. Brima had a long flintlock gun of which he was inordinately proud. To a native, his gun is an object more to be cherished than his child. He carries it with him everywhere, even when going to his peaceful farm where there is no danger from man nor the likelihood of his seeing any wild beast. This particular gun was decorated with every imaginable sort of juju or fetish charms. Panther's claws, lion's teeth, antelope horns, and pieces of water buck's hide adorned the stock. The butt had a piece of elephant tail, freely smeared in the blood of the wild boar tied upon it. The latter animal is particularly venerated for the good luck it is supposed to bring to the sportsman. Our camp was on more than one occasion visited by the wild beasts of the neighborhood. Leopards and hyenas were fairly numerous here, while the deep musical roar of the lion was frequently heard resounding through the bush at night. One morning, as I was making my toilet preparatory to an early start on a hunting trip, I saw the beautiful sight of a herd of about fifteen West African hartebeest coming down to drink at the stream. My attention was at first attracted by hearing the thundering of many hooves on the stony ground outside the camp. Rifle in hand, I cautiously crept out of my tent, and soon they came into full view, never suspecting the near presence of man, for our camp was well concealed in the trees, and they did not get our wind. There is something awe-inspiring to my mind at the spectacle of wild animals when they are unaware of the proximity of man, and are seen thus in their native haunts. Game is always most beautiful when it is most natural and unalarmed. It makes one feel a brute to shoot it, thereby destroying the life of a fine creature. The West African hartebeest here were the best I saw during my travels, and I secured two very good heads. These animals were numerous in the Wasulu country, herds of twelve or fifteen being frequently seen, although I never saw them in larger numbers than this. This animal is, I suppose, quite the most clumsy-looking of all West African antelopes, its curious, ill-shaped head and lumbering gait reminding one more of a donkey than any other animal. I spent three days thus and enjoyed some good sport with antelope. During my expeditions I used to come across tracks of elephant fairly often. These appeared to be at least a month old, and I began to doubt the veracity of the statement that these animals had been seen here more recently than that. It seemed to me evident that they had retired toward the better watered country in the direction of the Ivory Coast forest some considerable time previously. The dry season was now in full swing, and streams in the Losulu district were drying up rapidly. I observed two distinctly different kinds of tracks. One lot appeared to be those of the ordinary elephant, while the other lot seemed to belong to a smaller species of that beast. On discussing the matter with my hunter, he confirmed my theory by stating that the smaller tracks were those of a herd of the red elephant. This animal I had never yet seen, but had heard it mentioned for the first time by some French friends. At Farina, they had again told me of its existence, so I was very eager to get a specimen. The elephant appears to be a reddish-gray hue. Probably terracotta would be a better description, and, to the best of my belief, is peculiar to this region, although as I never saw one, nor could even see the skin of one in the district, I am not in a position to give any more authentic information on the point. It has the reputation of being very fierce, and is said to charge without provocation, but I am inclined to believe this is an exaggeration. It is certainly a good deal smaller than the ordinary African elephant, and carries quite small tusks by all accounts. That day my two hunters returned, and much to my disappointment, the reports of the elephant were most discouraging, and made me only more certain that the animals had left our vicinity some time back, which would make my chance of ever coming up with them exceedingly remote. The same evening I got news, however, from the chief of Dulajan, that he had heard on the most reliable authority 
that the herd had been seen at a place three days' march from our camp, close to Odeon. I at once determined to proceed there on the chance of there being some truth in the yarn, although I must confess that I was not very sanguine as to the success of my quest. Striking camp at an early hour in the morning, we marched for three days through a more wooded country, gradually verging into forest land. Tracks of elephant were numerous, but these were by no means fresh. Finally, I was forced to abandon the enterprise, for I was daily getting farther and farther from my northerly route, and could afford no more time to spend in hunting in this country. The dense forest we were now in reminded me how extremely difficult it is to see these huge beasts in country of this nature. I recollect once, when tracking a large herd from an early hour until late in the afternoon through a swampy country, I had quite lost all traces of them, and began to despair of finding them again. I was on the point of turning homewards, but thought I would first cross a neighboring swamp to have some lunch on the opposite bank, which appeared dry. Being on the point of sitting down, I suddenly observed what appeared to be a moving leaf. On closer inspection, it proved to be the ear of an elephant, not more than twenty yards away, and concealed in the foliage. A little maneuvering resulted in a successful stalk, and the animal, which was a fine tusker, was bagged. These bees, although not actually deaf, get so accustomed to forest sounds that they had never heard our somewhat noisy approach across the swamp. My plan was to return to Falama on the San Carini River, where I had arranged for fresh carriers to meet me, and from thence to proceed to Bamako by the shortest route. The hunting villages which are passed in this district give a very fair indication of the game to be found in the neighborhood. It is the custom to erect outside the village a high altar, built up with the horns of antelope and the skulls of almost every conceivable beast shot by the local hunting people. This altar is erected for fetish purposes, the heads being allowed to remain there till they rot. The native hunter has no sense of sport as we look upon it. He kills wild animals primarily for the meat he will get, and, as trophies of the chase, horns and skins have no value in his eyes. Some of the more dangerous animals may sometimes be hunted for the danger involved in attacking them, but even then it is done more out of bravado than from the love and excitement of the sport. One of my hunters had a native flute which he would play at night in camp to amuse himself and his companions. The instrument is a very simple one, made out of a reed cane, having a few holes punched in it to form the notes, and roughly shaped mouthpiece. The music is melancholy, and by no means disagreeable. He was a lightly built, active fellow, making a picturesque figure as he sat in the glow of the firelight, playing strange native melodies on his instrument. Brahma had a greater weakness for juju than the others. His chief care, after seeing to his gun before our start every morning, was to find out if Diana intended to favor our sport that day. The method adopted to carry out this test was a curious one. The only thing necessary to work the charm were two cola nuts. His procedure was as follows. A cola was taken in each hand, and some mystic words were then muttered over them, the gist of which was, as far as I could understand, something like this. May the god of the chase grant me good fortune, and may he cause these two colas to point towards me. The colas were then thrown in the air, and the way in which they landed on the ground decided the luck that was going to be his that day. If the two colas fell with their ends both pointing towards the thrower, all would be well. On the other hand, if the colas, when they reached the earth, had the pointed ends turned away from Brahma, then the god of hunting was full of wrath and would not be appeased that day. If one nut was pointing towards him and the other in the inverse direction, the operation had to be repeated three times before a definite decision could be arrived at. It must be explained for the benefit of those who have never seen a cola nut that one end is more pointed than the other. The shape of the nut resembles that of a Brazil nut, a sort of pyramid on a triangular base, and the color is either white or pink. Brahma's trick, I noticed, often did not give a correct forecast of the day's performances. When I tackled him on this point, he always had some ready excuse on his tongue, and he never succeeded in shaking his conviction of the infallibility of the charm. As a matter of fact, 
A native has such a strongly rooted belief in his various fetishes and superstitions that it seems quite impossible ever to shake it. Of course, in many cases, when fetishes are in the hands of medicine men, these people are so crafty that the particular charm they are working appears never to fail. I have in mind the charm used for the purpose of testing adultery among certain tribes. In this case, the accused are told to drink a mixture made of the infusion of leaves of the cotton tree and some other ingredients, the reason being that if he drinks it and vomits, he is innocent. But if he is guilty, he will die in agonies. As a matter of fact, the result is a foregone conclusion, for if the medicine man wishes the death of his victim, he merely puts a little deadly poison into the concoction, thereby producing the desired result, while the natural property of the mixture is to make the imbiber vomit. This performance is carried out in the midst of the congregated villagers, so that the effect produced on their ignorant and superstitious minds is tremendous. If the accused man is rich, he can generally buy his innocence by a judicious bribe paid to the medicine man. Fetish peace wield great power over the people in West Africa. Their influence is in a way similar to that of the mullahs in the east among the Mohammedans. The latter stir up the people to mad religious fervor by their frenzied preachings in much the same manner that the fetish priest excites the minds of his hearers. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. At Falama, I procured the requisite carriers from the chief. It was arranged that they should accompany me all the way to the Niger, should I find any difficulty in replacing them before that river was reached. I was particularly careful to have this explained to each individual carrier in the presence of his chief, for I had had some experience of the difficulty of keeping these men to their promises already. A favorite trick of this class of gentlemen is, after being most fervent in his protests of wishing for no happier lot than to accompany you as far as you want to go, suddenly, and generally, at a most awkward moment, to casually cast your belongings into the bush and run away. One has, in such cases, nothing but the grim consolation that he has deprived himself of his pay, which is but poor satisfaction for the annoyance and inconvenience he causes you. The chief of Falama was a man of some influence, being also one of the leading magnates of the Wasulu country. I therefore hope that his authority will be sufficient to ensure the remaining faithful to me. At Falama, Mamadou invested in a new hat. This was a wonderful bit of headgear. The hat was made of plated straw of several bright colors, among which green and red were most prominent. It was made with a very wide brim, and the top worked up to a point, in conical fashion. It certainly had the advantage of protecting him from the glare of the sun, for it was at least two sizes too big for him, so that it descended right over his eyes, and almost rested on the bridge of his nose. He was greatly pleased with his new purchase, bringing it to me to show off with much pride. Among my new carriers, I noticed one with different tribal marks from the rest. On inquiry, I was told he came from the Sanifu country, near the Ivory Coast colony. His face was beautifully decorated with four semicircular gashes, each about a quarter of an inch wide, down both sides. These cuts started on the temple, about on the level of the eyes, and went right down the cheeks to the mouth at which point they converged. They certainly gave him a very remarkable appearance, rather suggestive at a distance of the black marks put on the face of a clown in a circus. A good knowledge of tribal marks will often enable one to tell the tribe of a man at sight. They are not, however, an infallible proof of the tribe of an individual, for sometimes a boy, when taken into slavery, will have the marks of his master's tribe cut upon his face. Some races do not practice the custom of tribal marks, but it is generally done in all pagan nations. The Wasulu marks consisted of two or three very thin cuts made vertically down each cheek, usually not more than three inches long. The marks were often so slight as not to be noticeable except at close quarters. My shortest road was across the San Carini River, 
then up the valley of the Fee, finally crossing the Niger a little south of Kangaba and following its left bank to Bamako. Our reliable guide was an unknown article in these parts. The natives of this region are not traders. Consequently, they travel little. I had to depend on getting a guide day by day to lead me through the bush country which intervened between me and the Niger, but once on the other side of that stream, there was said to be an excellent road leading to Bamako. The first part of the journey lay across hills of laterite rock. Our track could only by courtesy be dignified by the name of a path. The country was practically uninhabited, although, as usual in this district, there were numerous traces of ruined villages, all testifying to the devastations of Samari. At one place I saw the remains of a hut rapidly falling into decay. I was rather surprised to observe a weather-beaten old board nailed on a tree opposite the door. This board had some writing on it, which was with difficulty decipherable. It stated that a man called Paul Rio had for two years made his home in that hut, where he had stayed while seeking gold in the vicinity. As a proof of his words, I could see pits dug at the small river nearby, and evidently made by him during a search for the precious metal. He must have been all alone, and what a dreary life to lead in this desolate spot, with nothing but the wild African bush for miles on all sides. I conclude a search was not successful. The poor fellow must have gone away disappointed after two years of lonely toiling under the hot tropical sun. After this, the country began to get more open, and it was evident that we were rapidly descending towards the San Karani River. We passed through a wide grassy plain onto the right bank of the river. It looked like a lightly place for cob, which are fond of the marshy swamps bordering on streams, but though I saw some fairly fresh tracks, we did not come across any of these antelope. The river is about a hundred yards wide here, and has a very swift current. I looked in vain for a canoe, as it was impossible to ford it. In the distance we could see a village on the far bank, but the people could not or would not hear our repeated shouts. A few shots from my rifle eventually brought out some men who half hid in the bush, thinking we were come to make war. Probably the last time they had heard rifles fired was during the Sofa War, and the unaccustomed sound called up unwelcome memories of rapine and slaughter. With some difficulty I managed to reassure them, and proceeded to explain we merely wanted a canoe to convey us and our belongings to the other shore. We halted at the village, which was called Balandigu, and it was here that my troubles with the porters commenced. In the afternoon I had been out to see if I could pick up a few bushfowl on some likely-looking farms close by, and on my return was met by Mamadou, who told me that he had heard the carriers talking about deserting me. Although I only wanted eight men, I was aware that it would be extremely hard to get any to replace them at this village, which had only a score of inhabitants, mostly decrepit men and women or quite young children. I was therefore determined not to give them the opportunity of bolting. Further, I was much annoyed at their faithless behavior after their promises to accompany me until I reached the Niger, if necessary. I summoned them at once, telling them I had knowledge of their intention to desert, and that any man attempting to do so would be flogged. They all denied they had ever been guilty of such a base thought. But, needless to say, I did not believe them. That night I made them all sleep in the same hut, pitching my camp bed outside one exit, while Mamadou was made to sleep outside the other. This little arrangement successfully stopped them from carrying out any projects that might have formed. Next day I had to take precautions on the march to prevent their defection. I constituted myself rear guard, making my servant walk beside the leading carrier, and in this order we proceeded until we arrived at a large village about eleven o'clock. Here I decided to halt for breakfast and interview the headman with a view to getting fresh porters. As a matter of fact, the headman of the place was a local chief of some importance, as I soon perceived when he arrived dressed in a finely embroidered gown and wearing a sword. Certain chiefs in Guyana are allowed by the French to wear swords as a mark of rank. He came with a picturesque following of courtiers, such as these men loved to surround themselves with, they have usually several advisers among them, and it is quite amusing to notice how the advisers 
often rule their king. Frequently, when asking a chief a question, one will notice that he is not even given the chance of answering for himself. His so-called advisor chips in with his answer before the chief has time to open his mouth. They came to the hut which had been prepared for my breakfast, sitting down at my invitation. After a lengthy palaver, it was settled that eight carriers were to be sent to the spot where I should camp that night to replace my present gang. This seemed preferable to the alternative of waiting here till evening for the young men to come in from their farms, where they were now at work. I dispatched Mamadou to inform my porters that they would be released that same night as soon as their release arrived, and then settled myself down to breakfast. It never occurred to me that it would be necessary to any longer keep guard over them, as they now knew they would so soon be released. After my meal, I went outside the hut for a stroll, when, to my disgust, I saw only three carriers remaining, while a couple of them were just to be seen running as fast as their legs could carry them towards the bush in the distance. Having threatened the remaining three with dire vengeance should they try to follow their comrades, I dispatched Manadou to the chief to order him to have the defaulters caught without delay. At the end of a couple of hours the fugitives were brought back, and I was able to proceed on my journey. We resumed the march in the same order as that morning, for it was obviously not safe to let them go unguarded. All the time I was rather anxious as to the chances of the chief fulfilling his promises about sending me the fresh carriers that night. However, there was nothing to be done but to hope for the best, and in the meantime to keep a sharp eye on my present porters. That night I halted at a small stream, which was the only water within some miles, and was the place where I had directed the new carriers to meet me. I did not much relish the prospects of the evening before me. Keeping a watch on the would-be truants and slumber were two things that would hardly reconcile themselves without the assistance of the friendly hut of yesterday. About nine p.m., however, to my joy, I heard a commotion outside the small camp, and, on going out of my tent, found it indicated the arrival of the carriers from the previous halting place. The chief had, after all, been honest to his promises, and I had been unjust to his majesty. The following morning I made a very early start, about four o'clock, with the intention of trying for a West African eland. My boy and carriers were to go on to a small village only some ten miles away, where I would join them that night. I had been told that eland were to be found in this neighborhood, and had myself seen tracks of one the previous day. Not having time to wait more than a day in that part of the country, I did not feel inclined to go away without trying my luck after one of these fine animals. The eland is one of the very largest of West African antelopes, and is decidedly rare. The horns make a splendid trophy, which I was most anxious to add, if possible, to my collection. One of my new carriers professed to be a hunting man, out of work, and to know the country well, so I had arranged to take him with me. We were now on the watershed between the rivers Fai and San Karani, a rather sparsely wooded country, intersected by several small streams which flowed down on either side to join the two big rivers in due course. The haunts of the eland were said to be on the eastern side, towards the San Karani River, whither we directed our steps. The ground slopes gradually here down to the river, and was some of the prettiest scenery I had seen since my entry into French Guiana. Large stretches of open grassland alternated with park-like country, and occasionally one came on a more thickly wooded part, through which ran sylvan glades, carpeted with emerald green grass, by the side of which flowed a tiny stream of crystal water. The spot seemed a paradise for game of all sorts, judging by the numerous tracks. My time was too limited, unfortunately, to allow other game than Neeland to be pursued. I must own I felt sorry now that I had not come straight to this place, instead of spending those last few days in Wasulu on a fruitless expedition after the elephant. I simply could not afford to spend more than the single day in this pleasant, game-haunted locality. My plan was to devote all my time till four o'clock to the joys of the chase, by which hour, if luck favored me, I hoped to have bagged an eland. In any case, I would have to wend my steps campward by that time, as I should probably have three or four hours of walking in front of me. My cherished hopes were, however, doomed to disappointment, 
for although we searched all the most likely places, not a sign of the beasts could we discover. There were, it was true, a good many old tracks, but that was poor consolation. It seemed that I was out of luck just now. First, there was my disappointment about the elephant in Wasulu, and now the evasive eland was having a laugh at my expense. Tree myself up with the thought that there must be a good time in store for me in the near future, at four o'clock I directed my Sakari to show me the homeward path. It was dark by the time we got out of the bush onto the track, and I was not sorry at last to see the cheerful glow of a fire in the distance, which indicated the position of my hut. I had been on my legs for a good many hours that day, and that, with a natural feeling of disappointment, made me feel really tired. A hot bath, dinner, and a pipe by the fireside made me feel a new man again. It was my invariable custom to have a fire of logs at night. This was useful more especially to keep off the mosquitoes, which are always most assiduous in their onslaughts after sunset. Sandflies, too, were bad in many places, and the ordinary mosquito net was of no use against these tiny, venomous creatures. The meshes, close enough to protect you from the attacks of the anepheles, were by no means impenetrable to the minute sandfly. Fortunately for me, I had previous experience of these wicked insects, and had prepared myself with a net of close measures to guard me against their unwelcome attentions. To travelers in the bush, I would always recommend a net with fine meshes, for sandflies are not uncommon in any part of West Africa. The chief drawback is that one naturally feels hotter in this pattern of net, but to my mind, this is infinitely preferable to being tortured by sandflies all night, thereby making sleep a physical impossibility. On my arrival, I was told by Mamadou that the chief had refused to provide chop for the carriers, saying he had done in the place. I at once sent for the old man to ask for some explanation, as I was well aware that rice or millet was fairly abundant at this time of year, and my party was a small one to cater for. After a good deal of palaver and threats on my part of reporting him to the commissioner at Siguri, in which district I was now traveling, he was reduced to a more sensible frame of mind, and hurried off to carry out my orders with considerable alacrity. This was the first occasion on which I had had any trouble about rationing my followers. The French have an excellent custom in Guyana, and one which I had previously never found to fail me. When a white man arrives in a village, it is the duty of the chief or head man, without any order from the traveler, to at once provide and cook sufficient food for the whole party of carriers and boys. The ration is about one and a half pounds of rice or millet per head. The meal is brought to the European for inspection about sundown, and payment is then made at the tariff rates. In some places, the head man or chief will bring presents of fowls or perhaps some eggs. When the native is a rich man, he will often even produce a sheep or cow. These presents, of course, cannot be accepted without payment, or a return present in kind of about equal value. Some people give a return present of much greater value in money or kind, but this system seems to me to be a bad one, as it encourages these natives to make a sort of trade most profitable to themselves in so-called presents. The French deprecate the habit of paying more than the actual value to the individual concerned. I have frequently found this custom of presence such a nuisance that I now inform the chief on my arrival in a town of exactly what I require in the way of food, at the same time telling him that presents are not wanted. There is no doubt that this saves a good deal of annoyance and unnecessary expense. It would, for instance, be most inconvenient and rather expensive to be dashed a bullock when one's following only consisted of eight persons, and to have to expend four or five pounds in payment, therefore. To encumber oneself with a live bullock until one had a chance to dispose of it would be an impossibility, and the only alternative is to slaughter it at once. It will be realized that this sort of entertainment, if repeated three or four times, would soon lead to bankruptcy. I recollect seeing a curious and amusing kind of dash made on one occasion. A friend of mine, who was a distinguished official, had been to a country which had only lately come under control of the government, and which the natives were unaccustomed to the usual method of showing their appreciation of a white man's visit. 
They evidently thought that this was a moment when a great effort must be made to display their generosity. A solemn cortege arrived, headed by the chief with the dash. I shall never forget the horror-stricken look on my friend's face when, with due ceremony, a young girl was produced and handed over to him. As the official in question was a particularly shy and modest man, the full humor of the situation will be thoroughly appreciated. The following day the country began to take on a more populated appearance. Large expanses of land planted with crops of millet and cassada were to be seen, while villages became more frequent and natives passed us from time to time on the road. About eight o'clock in the morning we arrived at the top of a big hill, upon the summit of which there was perched a small hamlet. The headman brought out a calabash of delicious fresh milk, rich and frothy, just drawn from the cow. I gladly took a cup of the refreshing beverage while we were waiting for the last carriers to come in. These people were Jamanganas, a section of the widely distributed Malenki tribe. They are purely agriculturalists, as was indeed evidenced by the wide farms of waving crops through which we had passed. The view from the top of this hill was magnificent. We were now well down the western slope of the San Carini Fai watershed, and from here I got my first glimpse of the latter river. To the north there ran a mass of isolated peaks, like a series of broken links in the chain of hills along which we had been marching for the last two days. The reddish-brown hue of the laterite rocks of which they were formed made a pleasing contrast to the golden fields of ripe millet scattered checkerwise over their steep sides. Far away in the south could be seen the river Fye, a tiny shivering streak of water, gradually widening as it flowed westward to join the Niger into an exposing expanse. The valley through which it flowed was a wide, fruitful plain, where cassada and millet crops jostled against each other, and in the center of which could be discerned a thin line of rich dark green foliage, marking the course of the winding stream. Overhead was a bright azure sky, with the golden rays of the morning sun shining upon the smiling landscape. We rested that night at the town of Jalenki, the biggest place I had yet seen in the bush country of Guyana, and the center of the millet growing district. Jalenki consists of three large villages, each of which, on a rough estimate, must contain two thousand inhabitants. The central village is the principal one, and it is here the chief of the Jomagonas resides. It was lodged in a palatial hut with two imposing carved wooden doors, and what was more to the purpose, they were doors through which one could enter without fear of knocking one's head. Most West African huts have one point in common, that the doors are built so low that it is necessary for the shortest person who wishes to enter to double him or herself up in the most undignified fashion if a severe blow on the head is to be avoided. My house was also roomy and airy in comparison to the average edifice it had been my fate to live in, so I began to feel myself in luxury. My feelings of comfort and rest were, however, soon to be crushed. Mamadou arrived at the door with a long face, which I felt sure meant some catastrophe of a serious nature. His news was that the carriers had all bolted. This was really too annoying, just when I thought I had got matters satisfactorily arranged till we should reach the Niger. I suppose the sight of such a metropolis, as Jalingi must appear to them, had produced this demoralizing effect. I summoned the chief for a palaver on the carrier question, with imprecations on my lips against the faithless fugitives. The chief was amiability itself, and promised me as many men as I should want for the following day. But there was one small matter on which we could not agree. He said the carrier should take my loads as far as the next village, where I could procure fresh men, who would carry me to the succeeding village, and so on. As the country was now getting thickly populated, it appeared that I would have to change my porters every two miles or so, in other words, ten times before reaching the Niger. It is hardly to be wondered at that I vowed I would never do this, even if I had to take the chief with me to ensure my carriers remaining faithful. He intimated that this was the custom of the country, and had so been from time immemorial. I politely replied that I was the last person in the world to wish to break old customs, this custom did seem such a probable one, but that it was also a custom for chiefs to supply white men with carriers when necessary, and 
for as long as they might be required in a particular circle, as the French call their districts. It was not till I had tried every conceivable argument and had at last resort to the old threat of reporting him to the commissioner that he finally promised his men should go as far as I desired. True it is that by this time I was aware the chiefs had not much influence over their people, and the promise he had given might be broken through no fault of his. Still, it would have been impossible to get the fellows even to start without him, so I had hoped for the best while fearing the worst. On leaving Jalengi, we passed several small streams flowing towards the fee, in which natives were to be seen washing gold. The metal is found in small quantities about the fee river, and this is noticeable, as many women wear gold ornaments in this region. Every village has a native goldsmith, who fashions rough trinkets such as earrings, bracelets, etc., for the adornment of the local beauties. The gold in this part is entirely alluvial, according to native information. I should imagine even this is only found in very small quantities. The gold mines are on the other side of the Niger in the direction of Buri, some fifty miles northwest of the town of Siguri. I did not visit Siguri myself, but I understand that there are several European companies there who are interested in gold. The British and German are said to predominate, but at present business is not very bright in the mines. We marched for some miles up the Fee Valley, before striking the right bank of the stream. This was the last river of any size to be crossed before meeting the Niger. Here I noticed a peculiar thing connected with native superstition, and one I likewise remarked at the crossing of the San Carini. The fee was the natural geographical boundary of the Jomangona tribe. A belief existed among the people that any man who should cross this Rubicon would bring misfortune to his family. It seems curious that a tribe should be afraid of passing the boundary into the next country when the two tribes were at peace, but so it was. On account of this superstition, the Jomangonas have not spread westward, nor have they had any intercourse with the people over their border. Intermarriage between the two races seemed to be unknown. I was unaware that this strange belief existed until I reached the river and noticed the hesitation of my carriers to cross it. My difficulties now appeared to be on the verge of recommencing. What was the use of chiefs who promised by all they held sacred to ensure the loyalty of the porters when there remained strong superstitions of this kind to be overcome? Having placed their loads on the ground, they stoutly refused to move a yard farther. My situation was comical, if it had not been so tragic. Here was I, with my worldly possessions, stuck on the bank of this river in the middle of the bush, while my carriers refused to advance a step and might at any moment run away, leaving us in the lurch without any prospect of replacing them. I tried in turn gentle persuasion and threats of chastisement. The former had the effect such methods generally produce on natives of making them think I was soft, while the latter had the equally disastrous effect of making them so frightened that, if I had not stopped the ringleaders myself, they would have all run away. There seemed to be only one way out of the predicament. I called Mamadou, telling him to make all haste and return to the chief of Jilingi with a message for me that he must come to the fee at once and palaver. The carriers were informed of my intentions and told to remain till his arrival. Mamadou went off, and I took up a position on the bank above the men, where I could watch any attempt at desertion, at the same time taking the precaution to place my rifle by my side an act of which they realized the significance. I had now to possess my soul in patience, for Mamadou and the chief could not possibly arrive for a couple of hours, it being quite three miles to the town. The porters did not give any trouble, but sat silently and sullenly below me. Never had two hours seemed so long. Eventually, to my joy, I espied my servant, heading a small procession, moving across the plain towards me. The chief and his followers seated themselves around me, and, to cut a long story short, after a long discussion, in which he was made to understand that if he did not compel his men to cross with my loads, he would be made to come with me to the nearest commissioner, he did what I required. When the last load had been dispatched to the other bank, I let him depart, made happy with the presence of a small packet of tea and sugar, and vowing that the carriers would give me no further cause for annoyance. On this point I had my doubts, 
but told him I sincerely hoped for his sake that they would not, as I should certainly report the whole occurrence to the commissioner. These vexatious delays had caused me to lose many precious hours, and now pushed on as rapidly as possible to the Niger, which we reached on the 17th of February, at a place called Balindugu Somnabara, not far from the large village of Naftidi. For the time being, at any rate, I had no more carrier troubles, and was quite as glad as they were to see the big river once more. At this village with a very long name, there is a canoe ferry. The river was about three hundred yards wide at this point, but divided into two streams of equal width by a long, narrow sandbank. While watching my loads being transported, I noticed a river barge under full sail going upstream toward Bamako. It was the property of a French trading firm, the name of which was inscribed in large letters on the sails. These barges are made of wood and will carry two or three tons of merchandise. The usual period of transit from Caruso or Cancan to Bamako occupies seven days. During the rainy season, when there is plenty of water, barges of twenty-five tons burden can navigate this portion of the stream. I calculated I must be about a hundred miles south of Bamako, and determined to push on that night to Tambula, on the other bank, which was on the main Siguri bamako road. While the transport operations were going on, Mamadou, whose duty it was to see the load safely shipped, disappeared. On looking up the river, I observed him in the distance, stealthily approaching a group of waterfowl of all sizes and descriptions, which were sunning themselves on the sandy bank of the stream. The ground was as flat as a pancake, without any sort of cover, and it was obvious that his painful endeavors to advance unperceived were doomed to failure. Sure enough, the birds soon rose in a cloud, flying off out of sight round a bend of the river. Mamadou went forward, however, to the spot where they had been, where he stooped to pick up something. I took no further notice of his movements until I heard his familiar voice close by. He then appeared, staggering under the weight of a big fish, which must have weighed at least twenty pounds, and had the look of an Indian man-seer. The fish was beginning to rot, and had such an unpleasant smell that I bade him remove it at once. This he did with a look of reproach, as much as to say this was an ungrateful way of showing my appreciation for his labors. For the benefit of the uninitiated, I may state that the native prefers rotten fish to the fresh article. Probably, and justly thinking, there is more flavor about it. Mamadou's version of his adventure was highly amusing. He said that seeing a bird near the water, which was très bon manger, he had intended to try to catch it with a small fishing net which he had found close by. His idea was to approach within a few yards and then lasso it. Several of the birds were pelicans, and had evidently been discussing their morning meal when he frightened them and they flew off, dropping the dainty morsel. The people here are mostly fishermen. They catch many kinds of fish in the Niger, some of which have an excellent flavor. The best fish I ever tasted was the capitaine. It runs up to ten or twelve pounds weight frequently, and is beautifully firm. Many of the Niger fish are difficult to eat on account of the numerous bones they contain, but this variety has few bones. Electric mudfish are fairly common when the river is low. They are flat, reminding one of dabs, and if you touch them, you experience a decided electric shock. These fish make a peculiar clucking sort of noise, by which they can often be easily located. The native fisherman catches his fish with nets, or, more frequently, in traps. In some parts, they even spear fish, but it is unusual on this portion of the Niger. It is a usual sight in the early morning to see the father of the family, accompanied by a son, often quite a small urchin, setting out from his village in a dugout canoe for the fishing ground. He then casts his net into the water, bragging it while the little chap sits in the stern and cleverly manipulates the paddle. These fisher folk are brought up, almost from the cradle, to paddle a canoe. It is wonderful with what energy and endurance the youngsters will propel the craft. On the Niger, it is unusual to see the women paddling, but in other West African rivers, this is a common sight. The fish traps are generally made of reed canes in the shape of a cone, with the base open and the apex tightly closed. A series of these are placed in some suitable spot, such as a backwater, the bases being turned upstream. 
There's several devices for keeping the fish in once they have entered the base of the cone, but the principle is that of a trap door which closes on the victim as soon as it is entered. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher Our route to Tombola lay across a marshy, open stretch of land for some miles. The marsh was dried up in many places, and a rank, coarse grass grew over it to a height of seven or eight feet. This place was the haunt of herds of cob. The natives evidently were not hunters, for these animals could be seen within half a mile of a village. In fact, one I shot was close to a village. The cob is a beautiful creature, and the herds we saw made a pretty picture as they streamed away in the distance with their easy, graceful strides which covered the ground so rapidly. Once or twice we disturbed a whole family party, who, unaware of our approach as we came up against the wind, suddenly emerged from amidst the waving grass, not more than a hundred yards away, throwing up their beautiful heads to stare at us for an instant, and then scampering off in alarm to a safer distance. With that curiosity so fatal to the antelope, they would halt after galloping a short way, and turn broadside on to have another stare at the intruders of their domains. This was the moment for the sportsman to take his shot, and it was such an occasion that I begged my beast. The country now assumed a more wooded aspect, Trees of the nature of an African oak were dotted here and there over the grassy surface of the ground, while small rivulets with steep banks and deep pools in their rocky beds were the happy playgrounds of merry parties of hippopotami who disported themselves in full enjoyment of the bright scorching rays of the sun. These rivulets were tributaries or backwaters of the Niger, breaking up the otherwise even surface of the land. After halting at one of these streams for the thirsty carriers to drink, we spied close by the big road which we must follow to Bamako. The road is a mere sandy track, thirty or forty feet wide, worn by the feet of hundreds of passers-by and herds of cattle into a passably level route. Level, that is to say, for a West African road, but not at all suitable for a two-wheeled cart, as its evenness is broken by frequent ruts, probably made by the rains but this road is a trade route of some importance, leading as it does from the metropolis of the French Sudan to the heart of French Guinea, and passing through the large markets dotted about the left bank of the upper Niger. We constantly met large herds of cattle, usually owned by Moors, as the French indiscriminately call the inhabitants of the vast territory north of the Senegal River, which reaches up to the confines of Morocco in northern Africa. These people are great traders, but dishonest, often lazy, and the most unblushing liars in the world, I should imagine. They are also very dirty in their person and their habits. The Moors, however, possess some excellent qualities, for they are extremely intelligent and most enduring on the march. Their knowledge of cattle tending must be great, as these beasts are brought hundreds of miles from the interior of Mauritania to the markets of Guinea without any appreciable loss of animals. The Moor is a cunning trader, who makes large profits out of his transactions with the more simple-minded Malenki. Their faces are pale, dirty whitish-yellow, their features are aquiline, while their noses have a distinctly Jewish, hooky appearance. The Moor has bright, piercing black eyes, which are a sufficient testimony of his shrewd nature. On the march, the cowherd travels on foot with his beasts, driving the huge droves in front of him with many weird cries and much thwacking with a stout stick, stopping every now and then to chase a truant out of the bush whither he has wandered to enjoy a succulent mouthful of grass, at the same time heaping imprecations on the luckless animal's head. They travel slowly, and will probably cover only ten miles in one day. It is by no means unusual for a caravan of cattle to take three months over its journey. The master does not accompany his animals. He is far too superior a person. He is the proud possessor of a horse, and follows his cowherds at leisure. On arriving at my halting place in the evening, about five o'clock, I have frequently seen this individual just mounting his steed in order to follow the herds we had passed that day. 
Riding his mount, he will cover the distance to their halting place in a couple of hours, and sleep there that night. The cattle are fine, big animals, and are the humped variety. They have huge, branching horns, stout bodies, and short, strong legs. The cows are small udders, and give but little milk in comparison to an English milk cow of their size. Besides cattle, the Moors bring large quantities of rancid butter and curdled milk to the French Sudan, where these find a ready market. The butter, which is carried in leather bags called guerba, especially appreciated by the natives, who do not appear in the very least to be disconcerted by the unpleasant smell thereof. The Moors speak a harsh, guttural language, containing a good many Arabic words. Their knowledge of the native languages is small, hardly extending beyond an acquaintance with sufficient market expressions to enable them to drive a good bargain. When they arrive at a village, they herd together in their own quarter of the place, mingling little with the West African natives whom they despise with a contempt they take no pains to conceal. It is a sound principle to avoid camping in the neighborhood of Moors, on account of their thieving propensities. Indeed, with the long, unkempt hair and wild, fierce faces, they have such an unprepoposing appearance that one naturally shuns coming into close contact with such rascally-looking people. It was noticeable as we advanced that we were getting into a land more under the influence of Islam than heretofore. In every village was a place set aside for the mosque. This consisted simply of a few rough logs laid on the ground in the form of a hollow square, with a break at one side for the doorway. At sunset, the muezzin could be heard calling the faithful to prayer, and a large proportion of the villagers would obey the summons. Mohammedanism is undoubtedly making great strides in this part of Africa, but, as yet, the Muslims are far from being devout followers of the teachings of the Prophet. Drinking, for instance, is far from unusual, but the religion has certainly had a beneficial influence on these people in more ways than one, and they are decidedly all morally better for their conversion from paganism. After leaving Tambala, we marched for two days through a sandy country, where the vegetation was more stunted and water more scarce. Although within three or four miles of the left bank of the Niger, Running water is scarce near the villages on the roadside. Most of them dig wells, for water is found close to the surface of the ground, and this is preferable to sending daily to the river for their supply. In the rainy season, there is not this difficulty about water, as the whole country is low-lying and would be inundated by the river. The lesser bustard I saw and shot frequently in this region, where the flat, grassy plains are a favorable haunt of this bird. All this bank of the Niger is much inhabited by the Cobus cod. Every morning, early, I used to see large herds grazing in the distance near the river. Stalking here was a difficult matter, as the country was so open. Except for an occasional orabi, there seemed to be no other variety of antelope in our vicinity. Bushfowl and guineafowl were very plentiful, and it was never necessary to resort to the tough skinny fowl which so often forms the staple article of diet for the white traveler in West Africa. My luxuries, such as whiskey and sugar, had by this time run out, but thanks to a good supply of flour, the faithful Mamadou was always able to bake me plenty of bread. With that, and an abundant supply of fresh meat and milk, I fared none too badly for the bush. On the 19th of February, we reached the large, important village of Kangaba, called sometimes Kaba. This was the first place of any size in the French Sudan, although the actual boundary between it and French Guinea was close to the spot where I had crossed the Niger. I have several times used the expression French Sudan, and feel it perhaps requires some explanation. It is a name the French have given, in a very broad sense, to the whole of that vast territory which comes into their sphere of influence, from Lake Chad to the Senegal River, and bounded on the south by the coast colonies of Guinea, Ivory Coast, and Dahomey, while the northern limit is the Sahara Desert. The western portion of this country is officially known as the Upper Senegal and Niger Colony, and this extends from Niafunki on the Niger, southwest of Timbuktu, to the Senegal River on the west. The colony is divided up into a number of administrative districts, and of course, covering as it does such a large area, the races who inhabit it 
are of many different types and shades. Kangaba is a walled town with a population of 2,000 inhabitants. The walls, which were built in the time of the Sofa Wars, are now crumbling to pieces as they are not kept in repair. They are built of red clay, which is found in quantities in these parts. The walls are still in some places 20 feet high and 5 to 6 feet thick. There are four gateways, one at each main point of the compass. The wall has been constructed out of the clay excavated from a big ditch running round the town. The ditch is now filled in in many places. Kaaba stands on the southern slope of a hill, commanding a fine view of the Niger Valley towards Bamako. The other sides of this hill, and the plain leading down to the river on the east, are covered with farms of guinea corn, rice, and millet. Kangaba is divided into three villages. The main one is the market for all the trade following the bamako Sigori road. Between it and the Niger, there are two other smaller villages. The nearest of these is the farming village, in which live many of the cultivators of the local crops. The third village is almost on the Niger banks, at least three miles from the market, and here the fisherfolk live. I had great hope of being able to pick up a passing trading barge here, which would give me a lift to Bamako. But at the time, there was unfortunately none on the river. My boy was very sore-footed and doleful when we reached Kaaba, informing me that he could not walk any farther without a rest. He really was going rather lame, but was suffering more from want of pluck than fatigue, I fancy. It had certainly been very hot on the march, particularly during the past few days. Also, we had marched continually since leaving Falama, and some of the days had been long ones. However, I decided to make one day's halt to let him rest, and at the same time to arrange for fresh carriers. Mamadou came to ask me for an advance of pay, going off in great jubilation to the market to spend on fineries the ten francs I gave him. He was no exception to the ordinary West African native, who is inordinately vain and lavishes all his money on dress. The chief of the town was full of protestations of hospitality, and nothing would satisfy him but that I should live in his house. He and his family turned out, going to a hut nearby. The old man was evidently of a kindly disposition, for I soon discovered, to my cost, that his hut was a right-of-way for all kinds of domestic animals. In the early morning I would be wakened by the lowing of a cow as she casually sauntered through my bedroom on her way to the pastures outside the village. The same animal paid me a visit one night while I was having a bath after my evening's shoot. On that occasion she seemed in no hurry to go away, appearing fully to realize the advantage of her position while I was bathing. My cries, intended to frighten her, were treated with silent contempt. When I flicked handfuls of water at her, she merely started to lick that portion of her anatomy which had suffered a wetting. Finally, I had to call my boy to drive out the offending beast. When the chief was given orders to prevent a recurrence of the annoyance, he gently replied that he was sure the missy, malinky word for cow, meant no harm. Besides the cow, numerous pigs, goats, and fowls used to make my room a daily promenade. The only way out of the trouble was to blockade the doors. I finally chartered two small boys whose duty it was to sit, one at either doorway, and drive away any offender which attempted to force an entrance. At night the market was a picturesque scene. Innumerable tiny stalls, each lit up by a small native lamp or flare burning groundnut oil, were dotted about. At each sat a woman, disposing of her wares. The articles for sale included fish, different kinds of native diet and fruit. But more interesting to the European were the vendors of such articles as grass mats, country cloths, gold ornaments made by the local smith out of Sigori gold, also balls of rubber and bars of native salt. While the women mostly sat quietly selling, the men wandered about in groups of two and three, chattering and smiling as they strolled along giving to the whole scene more the aspect of a promenade taken for amusement than for the sake of buying anything. Occasionally, however, one of these tall figures, clothed in a white Mohammedan gown, would stop in front of a stall and ask the price of some object he fancied. 
This usually was the preliminary to a great deal of haggling, and in the end the articles probably sold for about half the price originally asked. Bargaining is a feature of all transactions among natives, and necessarily so, for the seller goes on the principle of asking about double the value of his wares in the hopes that he will get it, and secure in the knowledge that he can, if required, reduce the amount by one half, and yet not lose. On the 21st I started off once again, hoping that this time, as we were out of the wildest bush, I should have no further trouble with carriers. Things in this particular respect were, to my disgust, worse than before. Along the high road to Bamako, villages were now strewed at close intervals. Having gaily started off with eight picked porters of sturdy build, I was congratulating myself that they would take my loads along at a fine pace to Bamako, and I need no further worry myself about them. Misfortune visited me at the first village, however, where my servant came to report that the carriers wanted to be paid and changed. We had not walked more than four miles, so it was rather trying to my temper to hear this piece of news. Haranguing was of not the slightest use, and one and all proceeded to slope away into some friendly hut or other convenient place of refuge. I summoned the chief and made him send for a fresh gang at once. After infinite delay, I got started on the road once more, but did not reach my halting place till late that night, after many similar vexatious delays en route. The numerous villages on the way made the task of keeping the carriers faithful doubly hard, they appearing to think that their duty was only to carry from their township to the next one. After this experience, I decided to abandon the attempt of keeping my porters even for one day, since no promises of high pay nor any amount of argument seemed to produce an effect. I now arranged with the chief or headman at the village where I spent the night to supply carriers to the next village only. At the same time, he was told to warn the headman of that village that I would require fresh men ready at the hour of my arrival the following day. The latter, in his turn, was ordered to inform the succeeding village of my requirements, and thus I laid a dack of porters for the whole of the morrow's march. This plan, although not an ideal one, I found worked better than the previous arrangement, and I adhered to it for the rest of the journey. The chief drawback to it was the loss of time involved. If I ordered my new carriers to be ready at a certain village at a certain hour, the chief of the place, with a native's delightful disregard of punctuality, would frequently not think of sending for his gang until I hove in sight. Time is no object to the negro, and he can never understand why it is a matter of any importance to the white man. Of course, these people have no watches, and their only way of illustrating time is to point to the position the sun will approximately occupy in the sky at that hour. Even that is not generally reliable within less than three hours. Often when marching to an unknown spot have I asked my guide where the sun will be in the heavens when we arrive, and he has buoyed up my hopes of an early arrival by indicating three o'clock, whereas we have not arrived till about six in the evening. That night, on entering the halting place, I noticed a white man standing in the market. He was a French trader who had just arrived, like myself, but from the opposite side of the Niger, where he had been to buy rubber for his firm. I asked him to give me the pleasure of his company at dinner, when we would celebrate the meeting of two white men in the bush. The last European I had seen was at Kenkan, a comparatively short time ago, but this trader had been in the wilds for six months without a sight of a white face, he informed me. We had a very pleasant evening together, and I produced the only kind of alcohol that remained for the festivity. It was a small bottle of rum, a part of my medicine stores, and we drank to the Entente Cordiale and a glass of that. My new acquaintance gave me some interesting information about the trade of the country. He said the rubber trade did not now pay as well as it used to, for the natives were no longer content with a few beads or looking-glasses in exchange for their produce, as had been the case a few years or even months ago. They now would only take cash, and demanded a far higher value for the rubber. We conversed on many topics of mutual interest, and it was with regret that I bade him good-bye when he got up to leave. Owing to the open nature of the country, the marches were harder even than before. In the middle of the day, when halting for a meal and a rest, 
One was played with myriads of small midges. These little insects are not to be seen when you are on the march, but as soon as you make a halt in the shade, they spring up from goodness knows where, in an incredibly short time, buzzing round your face in the most distracting fashion. They do not bite, but have a nasty habit of getting into your eyes, down your ears, and in your mouth and nose if you give them half a chance. I don't think I have ever been so worried by flies as I was here. Flicking with a handkerchief only seems to increase the fury of their onslaughts without visibly diminishing the number of your tormentors. The only remedy is to abandon the shade you had been so thankful to seek, and, if rest you must, sit in the sun as far from shady trees as possible. After about 4 p.m., these miniature demons seem to disappear, no doubt exhausted with their ceaseless activity of the daytime and seeking a much-needed rest. Two trees must be mentioned with grow in profusion here. One is the shea butter, and the other the African oak mentioned above. The former, called in Mandingo or Maleki, shea, and known to the French as the Carite, grows about the size of an ordinary apple tree. The leaves are a refreshing emerald green, and its graceful spreading branches and silver-gray trunk make it one of the most picturesque flora of the landscape. The fruit ripens about September or October. It is then picked and buried in the earth, where it is allowed to remain till it rots. It is then crushed with stones, and the oil which is expressed by this process is boiled. The resulting substance is what is commercially called shea butter. It has in this form a grayish-white color, and is made up into balls or small blocks for convenience of transport. Shea butter has several uses. It is first and foremost used by the natives as a cooking ingredient. The native is extremely fond of oily dishes. Consequently, shea butter takes a prominent part in all his culinary recipes. The odor of the butter, when cooking, is quite one of the most unpleasant it has been my misfortune to meet with in Africa. To my mind, it is so disgusting that I can think of nothing in England with which to compare it, and I feel convinced that any comparison would be inadequate, only being an insult to the English article. But, in spite of its unpleasant smell, it is only fair to say that it is invaluable to the native in a country where oil of any description is scarce. The oil is also used for lighting purposes, in the same manner as ground nut oil. Small flares of shea butter are used for the house or market at night. The method is simple in the extreme. A piece of wood or a bit of bark of a tree is scooped out so as to form a tiny hollow vessel, and the butter is poured into this. Wick is manufactured out of the fibers of a palm and is steeped in the butter and lighted. This primitive little night light is very serviceable and does not blow out easily in a wind. Shea butter is now exported to Europe, where the oil is in some demand for making cart grease and coarse lubricants. The export trade of the French Sudan in this article is increasing. The trees require practically no attention, growing wild in the bush in certain localities where the soil and climate are favorable. The other tree mentioned above is called in Mandingo monagies. It is also very abundant in this part of the Sudan. It has a pretty white flower, with a delicious smell like a magnolia. The tree flowers through a great part of the dry weather. The small twigs of this tree, which grows to a height of thirty or forty feet, are used by the natives for cleaning their teeth. The bark or skin is first peeled off, and the teeth are then rubbed with the exposed portion of the wood. It has a bitter taste, not unpleasant, which remains in the mouth for some time after the teeth have been cleaned. In the early morning, it's a very ordinary sight to see every carrier chewing one of these sticks as he walks, and when his load is laid on the ground, he will start to use it in much the same way as one uses a toothbrush. Walking along thus, and covering twenty to twenty-five miles a day, we reached Bamako on the 23rd of February. We were now about four hundred miles from the source of the river, and since leaving the railway at Pendembu, I had walked over six hundred miles, almost without a whole day's repose for when I had halted, I had usually been out shooting from early morning till evening, so I was glad of the thoughts of a rest. During the last thirty miles of the march, a low range of hills appeared on the west. This was the edge of the Kati Plateau. 
This plateau stretches for some miles towards the Bafeng River, and is a striking feature of the scenery near Bamako, where it dominates the town on this side, while the surrounding country is by contrast very flat and low-lying. The road gradually approaches the Niger on the east, being intersected by numerous small rivulets flowing in sparkling crystal streams from the Kadi Plateau to the Big River. The last ten miles or so are a vast expanse of cultivated land. Rich rice and millet fields stretch as far as the eye can reach in either direction, towards the Niger on one side and to the foot of the plateau on the other. This is the heart of a rice-growing district for the big markets which depend on Bamako for their annual supplies of food. The busy farmers of this region are prosperous and appear happy and contented, as they well may. We arrived at Bamako, a strange-looking party. I was tanned a deep brown color from long exposure to the fierce sun of the Sudan. My clothes were luckily khaki, or the state of my garments would have been even more noticeable than it actually was. I was much in need of a thorough overhaul and repair. Mamadou was in a far worse plight than his master. His long white robe and white baggy trousers were in rags, and certainly looked as if they had been any color but white, even in their palmiest days. Small wonder that the good people of Bamako were astonished at the strange figures they saw entering the town that afternoon. Crowds of small boys and idlers turned out to watch and follow our small caravan as it wended its way slowly into the big marketplace. I am sure we must have looked like some wild men from the woods. With some difficulty, I got someone to show me the road to the commissioner's bungalow where I was anxious to report myself before finding a lodging place. End of chapter 9、Chapter、ten of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. The first sight of Bamako to the traveler is, indeed, a strange one. After walking through miles upon miles of bush and seeing nothing more imposing than a native village, one suddenly is amazed to behold a fine, large town with wide boulevards and solidly built stone houses nestling close to the foot of the Cadi Escarpment, with the placid waters of the Niger flowing past the east end of the continent. Bamako is planned on the lines of a town in France. And on walking down one of the shady avenues, I could have imagined myself in a provincial French town on a hot summer's day. Bamako is the capital of the Upper Senegal and Niger colony, and the headquarters of the lieutenant governor and administration. The European population is a large one, and includes no less than fifteen trading firms, each of which has several French employees. There are a very large number of officials. And several of the staff of the Senegal Niger Railway. A number of these gentlemen bring their wives to the country. When I was at Bamako, there were about a dozen ladies who were very excited at the prospect of a fancy dress ball which was to take place shortly. It was very surprising to find such civilization in the middle of the western Sudan, and the town is a testimony to the energy of the French administration in West Africa. The houses now being built have two stories. And fine wide verandas. Water will be laid on to each one, and the streets will soon be lighted by electricity. I was directed to the commissioner's bungalow, a well built house in the centre of the town. He received me with all the courteous solicitude which the French nation so peculiarly knows how to show to the foreigner. After he had given me all possible assistance and information, I was invited to d i j e n e r the following Saturday. And shown the way to the hotel where I was to stay. Having sent on my kit, I proceeded to the offices of the French company, the trading firm which had arranged my money affairs for me at Sierra Leone. Here I was introduced to the agent, a most agreeable Frenchman, with whom I had a conversation about the funds which had been deposited with him in my favor. I had calculated the money I required for my journey from Freetown to Bamako to a nicety. And was very glad to be now able to draw a further supply. Here also, it was necessary to arrange for further drafts to be made payable to me at Timbuktu or some place down the Niger, close to my intended starting point for the desert. Unfortunately, 
The French company had no branches open in the Sudan on the route I proposed to follow, and I foresaw difficulties looming ahead if I should be obliged to carry large sums on my person or in my loads. My chief fear was on a score of robbers. Having no escort, and not having too much faith in my servant's honesty, it seemed highly imprudent to carry with me more cash than was absolutely necessary. However, my friend the agent was most obliging, and promised to try to arrange matters for me with another firm which had a house at Timbuktu. It may come as a surprise to some people to hear that French trading firms do actually exist at this point, which, I must acknowledge, to me had always seemed like a mythical place rather than a reality. But so it was. Two or three enterprising firms had pushed hundreds of miles down the Niger, anxious to be the first to tap the trade of this little-known region. I had decided, after my talk with the commissioner, to take the train from Mamako to Kalikuru, and at that point to embark on the Niger. There were two alternatives open to me, either to charter my own barge or to take a passage on a government launch. If there was sufficient water in the river, the latter would be the quicker way, and therefore the most advantageous for me. On the other hand, should the river be very low, I should do better to sail and pull downstream in the barge, which draws considerably less water than the launch. I therefore wired to the offices of the Niger Navigation at Kalikuru, asking which would be the surest and quickest kind of transport to take. The following day, the reply came advising me to take passage on a launch, which would leave about the first of March. At Bamako, the roads are excellent, and horses numerous, so that many people possess a vehicle and drive a good deal. Of course, most of the traps come out of France, but I saw one or two which had been locally made or first-rate copies of the French model. So far, motor cars have not been introduced, but I have not the least doubt that they will shortly make their appearance in this go-ahead African town. The roads are quite good enough, and I was informed that most of the bridges would require but little strengthening for this purpose. One afternoon, I went for a stroll towards the river. On the way, I passed through the native town, which is kept in spick-and-span order like the rest of Bamako. The people are mostly Bambaras, another large offshoot of the Mandingo tribe. Bambaras are an intelligent race, and possibly the most industrious of all the races of the French Sudan. Large numbers are recruited for the French West African troops, as they have a great reputation for pluck and endurance. The same tribe furnishes the best river boatmen, and Bambaras are found plying such varied trades as the shoemakers and the blacksmiths. They are scattered in more or less big groups all along the Niger, from Bamako to Mopti, and large numbers inhabit the countries about Nioro and Sokolo on the left bank of the river, stretching towards the desert. The men and women have fine physique. They are usually tall and thick-set, but rather clumsy in build. The women are very vain about their appearance generally, and their hair in particular. The coiffure is decidedly elaborate. There are two fashions in vogue. The hair is drawn up tight from the forehead and built upon the top of the head in a sort of ridge shape. This curious form is obtained by placing a framework underneath. The second method is to twist the hair into numerous plates, which are arranged fantastically around the ears and allowed to hang down over the face. Gold earrings and silver rings are much worn by the well-to-do classes, while sham pearl necklaces are in great demand as ornaments for these dusky beauties. The men and women are of a cheerful, light-hearted disposition, and it is seldom that these charming people have not a ready joke and smile on their lips by way of welcome to the stranger. Having passed through the native quarter, I saw in front of me several acres of banana groves, the long, graceful leaves blending in the distance with the darker green foliage of orange and lime trees. Besides many kinds of fruit, the government grow quantities of vegetables, with which the whole station is supplied. I was told that there is a never-failing supply from one year's end to the other. The scene on the banks of the Niger was an interesting one. A ferry was plying from the opposite bank towards me, in which were a number of passengers hurrying across before nightfall. Here and there, on the broad bosom of the river, were scattered native canoes with their quaint awnings of palm and banana leaves, 
looking like some big brown bird floating on the water. The banks of the Niger are low and sandy here, and on the shore were gathered a little knot of spectators from the town, talking and watching the arrival of the ferry, while, as the sun was sinking in a flood of red and gold behind the Kadi hills, those who were devout worshippers of the prophet sank to their knees and could be heard muttering in low musical tones a cry, Allahu Akbar. To my mind, it is an impressive sight to watch the pious Mohammedan at this hour forsake the occupation upon which he is engaged, prostrating himself with his face turned eastward toward the holy city of Mecca, forgetful for the time of worldly matters, but devoting his thoughts and prayers to his God. I stood a silent spectator of the peaceful scene until the fiery sun had disappeared behind the distant hills, and darkness began to descend with its customary swiftness on the face of the land, blotting out the water and craft from my vision. I must be hurrying back, as I had promised to dine with one of my new friends that night, so I regretfully turned away from the Niger and set my face homewards. That night I had a bad attack of fever, being obliged to leave my host early and retire to a bed, piled with blankets, for the next twenty-four hours. The reaction after my hard marching was probably now telling on me, and I had also a touch of the sun, I fancy. Hot lime drinks and some judicious doses of quinine and phenacetin soon did their work, and although feeling rather limp, I was myself once more. In the meantime, I had heard from the agent of the French company that he had been able to arrange for a draft on Timbuktu for me, so, my business being settled, I was at liberty to pass the rest of my time at Bamako as I pleased. I had two duties to perform. One was to pay an official call on the governor, the other being to visit the colonel and officers of the garrison at Caddy. Having made lent a horse by the commissioner, I decided to ride to Caddy, which was on the Caddy Plateau, about eight miles off. Before starting, however, I received a wire from the colonel, asking me to have déjeuner with them, so I postponed my departure till a later hour that morning, intending to visit the governor on my way back to the town in the afternoon. My steed was a flea-bitten gray pony about fourteen-point-two hands high, which had not been out of the stables for some days, so I had an interested audience to watch my departure, as they informed me he was très méchant. As we started down the road, my mount showed a decided desire to return to stables, commencing operations by shying and then standing up on his hind legs while he executed a kind of war dance. I think the spectators had their money's worth of fun before we finally got under way and set out at a gentle trot for Cotty. The road was a capital one, skirting for a couple of miles along the foot of the hills and then across the railway, gradually climbing the slope by gentle gradients. As we climbed, we left the burned-up khaki-colored plain behind and rose into a landscape of green verdure and sparkling streams. Many small torrents came headlong down the hillside, their rocky beds giving birth to iridescent cascades, around which hovered beautiful, many-colored butterflies. Up and up we climbed until the summit was reached, and I drew rain to admire the view spread out before my eyes. The well-watered green slopes of the hills stretched away to the north and west as far as one could see. Below me I could just catch a glimpse of the railway, the metal rails looking like a gleaming snake as they twisted about following the contours of the hill. To my right I beheld some whitewashed buildings glistening in the sun, evidently the cantonments of the Cati garrison. The horse-boy now arrived, panting and breathless from the climb. So, after waiting a moment to give him time to recover, I made my way slowly towards the houses. On my arrival, I had to apologize for the shortcomings of my wardrobe, for, of course, I had not been able to bring any uniform on my expedition, and my hosts were all attired in smart white tunics in honor of the advent of a British officer. The colonel was a fine-looking stalwart soldier, who had a splendid record of service in West Africa, and was wearing the cross of the Legion of Honor. That luncheon party was the merriest one I had attended for a long time, and, after many weeks of my own society since leaving Freetown, it was very enjoyable to be among such cheery companions. The officers of Caddy 
can get by train to Bamako nearly every day if they wish, but their duties keep them fairly busy in garrison, they inform me. They have a pleasant little colony at their station, and the joys of social life at Bamako do not apparently appeal to them greatly. As a matter of fact, the Europeans, at the capital of the Sudan, are divided rather strangely into three groups. The traders and the administrative officials of the district of Bamako are all quartered in the town, and, as has been explained, the troops and military officers are at Kadi, while the administrative officials of the colony are at a place called Kuluba, which is on a hill three miles from the town. The officers were most anxious for me to spend the afternoon with them, but it was half past three before we finished the sumptuous repast which had been prepared for us, and I had an eight mile ride to Government House at Kuluba in front of me. The lieutenant governor of the colony had been away touring, and only returned the previous day, so I was fortunate in being able to make his acquaintance before leaving Bamako. Government House is a splendid stone mansion situated on the edge of the plateau overlooking the town of Bamako and commanding a fine view over the Niger, which can be seen like a silver thread winding its way northeast towards Hulikoro. The lieutenant governor's residence is truly a palace. It is three stories high, and has large rooms and cool, wide verandas and corridors. The house is furnished in the most comfortable, if not luxurious, style and I had no difficulty in believing the statement that it was the finest house in French West Africa. I have seen no building in British West Africa which could in any way be compared to it. It is said to have cost a million francs to build, as all the material had to be brought from Europe. Electric light and hot water are laid on everywhere, and no effort seems to have been spared to make the place a model of comfort and elegance. The houses of the officials who are on the lieutenant governor's staff are also admirably fitted up. Water is a great difficulty on the top of the hill, but this has been overcome by installing an apparatus for pumping it up from the Niger below. The capital carriage road leads down the hill to Bamako, and there is also an excellent bridle path. The lieutenant governor had his wife and family at Kuluba. I was told that they proposed to spend a whole year in the country, as they found life so agreeable and comfortable at Government House. The lieutenant governor received me very graciously, supplying me with all the maps and information I required. He also promised to telegraph down the Niger, sending instructions for every facility to be given me where I wanted to shoot. In the course of conversation, I was rather astonished when he inquired after my two companions. I informed him that I was traveling alone and had no companions, whereupon he showed me a letter referring to the projected visit of three Englishmen to Bamako who were engaged on a scientific and hunting expedition in the western Sudan. He naturally thought that I was one of this party. I had, however, never heard of them. It was certainly a strange coincidence that another party of Englishmen should be contemplating a trip in this region about the same time as myself, more especially as Englishmen very rarely visit the country. I never met this party and am not aware if they ever started on their proposed tour. At Government House, I was introduced to one of the secretaries, who, I was told, had served in the Bend of the Niger, where I was to shoot, and would be able to give me information on the subject of the game in that locality. I was delighted at the opportunity of getting some reliable first-hand news. The gentleman I was introduced to had been in the heart of the country I intended to visit for five years, he informed me and was a keen sportsman, so I was in great luck to meet him here. He advised me to disembark at a place called Niahunki, nearly five hundred miles down river, and from there to strike into the district of Bandiagera, where a big game of many varieties was plentiful. He also gave me letters of introduction to the French officials of the districts through which I should pass, and informed me of the best hunters to be obtained at the villages in the region to which I was proceeding. His information was most valuable, and I was overjoyed to hear his glowing accounts of the shooting available in the Boucle, as the French call the Big Bend of the Niger. He, like most Frenchmen who shoot in West Africa, had used nothing but the Bebel rifle, which has a caliber but little bigger than the three o three. I cannot help thinking that a great deal of game must be wounded 
when such a small bore rifle is relied upon for the bigger animals. And, quite apart from the danger to the individual who is shooting, to my mind, this cruel to wound a beast which you are unable to overtake and kill, owing to the rifle being a less powerful weapon than should be used. My new friend invited me to his quarters, where we had a long and interesting conversation about shooting in West Africa. Later in the evening, we descended the hill together to Bamako, whither he was riding. We made an appointment for the following day in order to continue our conversation, but, unfortunately, it fell through. The Senegal-Niger Railway forms one of the links forged by the French for penetrating into the western Sudan from the coast. The river Senegal is the first link in the chain. From the port of San Louis on the Atlantic coast and at the mouth of the Senegal River, this waterway is navigable at certain times of the year for big steamers as far as the town of Kays. This town is situated about 400 miles up the stream. Above Kays, the Senegal River is not navigable, and until Kulikuru is reached, the Niger is not navigable, although from that point downwards, the river is navigable for many hundred miles. Now, to connect these two waterways, the Senegal and the Niger, it became necessary to join the towns of Kays and Kulikuru by a railway. The French thus completed a line of communication from St. Louis on the seacoast to the heart of the western Sudan. Although the Senegal River is navigable as far as Kays, this is only the case during certain months of the year. For instance, during the rainy season, from about July to November, ships of 2,000 tons can ascend to this point. Small steamers, launches, and stern wheelers can proceed to Kays until the month of February. But from February till June, the river is only navigable by canoes with difficulty. In consequence of this, the Senegal River is rather a weak point in the chain of communication with the interior. To remedy this, the French are now building a fresh line from Dakar, the new capital of the Senegal colony, and headquarters of the Governor-General of French West Africa, to Kays. About half of this railway is completed. The line is well laid, and the work of construction is in very capable hands, so there is no doubt it will be finished as quickly as possible. The saving of time will be enormous, for, in the dry season, when it takes about a month to reach the coast by the present route from Kays, it will, in future, only take two days by rail. The train, which runs three or four times a week in each direction, takes two days to go from Bamako to Kays. The carriages are fairly comfortable, and the railway is much used by natives, who take a childish delight in traveling by train. The trade of the colony has benefited greatly by the Senegal-Niger line, the output of ground nuts for export to France having particularly shown a large increase. Trains run nearly every day from Bamako to Kulikuru, a distance of only 35 miles. The third-class carriages are not uncomfortable. I traveled a short distance in one myself. Some of the compartments extend along the whole length of the carriage, having the two ends open which makes traveling in the hot weather much cooler than it would otherwise be. Railways in French West Africa are being rapidly constructed, and it is probable that in the next decade the Senegal-Niger, or the Guinea Line, will be continued across the French Sudan to the east of the bend of the Niger, and that the existing branches in the colonies of Ivory Coast and Duhomey will be extended northwards to meet it. The last morning of my stay at Bamako, I paid a visit to the market with my boy. I suppose it is the largest and most thriving market of the western Sudan. The produce of the large rice and millet farms of the Niger is brought here for sale. And this comes not only from the district around Bamako, but also from the big grain areas in the Messina province, some 350 miles farther down the river. Ground nuts, which are so extensively grown in the colony, form a large proportion of the produce of the market. But, in addition to grains, almost every article of trade in the Sudan is brought here. The same heterogeneous collection of different races which I had noticed at Kankan was to be seen, but the proportion of pale-faced Jewish-looking Moors was larger, while occasionally a stalwart Arab in flowing white robes would show conspicuously amongst the swarthy Negroid tribesmen. A great feature of the Bamako market 
is the part devoted to dairy produce. There are two distinct portions in this section. One has preserved milk, butter, etc., or, in other words, stuff which has been brought from the north of the Niger in goatskins and is invariably rancid. The other portion contains fresh milk and butter. The butter is made up in tiny round pats which are allowed to float in the calabashes of milk displayed for sale. Most natives prefer the preserved dairy produce, for sour butter and curdled milk are things which the soul of the Bambara loveth, probably finding their flavor more piquant and condemning the fresh articles as insipid. In another corner was the livestock, fine humped camel from the Niger Valley, Sudan sheep from the lake country in the Bend, many of which had thick coats of fleecy white wool, and goats from anywhere and everywhere were huddled up indiscriminately together. The horses were all of the same type. The 14 or 14.2 pony of the Sudan rather resembles the barb pony, but is weedier in appearance, although, from my own observation, I should back the Sudan animal to beat his barb contraire in a trial of endurance. I was told that camels occasionally came down to Bamako, but personally I never saw one there. The camel caravan routes nearly all stop on the north of the Niger and Senegal rivers. I fancy these animals are rarely brought across, partly on account of the danger attending the transportation of such unwieldy brutes, and partly because the river water is said to produce some kind of sickness from which a camel seldom recovers. In any case, there does not appear to be any advantage in introducing camel transport into a well-watered country. The hotel at Bamco is close to the railway station. It also possesses a buffet for the use of passengers. This was one of the several surprises which I had on my arrival at the town, for it had never entered my calculations to find an hotel in this remote region. There are two stories, with four bedrooms on each floor. The dining room is spacious and can easily accommodate twenty people. In the afternoon, when the sun is getting low, small tables are placed in the compound in front of the building, and here people congregate to talk over the events of the day while drinking their cognac or cup of coffee, for all the world like restaurant life in the boulevards of a town in France. At this hour the tables were generally full, the Frenchman being a sociable person and dearly loving this daily meeting with his friends at the restaurant. In the evening, when the lamps are lighted, two or three card tables are made up. I noticed that even there, bridge seemed to be as popular a game as it is with us. There's a small menagerie in the hotel garden, containing two ostriches and a few other wild animals. It was a strange sight to see the former animals strutting about in their lordly fashion, and, with their extraordinary powers of digestion, occasionally picking up and swallowing a stone in the calmest way imaginable. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 27th of February, I left by the morning train for Kalikuru. The director of the eastern section of the Senegal Niger Railway to whom I was introduced, traveled down in the same carriage. Commandant de Gay is a most interesting man, with a vast experience of railways in West Africa, and possessing a reputation for great energy and ability. He was formerly an officer of engineers, but is now retired from the French army. In the early days of the railway construction, many brave men laid down their lives while overcoming the engineering difficulties which had to be faced, and, he is one of the few survivors of those hard times. The line runs through a grassy bush country a few miles from the left bank of the Niger, and occasionally the passenger catches a glimpse of that river as it twists and turns on its northeasterly course. The train was a slow one, taking three hours to cover the thirty-five miles and stopping at every station. On approaching Kulukuru, the country becomes more hilly on the north and west, while the river is gradually seen more distinctly on the east. For West Africa, the station is a large and busy one. In the railway yard, there are repairing shops of skilled workmen capable of carrying out almost any work that is necessary. 
there are a large amount of rolling stock and a big engine shed. The day was Sunday, so our train contained several Europeans who had come over from Bamako to spend the day with friends here. Several people were on the platform awaiting our arrival. Amongst them, the local railway officials in white uniform were conspicuous, having come to meet the director of the line. We went up to the hotel, where I took a room and installed myself for the next two days. This hotel is similar to the one at Bamako, but is more comfortable and a good deal cleaner. The hotels were built by government and are the property of the railway, but I let the private individuals who were responsible for the entire management and charge their own prices. One of my fellow passengers that morning was a French officer coming down on duty to Colicaro. We made friends in the train, and he had promised to call for me in the afternoon to take me to visit the director of the Niger Navigation Service. About four o'clock we set out on our visit. The official in question was at home with his wife and two daughters. Madame was a charming lady from Algeria, and she and her daughters had but lately returned from an adventurous trip down the Niger to the farthest navigable point, a place called Ansango, a distance of about nine hundred miles. They told me they were the first white women ever to visit Ansango, and I can well believe that few ladies would care to risk the dangers and hardships of such a voyage. My new friend, Lieutenant Langell, sang us the most amusing songs to the accompaniment of one of the young ladies, and finally had only just time to catch the evening train back to Bamako. Monsieur Langell, although only a lieutenant, had seen considerable amount of service in West Africa, having commenced life there in the ranks. He had a large fund of funny anecdotes about the country, and was as pleasant a companion as can be imagined. I was indebted to him for introductions to several influential officials it was my pleasure to meet later during my travels. After the departure of the train, an adjournment was made to the hotel, where I met the resident of Kalikaru and his wife. A tennis court had been made in the gardens, and it was decided to play. I don't think I have ever played the game under such strange conditions as I have here. The net was locally made out of native fishing nets. The ground was the flattest piece of rock we could find, with the court lines marked out in white chalk, while the balls were of ordinary India rubber, and no one possessed tennis shoes. The rackets were, or rather had once been, tennis bats, and were the only part of our equipment resembling the real article. However, it was an amusing game, causing almost as much merriment to the players as it did to the spectators. After tennis, we all assembled at little tables in front of the hotel, as the custom is, to take an aperitif. Besides myself, there were only three men staying at the hotel. These were permanent residents, who were employed in the government offices, and found it more convenient to live at the hotel than to have a separate establishment in the town. As I previously mentioned, the terminus of the railway and the headquarters of the Niger Navigation Service are here. Consequently, there is a large number of European officials employed at Kalikaru. The navigation service is entirely controlled by the government. There are several stern-wheelers, small steam launches, steel canoes, and barges in the fleet. These vary considerably in size and comfort. The depth of the Niger alters greatly according to the season of the year. At certain times during the dry season, there is so little water in parts of the upper Niger that navigation, even by shallow draft barges, is exceedingly difficult. In the old days, when there was no craft on the river bigger than the native canoe, journeys were long and tedious. From Kalikaru to Timbuktu, even with relays of canoemen at frequent intervals, it was impossible to cover the distance in less than three weeks. But now a very different state of affairs exists, and the journey can be done on the average in twelve days. Since the railway has reached Kalikaru, repairing shops and a dock have been made, and the fleet of steaming vessels has been greatly augmented at this port of the Niger. One of my companions at dinner was a plate-layer in charge of a section of the line between Kalikaru and Bamako. As I happened to mention to him that I should much like to see the rapids on the Niger below Bamako, of which I had often heard, he very kindly offered to take me next morning by trolley to a station within easy walk of some of the rapids. I was delighted at the offer, which I gladly accepted. Next morning, as the sun was rising, 
I met my friend at the station, where he had his trolley ready. Our destination was a little place called Kianafala, about twenty miles down the line. It was very pleasant in the early morning air, as we glided swiftly along, running by our own momentum easily down the declines, while our trolley boys, four stalwart bambaras, pushed us up the inclines. There is something very exhilarating in the motion of a trolley. The sensation is that of being in a train, but with this advantage, that you have the benefit of being in the open air instead of being shut into a hot compartment. As we rattled merrily along, we caught glimpses of bushfowl and guinea fowl, who, scared by our approach, scuttled into the bush as we bore down upon them. Occasionally, a diker or bushbuck would be seen in the distance, terrified at the appearance of this strange, swift-moving object which invaded the privacy of their sylvan haunts. Whole families of monkeys were frequently to be seen gamboling on the track, along which they hurried as we made our appearance, only finally to dive into the bush as they realized the pursuing demon was overtaking them. Unfortunately, I was never able to get close enough to these animals for a successful photograph. In a little over two hours we arrived at the station, where we dismounted from the trolley. Half an hour's walk brought us to the Niger, and we were close to the rapids. There are two sets of rapids which interrupt the navigation between Bamako and Kalikaroo. About eight miles below the former town are the rapids of Sutuba, and below them again the rapids of Kien Kvala, which we were now visiting. For many miles this section of the river is very rocky, and, even for canoes, navigation is difficult. The water was low here, and we were able to clamber over rocky boulders into the middle of the stream, from whence we got a capital view of the rapids. As we gazed upstream, we could see that the river was split into three channels, separated from each other by huge fragments of rock. Immediately in front of us was the center channel. On each side of this channel was a rocky wall, towering up to a height of thirty feet above our heads. Some two hundred yards above, the water came swirling along in a seething torrent, until it suddenly reached the rugged precipice down which it fell in headlong impetuosity. It looked as if no craft could live in that pitiless rushing stream. Yet one or two Frenchmen have successfully descended those rapids. At the bottom, the water flows swiftly through a channel, said to be very deep, and then on for a couple of miles till the rocks begin to disappear, and the three separated portions of the river reunite. The water below the rapids is of the most beautiful deep blue color, a view I have never seen in any other river, but strongly resembling the blue one sees in the Mediterranean. I could have stayed for hours watching the splendid sight, the grandeur of the rapids, the roar of the waters, and the beauty of the blue stream at our feet, carried me away from the commonplace doings of the world. It was one of those moments which come to us all at times, when one feels mentally and physically in touch with nature. My companion suddenly awoke me from my reverie, pointing to the sun, which was now high up in the sky. We had to get back quickly, as the down train was due in less than two hours. After a little refreshment at the plate layer's house near the station, we mounted our trolley once more, and proceeded on the homeward trip. At a little village called Madame Bagou, we halted to examine the graves of some Frenchmen who had been buried there. These men were members of the expedition which ascended the Niger in 1884 under Lieutenant Hurst, the well-known explorer. Hurst was a naval officer who organized a small fleet of canoes for this expedition, and, starting from Mamaco with a few European companions and a following of native canoemen, successfully descended the rapids of Sutuba and Kianafala. After descending the Kianafala rapids, he made a camp near Madame Bagu, and, while there repairing damages to his canoes, he lost two or three white men from sickness, while others were unfortunately killed in a canoe accident. For many years the whereabouts of these graves could not be discovered, until at last, when the bush was being cut down in connection with some work on the railway line, the tombstones of victims of the horse expedition were disclosed. The little graveyard has now been cleared and is kept in good order. A few weeks later, I met a French naval officer, the superintendent of the Niger surveys, 
who had just arrived from France and had come by river all the way from Bamako, descending the rapids en route. He, like Hurst, came down in an ordinary dugout canoe, and, although successful, he informed me it was a thrilling experience, and one he would not lightly undertake again. The smallest mistake or hesitation on the part of the steersman must result in the frail craft being inevitably dashed against the rocks, and there would be no hope for the occupants. In the early days of French exploration, an explorer called Mage had penetrated into the Sedan as far as Kalikaru. Just outside that village, he was attacked by the inhabitants and killed on the hill which is to be seen at the south end of the place. Maj's death was not avenged for some time, but his name has since been perpetuated in one of the stern weather boats in use on the Niger. She was lying in the river when I was at Kalikaru, but useless till the next rainy season, owing to the scarcity of water at that time. That afternoon I walked out to Kalikaru Bara, two miles off, to call on the officers of the local garrison. A broad road leads to the village, and the officers' quarters are perched on the top of a hill above it. The road had a soft, sandy surface, and seemed to be a favorite resort for riders in the evening. When I passed, some half-dozen natives were racing on their gaily ornamented steeds. Excitement among the spectators was running at a high pitch as the cavaliers came tearing furiously down the road, urging their mounts forward with wild cries and much spurring. The winner, at the end of the course, shouting triumphantly at his victory, drew rein so suddenly as to throw his horse onto his haunches, to the imminent danger of those following, who narrowly escaped a collision. I was shown round the barracks by a young artillery officer, who was temporarily in charge of the station, and he very kindly offered to lend me a horse for the remainder of my stay at Kalikaru. But, I was unable to make much use of his offer, for when I returned to the hotel, I found a message to say that the steam launch would leave the following day. The next morning, I rose early, as I had arranged to pay a visit to the horse-breeding establishment, which was about three miles away. I was met by Captain DeFranco, who took great pains to show me the well-managed stables under his care. Very few mares are kept, but the stallions of the establishment are sent out to districts where a good class of mare is known to exist, and the owners of the mares are bound to sell the progeny to government should they be required to do so. The reason for this is that it was found many of the government mares were infected with the trypanosome produced by the tsetse fly bite. Some of them died, while others dropped dead foals, and so it was considered to be a wiser plan to let the risk of these accidents be borne by the native rather than by government. Captain DeFranco informed me that they had treated several cases of the disease successfully with arsenic, but, although the victim's life was saved, the horse was never as strong as he had originally been. The animals were certainly some of the finest I had seen in the western Sudan. Most of them came from the districts of Nioro and Sukurlo, on the left bank of the Niger. They averaged a little over fifteen hands, some showing distinct signs of Arab blood. We walked over to the riding school, where the young horses were being exercised. The riders were native lads, most of whom were expert horsemen before they came to the establishment, I was told. The difficulty is not to teach them to ride, but to teach them to be good horsemasters. They have been used to the brutal native methods, using the cruel native bit, and regarding the horse as a machine incapable of feeling pain or fatigue. Once these ideas have been driven out of their heads, they become very useful members of the stables. The captain was very proud of his house, which he had built himself with materials specially ordered from France. It was certainly very comfortable and furnished with great taste. I hurried back to the hotel to find my servant sending the loads down to the wharf. In the last two days I had rearranged my kit and repacked the chop boxes and had reduced my possessions to twelve carrier's loads. I now went to the navigation offices, where I purchased my ticket for Niafunke. I was introduced to the Brigadier de Vaisseau, the European skipper of the little launch, with whom I had to share a cabin. Accommodation on the boat was limited. There was a tiny cabin with two berths forward, while the other passengers had to pitch their camp beds, if they could find room, in the stern of the vessel. Some of the baggage was stowed in the hold, but the heavier articles were in the lighter, which we were to tow. 
My fellow passengers were two European non-commissioned officers. One of them was proceeding to the garrison town of Bobo Jilasu, while the other was bound for Timbuktu. I must say I pitied these two men. They were so cramped in the narrow space allowed them that the discomfort of a journey downriver lasting several days must have been great. To add to the general unpleasantness, there was only a thin awning to protect their heads from the fierce sun, so that they could never discard their sun helmets during the day. In the bows of the steam launch there was a small space available, with just room for a couple of chairs, and in the center of the space was the wheel, where the steersman took up his position. Our crew were mostly bomberas, three of whom were river pilots. A special knowledge of the river is necessary for the man at the wheel, as the Niger is full of sandbanks, rocks, and other dangers to navigators. Our vessel was the Wene Kei, called after the famous French explorer of that name, who in the years 1827 and 1828 came across the Sahara from Morocco to Timbuktu, eventually returning to Europe by the same route. These boats are known to the French as Vides, while the stern wheelers are called Manodous. The latter appears to be a misnomer, for these boats have two wheels and not a single one. In the lighter towed behind us, besides the baggage, there was a collection of natives. Some of these were soldiers with their wives and families, and a very happy party they seemed to be as they sat on packing cases at the bottom of the boat, chattering and laughing while we waited for the brigadier to come aboard. All formalities were at length completed, and the director of navigation came out of his office with our skipper to bid me good-bye. As we steamed away from the shores of Kalikaru, I felt my spirits rise at the prospect of seeing fresh woods and pastures new, and this bade fear to be one of the most interesting portions of my journey, for at last I was on the navigable Niger, after following it from its source for so many hundred miles, and seeing it gradually grow from a tiny, insignificant stream into a fine, big waterway. End of chapter 11「of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. As we glided easily down the river, I began to think that life on the Rene Kei would be rather pleasant. It was very enjoyable to sit on deck in an easy chair, watching the rapidly changing landscape as we went merrily along at five or six miles an hour. The river was not more than four hundred yards wide here, and its bed was frequently split into three or four channels by spits of sandbank. Many of these channels were certainly not more than forty yards wide, so the little launch required careful handling to get around the numerous turnings of the stream. On the left bank, the Kalikaru hills were still to be seen gradually extending farther and farther from the shore until they were lost in a blue haze in the distance. On the right bank, the country was extremely flat. Vegetation had become more and more scarce, until, on this side, the ground was merely covered with patches of low scrub. Occasionally we passed a fishing village, a collection of small mud huts huddled together on the river banks. As we steamed by, a swarm of black urchins would come out to look at the launch, waving their dusky little arms and shouting greetings. As evening began to fall, a number of tiny islets, fringed with trees, began to appear on the landscape. In spite of the dry weather, the trees were clothed in mantles of rich green, relieved only by masses of ruddy, orange-colored flowers, in places where the beautiful flamboyant or gold mohur tree prospered. Canoes laden with grain and paddled by a couple of sturdy natives frequently passed us, while occasionally a barge under full sail with cargo from the big markets downstream passed us speeding on our way to Kulikuru. The next morning we reached the important trading village of Nyamana. This place was considerably larger than anything we had yet seen. The houses are built of the reddish-brown Niger mud. They are solidly constructed dwellings, the color of which so nearly approximates to that of the surrounding soil that the inexperienced eye cannot detect the presence of a village until almost within hailing distance of it. Nyamana is on an important trading route leading from southern Mauritania to the Niger, and it is at this point 
the caravans crossed the river on the way to the big markets of Bobo Jilasu and Sikasso. Even as we arrived, a big convoy of at least three hundred camels, which had just come in, was to be seen watering at the river bank. The camels would not cross the Niger here, but the merchandise would be transported to its destination on carriers' heads. It was the first time on this journey that I had come across camels, and it was a curious thing that at my first view of them I should see no less than three hundred. We halted here for an hour to take in wood. A certain amount of coal, in the form of briquettes imported from France, is burnt on the Niger vessels, but the majority of their fuel consists of wood. Special arrangements are made with the headmen of certain villages on the banks to stack wood for the use of steamers. When a boat requires fuel, she blows her steam whistle to attract the attention of the village, and then gives an order for the amount taken to the headman. The latter can obtain payment for his wood on presenting the order to the commissioner of his district. On resuming our way, we approached a part of the river where sandbanks appeared to be more numerous than ever. After two or three ominous bumps, we suddenly felt a severe shock, and the little vessel came to a dead stop. We had stuck fast on a sandbank. Our skipper shouted the order to go full speed astern, but all his efforts seemed unavailing. The crew were then made to jump into the water, and, after shoving and straining for about half an hour, with the engines going astern the whole time, we at last got clear. Soon after this misadventure, I noticed ahead of us a big lighter, flying the French flag in the stern. We rapidly overtook her, and, as we came abreast of each other, the two crews exchanged greetings, shouting to one another the usual string of salutations which are customary in this country. When one begins to understand the language, it is amusing to listen to the very nature of the questions the native asks a fellow traveler when they meet. The usual type of question and answer is much like this. Welcome, my friend. I hope you are well. Quite well. Praise be to Allah. And how are you, my friend? I am very well. But is your house in good repair? Yes, thank you. But tell me news of your horse. These salutations continued for ten minutes or more, and each traveler wastes a considerable amount of time in every journey in this fashion. Even when the two men have resumed their way, they can be heard shouting back salutations to each other as long as their voices are audible. Besides the ordinary greetings, corresponding to our good morning, good night, etc., these simple natives have such greetings as I salute you in the rain, or greetings for the sunshine, and a host of other expressions according as it is rainy or fine weather, etc. On the deck of the barge were two Europeans, a man and a woman. They turned out to be the resident of Kalukuru and his wife, whom I had met a few days previously. The former had been appointed a commissioner in the district of Pandiagera, whither he was now on his way. I expected to meet them again later, as I was likely to be shooting in their district. However, we missed, and I never saw them again. The René Calais soon outdistanced the barge, but she overtook us again during the course of the day, owing to our large sticking, on several occasions of more or less long duration, on sandbanks. This portion of the river is inhabited by a number of crocodiles. These repulsive creatures are hated and feared quite as much by the black man as by the European. Consequently, there were several members of the crew eagerly on the lookout for the crouching forms of these animals as they basked in the sun on a sandbank. Immediately one was seen, I used to be informed and would pick up my rifle for a shot. Sometimes even the keen eyes of the boys would be deceived, and they would mistake a log for a crocodile. There really is not much difference in the appearance of the two objects, and often one's first intimation of the presence of a crocodile is given by seeing the supposed log suddenly and swiftly slide off the bank into the water. In the dazzling sun it was frequently difficult to distinguish these beasts, for their yellowish-gray bodies would assimilate well with the sand on which they were lying. Sometimes we would see them swimming in the river, the only thing discernible being a black speck just raised above the level of the water, which is probably a bit of the head. The natives are afraid to bathe in this portion of the river, owing to the frequent accidents which have occurred. Many were the gruesome stories we were told. 
One of the pilots said he had a brother who was a fisherman in these parts. This man had a small son, and one day the mother had taken him down to the river while she was drawing water. The little fellow toddled a few yards off and began splashing in the shallow water near the edge of the stream, when, by some misfortune, he slipped into a deep pool and was at once carried off by a crocodile. The mother's first warning was a cry of terror from the child as it was drawn struggling under water by the horrible creature. The unfortunate woman's horror and anguish as he stood there powerless must have been terrible to witness. Crocodiles are objects of superstition among the natives here. Usually crocodiles in the abstract are regarded as a juju, but in some cases these animals are kept alive in the village for fetish purposes. At one place where we halted in the evening, there was a big tank in the center of the village. In this tank there lived a huge crocodile, for which the natives had a wholesome respect not unmingled with fear. Around the tank they had built a strong mud wall, several feet high. The creature used to be fed daily with enormous lumps of meat. He was reputed to be fifty years old, and he probably was a good deal older than that even for the most aged inhabitants of the place could remember his existence when they were children. Undoubtedly, crocodiles live to a very great age. River crocodiles are said to travel long distances at times. I recollect once in India, a river crocodile was found in a small swamp about twelve miles from the nearest water. It was known that no crocodile had been in the swamp previously, and it seemed as if it must have come across dry land for the whole of that distance. The René Calais used to steam about twelve hours a day, from sunrise to sunset. I suppose we covered an average daily distance of sixty miles. Traveling, even by the noon, at night was impossible, owing to the narrowness of the navigable channel. When there is plenty of water in the river, boats travel day and night. About five o'clock, or a little later, we generally halted for the night near a village. A supply of wood was then taken on board, so as to be ready for an early start next day, and, after that duty had been performed, all hands were allowed to fall out to cook their evening meal. It was a cheery sight to watch the campfires dotted about on the river bank, each with a little group of black figures busily engaged in cooking operations, while the little launch lay peacefully at anchor with the last rays of the setting sun reflecting the red light on to her. I was glad to step ashore and stretch my legs on these occasions. If it was not too late, I used to take my gun and a boy and stroll off on the chance of getting a shot at a bushfowl or pigeon. On this part of the river there was a big mottled pigeon. Its color resembled red roan more nearly than anything else. This pigeon is about twice as large as a green pigeon, and I always saw it near water. It feeds chiefly on rice or millet. Waterfowl were still extremely scarce. Since leaving Kulukuru, I had only seen one flight of duck. The non-commissioned officer, who was going to Bobo Jilasu, was a keen sportsman, and used often to accompany me in the evening expeditions. His gun was a sixteen-bore, and he told me he never bothered to clean it. One day, out of curiosity, I looked down the barrels. It was certainly in a very dirty condition and it passes my comprehension how he managed to shoot with it at all. He was not a bad shot at a bird on the wing, but used to say he could not understand the necessity for shooting at birds flying when you could so often get an easy shot at a sitting pigeon or bushfowl. However, we had some pleasant walks together, and generally brought in something for the pot. Sandflies on the river banks were frequently very bad at night, I found that my small meshed mosquito curtain was invaluable, but the worst time for these plaguy little creatures was between sundown and bedtime. They seemed to be aware how helpless you were, and took the opportunity of making the most of those two or three hours. Big logs of wood were scarce, and somehow a lot of small fires did not seem to give the same immunity from their attacks as did one big log fire. I preferred to sleep on shore, my companions usually slept on board. The chief drawback to sleeping on shore was that one had to rise in the dark in order to get the kit stowed aboard before we started. The nights were very cool and pleasant, and being safe under my net from the onslaughts of the insects, 
and always managed to sleep very comfortably. On the 3rd of March, we reached Segu. This town is 112 miles down the Niger from Kalikaru, on the right bank of the river. As we approached the hitherto, brown, sandy banks became fringed with fresh green vegetation. This was tobacco, which has grown to a great extent here. The leaf is small, and therefore, although the tobacco is of good quality, it is not worth exporting to France. The natives smoke it and use it as snuff. Tobacco is a greatly appreciated luxury in this country. It is only grown in strictly limited localities, and invariably commands a high price in the market. The tobacco plantations gradually disappeared as we drew nearer to the town, and wise spreading trees made their appearance together with the Europeans' gardens of vegetables and flowers. Sigu is the capital of the district of that name. It is an important trading place with a fairly large population of white men. We were to stay here three hours, so I went ashore to call on the commissioner. He lived in a well-built mud house, a portion of which was his office. While talking to him, a young Frenchman entered to whom I was introduced. He was the agent of the French Cotton Growing Association. This gentleman very kindly offered to show me his ginning apparatus, a proposal which I eagerly accepted. Monsieur Lavelle, who spoke English remarkably well, was the most interesting man to meet. He had had a large experience of cotton growing in different parts of the world, and was therefore peculiarly qualified to speak on the subject. A good deal of cotton is grown in the basin of the Niger about here, Segu being the central market to which the stuff is generally brought. Native-grown cotton, as was previously explained, is short in the staple and rather coarse. The French Cotton Growing Association has tried to introduce the cultivation of Egyptian and American cotton. Monsieur Lavelle had distributed large quantities of these seeds to the natives in the endeavor to induce them to grow a better class of cotton, but, he informed me, the result so far has not been very encouraging. The output has been small compared with the quantity of seed distributed, and this, it appeared, was not so much due to the soil being unsuitable as to the natives being too lazy to plant the cotton. Ginning is carried on upon a big scale. There is also a hydraulic press for compressing the cotton as it is packed into bales. The association has its own barges which transport the cotton to Kalikaru for shipment to Europe. There are also two other branches, one in the south of the colony on the Benai River and the other at Kays on the Senegal River. Monsieur Lavelle introduced me to the officers of the garrison, who took me to their quarters and were most eager to be told all about the life of a British officer in West Africa, and to know whether I thought it differed much from their mode of living. In many cases, the French do not have regular messes, but each officer lives by himself, and once or twice in the week each individual takes a turn in inviting his brother officers to dinner or déjeuner. They seem to prefer this method, saying it obviates the disadvantage of the too close companionship of mess life. On leaving Zegu, we had a recurrence of the troubles of the previous day. In fact, this portion of the Niger is the most difficult to navigate of any part between Kulikuru and Timbuktu. The channel is continually blocked by shoals, making progress very slow and traveling very irksome. There are a lot of fishing villages about here, and large herds of cattle are seen at times. The fisherfolk are bossos, a hardy race, but people of no great intelligence. The bossos are pagan. They are looked down on by the superior tribes who surround them and appear to have little ambition. These people have ever been a downtrodden race, so that probably any spirit they once had was long ago crushed by their numerous conquerors during the troubled times before the French appeared at the end of last century. The next day we arrived at San Sanding, where we had to halt a whole day to effect some repairs to the machinery. This place is a semi-independent native state, governed by a native ruler called the Fama. It is interesting as being the only native state with its own little government in the colony, or, I believe, in the whole of French West Africa. The Fama is the most enlightened man, who was educated at the government college at Hayes, and afterwards went to France. He speaks French well, and has very sound ideas for a native about the administration of his government. 
He has built himself a European house, in which he possesses French furniture, pictures, china, and a host of modern comforts. He is very hospitable, insisting on our partaking of wine and coffee with him. The town is neatly built and kept in good order. Owing to the shallow water, we had to anchor two miles downstream, and went up the small creek leading to the town in a canoe. Between the town and the launch there was a stretch of grassy bush, so, before returning to the boat, I decided to investigate the shooting possibilities of this bit of country, intending to walk back by the river bank. I was alone on this occasion, as the French non-commissioned officer who used to accompany me had disembarked at Segou, whence he would march to his destination in the south of the colony. The Fama's shooting ground proved to be an excellent one. The good people of San Sanding had evidently not much acquaintance with guns, and were quite scared when they saw me raise a harmless-looking object to my shoulder and simultaneously heard a report. When a bird fell, the astonishment of the natives was great. I believe they thought it was the work of some wonderful and mysterious medicine. Most of my beaters dispersed with marvelous rapidity at the noise of the discharge. Weapons of any description are scarce here, but the chief national arm is the spear, although even that is but rarely seen. On returning to the launch, I found a small fish market was in progress on the sandy river bank. The wives of the soldiers, who were being towed in the steel canoe behind us, were bargaining with great zest and vehemence. It appeared that the buyers and sellers had very divergent views on the subject of what was a fair price to charge. If I had not fortunately arrived on the scene, I am afraid the ladies of the two parties would so far have forgotten their good manners as to come to blows. On leaving San Sanding, the boat was hailed by a canoe, which just came around a bend in the river as we started. We hove to, and awaited the arrival of the occupant, who was one of the sons of the Fama, who had come with a present of milk and eggs from his father. This youth, whom we had not seen on paying our visit to the town that morning, also spoke French, and had been to the high school at Dakar for his education. I am afraid, however, that he will never be so fine a specimen of a native as the present Fama, and it seems doubtful if he will have the chance of succeeding his father. I understand that when the present ruler dies, the French intend to incorporate San Sanding as a new district in the colony of Upper Senegal and Niger. The appearance of the river alters considerably from this point. The banks become more wooded, and backwaters and small tributaries penetrate far into the country on both sides. Some of these waterways are navigable for launches, but the channel is narrow and constantly broken into two or more parts by small islands. At Diafar Bay, the right bank is intersected in a hundred places by these creeks, and in the rainy season, the town, which is low-lying, must be almost under water. From this place, the interesting town of Genet can be reached by water. Genet is the holy city of the French Sudan. The biggest mosques are here, and the priests have the reputation of being the most devout. The standard of learning is also higher here than elsewhere. So much is this the case that the French have allowed an Arabic school to be established at Genet in preference to any of the commercially more important towns of the Sudan. Almost every village has a Qadi, who practically corresponds to the Munshi of India. He it is who writes all the letters of the villagers, for most of the latter cannot read or write, of course. When a reply comes, it is his business to read it to the recipient. These Qadis make a profitable income out of this work, and it is at Genet that they are taught. The letters are written in Arabic characters. All letters are written in Arabic in this country, there being no written native language. It follows that, even if a letter is read out to the addressee by the Qadi, the former cannot understand the purport until it has been translated into his own tongue. It will be understood that under these circumstances, letter-writing and reading are slow and tedious matters. The majority of the inhabitants of Genet are Sunrai, a nation of whom there will be more to say later. In olden times, probably up to the 15th century, they used to display a certain amount of originality in their architecture. The houses of the town are built with minarets and cupolas, while over the doorways and in the windows there is a fair amount of fresco work. 
This is the only race which apparently had some idea of architecture, for this art is noticeably conspicuous by its absence as a rule among Negroid tribes of Western Africa. There is no doubt that this interesting place has always been a town of importance. It is situated in the richest grain-producing country of the Niger south of Timbuktu, and thus has invariably attracted a large number of traders. The Niger now becomes deeper and wider, and soon after Diafera Bay, it assumes a more northerly direction. We pass several river barges about this time. Some are owned by the government, and some are the property of private individuals or French trading firms. For sails, they use big, mat-like contrivances made out of grass. These primitive sails look very picturesque. They have the advantage of being cheap and easily repaired, but, of course, they are not very durable. The grass out of which they are made grows on the banks, and is a kind of supple reed. They are plaited around sticks, which are pegged into the ground so as to enclose a hollow square of the area of the required sail. When the wind is not favorable, these barges are pulled. The pilots now had an easier time, for the water being deeper, navigation was no longer such anxious work. Two of these men used to be on duty at a time. One managed the wheel, while the other stood in the bows of our little craft, pole in hand, ready to take soundings by measuring the depth of water shown by his stick at any place where it shallowed suddenly. These pilots were rather a picturesque garb, blue and white vests, blue serge, baggy trousers, and a red tam o shanter the kit somewhat resembling one of the French sailor, from whom it was probably copied. Those not on duty used to spend their time fishing. The fishing tackle consisted merely of a stout line with a hook on the end, to which was attached a piece of fish as bait. This line was dropped over the stern and towed behind us as we moved. I cannot say they were very successful with their fishing tackle, for I only saw them make two catches during the whole voyage. Another amusement was to make fish nets, for which purpose their toes came into great request. The native makes great use of his toes for catching hold of a loose end of rope. Indeed, he is often more nimble with his toes than with his fingers. I used generally to pass the morning writing up my diary and working out the previous day's observations. After lunch, I would join my fellow passengers on deck, where it was pleasant to sit and read or watch the changing scenery, with an occasional sod at a crocodile by way of variation. About this time, we were delayed by a strike in the engine room among the stokers. Two of these men were so insubordinate as to necessitate their being put in irons. This left us very short-handed. We stopped at the nearest village to try to get two substitutes, but the new hands were so stupid as to be almost useless. To make matters worse, some of the machinery got seriously out of order, and we had to slow down in consequence. The whole of the engine room seemed to be disaffected, and I could not help thinking that the breakdown in the machinery was purposely done by them out of spite. Unfortunately, the skipper was newly arrived from France, and had not much experience of the wiles of the natives. But we were now near Mopti, where villages were less scarce, and the river was widening considerably. On the marshy, low-lying banks grazed big herds of cattle, followed by an indolent rustic, who turned round to steer an idle curiosity as we approached. Sometimes the launch would let off her steam whistle, and at the sound of this unaccustomed noise, the cattle would career wildly away in terror. Flocks of sheep and goats there were, too, but the river banks were often too swampy to permit of the latter grazing near the water's edge. All this country is extraordinarily flat. For miles in every direction, there is an uninterrupted view of a flat, grassy plain through which the Niger slowly wends its way. The fall of this river is very gradual, as can be easily appreciated from the fact that it takes 2,440 miles to fall less than 4,000 feet in its course from the Tembukunda Mountains to the sea. Hence, the current is extremely slow as a rule. The river is here still known by the name of Jolaba to the natives, and it is not till it enters the British territory of northern Nigeria that the natives call it Korara or Kuora, a name it preserves until it reaches the sea. As the river widened, we noticed several large creeks on both sides until we came to a very large stream flowing into the Niger from the east. This river, 
which was even wider here than the Niger, was the Bani, and as soon as we entered it, we saw in the distance the town of Mopti. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. Mopti is the chief town in the rich province of Messina. The province lies entirely on the right bank of the Niger. It extends on the north to Lake de Hobo, on the east almost to Bandiagara, and on the south to the town of Genet. The whole country is flat, except for a low range of hills to the northward. The towns are all built on slightly rising ground, in order to avoid the floods which cover the countryside at certain times of the year. Indeed, were it not for this slight elevation upon which they stand, they would inevitably be submerged. As it is, they stand out like islands from the midst of the surrounding plains. Practically the whole province is inundated during the season of floods by reason of its low-lying situation. Two big rivers are the main factors in producing the state of affairs. One is the Niger, while the other is its affluent, the Bani. Besides these two big streams, there are numerous tributaries of both which play their part in the inundations. Messina is the richest grain-producing country of the French Sudan. Huge areas of land are under cultivation for rice and millet, large quantities being exported annually to feed the people of the Senegal colony. The soil is peculiarly adapted to these two cereals. Rice is grown on the clay ground found close to the river banks, while the drier, sandier soil found farther away from the rivers is admirably suited to the production of millet. The country may be, and frequently is, compared with Egypt. There is a striking similarity between the physical geography of the two lands. In each case, a mighty river flowing through a flat, sandy country fertilizes huge tracts of land on its banks by its annual inundations. But here the resemblance ends. In Egypt, nature's handiwork is aided and improved by artificial irrigation, digging canals, making dams, etc. In the western Sudan, nature does everything, and man does nothing. The native is too lazy to dig irrigation canals, for he makes large profits out of his grain crops as they are, and has not the necessary ambition to wish to increase them. I have enough to eat and clothe myself, says he, and there is sufficient to satisfy the needs of my wife and children. Therefore, why should I toil further? His mode of argument is a natural one, and is very common in the fertile countries of West Africa. It is an acknowledged fact that not a quarter of the fertile land is under cultivation, and by judicious irrigation the fertile area could be more than doubled. The population is undoubtedly small compared with the area of the country, but the existing numbers could certainly grow far larger crops than they do at present, without greatly increasing their working days. The population is augmenting rapidly, as a natural result of the existing prosperity and peace under the French rule, for this land suffered like so many others from the constant petty wars which were waged up to the end of the last century. In the season of the floods, it must be a wonderful sight to gaze from Napti over the huge lake which spreads its waters over the face of the land for one hundred miles in one direction, and sixty miles without interruption in another direction. I regretted that I was traveling in the middle of the dry season, and when I was at Mopti the rivers were confined within their natural limits. I was told that when the country was inundated, the game all herded together in the few dry spots available, so that shooting them was positively slaughter. The unfortunate animals are frequently surprised by the sudden and rapid rise of the water, being either drowned or cut off without chance of retreat until the water subsides. Owing to the existence of these waterways, transport by river in the Messina province is obviously greatly facilitated. The Bani River is navigable to Jijin, a hundred kilometers distant, and even at times to the town of Sakaso. Jijin is not actually on the Bani, but a navigable creek connects the town with the stream. Lighters and launchers can use that river as long as they can navigate the Niger. Canoes can use it all during the months of the year without difficulty. The future of this province seems to be assured, for the increasing population will give a great impetus to rice and millet growing. In the course of time, irrigation is certain to be introduced, 
and the revenue will go up by leaps and bounds. Almost immediately opposite the junction of the rivers Niger and Banny, there is a small town, with an imposing-looking building of wood and galvanized iron. The place is Charlotteville, while the house, I was informed by a pilot, belonged to the King of Mopti. Charlotteville is really a part of Mopti, and as one proceeds up the Bonny, the two other portions of which the place is composed come into view. These two latter, being quite two miles from the former, are close together, standing on the top of miniature elevations rising out of the surrounding plain. The center portion is the abode of the resident and traders. All the natives are being gradually relegated to the southern part, while Charlotteville is noteworthy for being the residence of a French colonist. It was this colonist who was mentioned to me as being the King of Mopti, and I was much surprised to hear that His Majesty was a white man. I believe his title originated from a large fortune which he had made and lost in the place. In any case, he had lived many years at Mopti, had had large dealings with the natives, and was well known to them for many miles around. This gentleman supplied the Europeans with vegetables and fruit from a fine large farm which he had made on the place. At Mopti proper, where the resident resides, the place has quite a civilized appearance. On approaching it, we could see several European buildings with tin roofs, conspicuous amongst the brown mud-built native houses. The town is built well up on a slight eminence for the reasons previously stated, a wide stretch of sandy foreshore extending down to the water edge. A few leafy trees throw a grateful shade on the front of the town. Otherwise, trees are singularly deficient around Mopti. The surrounding plain, when I passed through, was covered with scrubby grass, very much burnt up at this time of year. The marketplace has a distinctly Moorish appearance. This portion of the town is behind the European quarters, and consists of small, narrow streets in which are long rows of mud-built booths, open at the front and back, where are to be seen the vendors of local produce, squatted native fashion behind their wares. The resident was away when I arrived, but I was shown the places of interest by the assistant resident, who, by his wide knowledge of the natives and the country, had evidently an extended experience of them. A road is being built from the main town to a low range of hills in the north, in order to connect the place with dry land during the floods. The road is an embankment some thirty feet above the plain, and its length is to be about eight miles, so the task is not an easy one. Another road is to be constructed to unite Mopti proper with the native town. A fair road exists between Charlotteville and the residency, so that very shortly the three portions of Mopti will be permanently connected. A big school is also being built, to which the surplus pupils of the Jenei Arabic College will be sent. Altogether, Mopti is a very go-ahead little town, and certainly one of the most prosperous on this section of the Niger. At Mopti, I was introduced to an interesting French merchant, Monsieur Simon. This gentleman has done much to try to improve the quality of rice put on the market by the Messina province. I mentioned that a quantity of this rice was exported to Senegal, but it did not find great favor there because it was dirtier in appearance than the Indochina rice. Also, the latter could be bought almost as cheaply at St. Louis as Messina rice. The high rate of transport on the Senegal-Niger railway was largely responsible for this big price. Monsieur Simon was of opinion that if the rice were cleaned locally, it would be more appreciated at St. Louis, and further, that by setting up a mill at Mopti, the cost of unhusking it could be materially reduced, permitting it to be sold at a lower price and thereby successfully competing with the Indochina article. The rice is not really dirty, but grain grown in this country has a small reddish streak in it, which gives it an unappetizing appearance in comparison to the milky white rice from Indochina. Monsieur Simon has imported a mill which can perform three distinct operations. One, clean the rice. Two, unhusk it. Three, scrape off the red skin. This mill can treat 2,000 tons per annum. Monsieur Simon proposes to import a 100-horsepower engine which will be able to deal with 2,000 tons yearly. By this means, he will be able to so lower the cost of his rice as to sell it at St. Louis for 180 francs per ton instead of 210 francs, the present price. 
when the Thies K Railway, connecting Kays with the coast, is finished, it is thought that it will be possible for government to reduce the freights by rail considerably, and a further fall in the price of Sudan-grown rice may be confidently looked for. Owing to the trouble in the engine room, it was found necessary to wait at Mopti for two days. Here also, there was a suitable opportunity for punishing the malefactors who were responsible for the breakdown. We were all very pleased to hear that they had been heavily fined and had had their licenses taken away by the commissioner. The night of my arrival, I dined with the French officials, and one of the dishes consisted of some excellent venison, which I was told was a haunch of port hog. It appeared that these beasts were plentiful in the vicinity of Mopti, so it was arranged the next day to have a shooting expedition in the wart hog country. The animals were on the other bank of the Niger, a very early start being necessary in order to reach their haunts by daybreak. My French friends were unable to accompany me at the last moment owing to pressure of work. At four a.m. I started off in pitch darkness, being paddled on the river in the government canoe by a couple of sturdy bozos. The air was chilly at that hour as we moved swiftly through the water. Stillness reigned around us for the first half hour, until, about dawn, the phantom shapes of flighting duck and geese began to show themselves. At the risk of being a bit late for the warthog, I could not resist the chance of some sport with the duck on the river, so I ordered my canoe men to paddle the craft into a sheltered nook under the reeds, where I was concealed and in a good position for the birds as they flew overhead. We were evidently at last getting into the waterfowl region, for hitherto I had seen but few on the Niger. After some pleasant sport, in which I managed to collect three or four varieties of duck, besides a goose and some teal, I urged the canoe boys to hurry on to the spot where I was to land. The sun was just rising as we stepped ashore at a small village. The country was a swampy tract along the river bank, such as the warthog delights to roam in. On the west, as the ground became firmer, it was covered with patches of mimosa bush and low scrub, where the pig would come and feed in the early morning and evening, while during the day they made their lair in the low ground. We had not gone far when a gray object loomed up in the still uncertain light, looking so much like the trunk of a mimosa tree that I hesitated whether or not to fire. The object was not more than seventy yards away, affording an easy shot. During that interval of uncertainty, I saw the thing suddenly turn and gallop away at a good pace, settling the question of its identity once and for all. It certainly was a warthog, so I took a flying shot at its retreating form. It careered on, however, untouched, with his tail contemptuously curled up behind it, in the ludicrous fashion adopted by these animals when frightened. I had started the morning badly, and could not help thinking I was unlikely to get another such easy chance. Tracks there were in plenty, but it was not till I was well on my way back that I managed to shoot one. My first indication of his presence was given by hearing the peculiar grunt to which they gave vent when disturbed. He only trotted a few yards off, however, before halting to stare at me, thus giving an easy chance. These animals are very stupid and curious. Indeed, I think they show more inquisitiveness than antelopes. I have frequently watched a warthog turn round to stare at his pursuer four or five times before he gets out of range. The result is, of course, often fatal to him. The curious excrescences on the beast's face undoubtedly make him one of the ugliest of living creatures, and the white curling tusks projecting from his jaws tend to enhance his uncouth appearance. Warthog are very plentiful all along the Niger, from Lapti to Timbuktu. The bend of the river is one of their favorite habitats, particularly that portion where water is plentiful, and which is generally called the Lake District. I have often seen them in droves of eight or ten, and have generally found them far from being wary, so that they are easily approached. Their sight is bad, but they appear to have a fairly keen sense of smell. I do not think they have very sharp hearing. On the way back to the canoe, we made a detour through some grassy country, where I picked up a couple of lesser bustard. I also saw some greater bustard, but my efforts to approach within rifle shot of these very cunning birds were unavailing. Both kinds of bustard seemed to be common about here, but the greater was less common than the lesser species. At the village on the river bank, 
and to wait a short while for the meat of the warthog to be brought in. The headman of the place asked me, with well-meaning hospitality, to rest from the heat of the sun in his house, but after a glimpse inside I decided it was far cooler and pleasanter under a tree in the open air. The houses in this part of the country are made of mud, circular in shape, with roofs of grass thatch. Verandas are unknown, and, as there is but one small door, ventilation is very indifferent. The houses in the hot weather are like ovens, for I suppose the temperature in the day is well over a hundred degrees inside them. At night the numerous members of a large family are all crowded together in this small space, so that I should imagine the atmosphere must be even more intolerable than by day. On our way up the river to Mopti, I saw several white egrets. These beautiful birds, which used to abound on the upper and middle Niger, have greatly decreased in numbers during the last few years. The reason for this is that a great trade in egret feathers used to be done by French merchants, and thousands of the creatures used to be slaughtered to supply the market. It was told of several men who had made considerable fortunes in this way. The practice was particularly cruel, as the most valuable feathers only grow during the mating season, the massacre of the birds thus tending rapidly to wipe out the whole species. The matter was, however, strongly represented to the French authorities, who took strict measures to suppress the wanton destruction of egrets on the Niger. A fine of one thousand francs is now imposed on any offender, and the result of this law has had a most salutary effect in preventing these birds from being shot, so that it is much to be hoped that in a few years they may have regained their former numbers. The best feathers are found on the back, and comparatively few can be obtained from one bird. Consequently, a large number of egrets must be killed to produce a fair bag of feathers. Besides the white egret, there is also a grey egret. The latter variety is not so valuable as its white relation, but the color is a very beautiful French grey. At Mopti, one of the merchants had a tame lioness. This beast was quite a cub when it was captured, and the story of its capture is rather an interesting one. One day, when shooting near the river banks, he had killed the mother of a big family of lion cubs, and was leaving the scene of the exploit when he heard a whining noise in the bush hard by. On searching the foliage, he discovered this young lioness, which he used to follow the example of his brothers and sisters, who had all bolted at the report of the rifle. This little beggar appeared to be heartbroken at its mother's death, refusing to leave the spot. She was easily captured, and has been a pet ever since. She was about twelve months old when I made her acquaintance, being kept chained up in the courtyard at the back of the trader's house. Her owner says she is perfectly harmless, but I would not feel inclined to trust her very much. Her manners were decidedly rough. She used to play with a dog when younger, and I was told they were fast companions. A beast of this description is certainly difficult and expensive to feed when it arrives at maturity. A friend, in this case, used to make a meal off a big sheep or else two goats daily. She was not given a full ration, for, as the Frenchman, her master, explained, if she were too well fed, she would grow so strong as possibly to be unmanageable. I am afraid that even now she is getting out of hand, and any day may have to be destroyed to prevent a disaster. While at Mopti, I met a young Frenchman who had been wounded in rather a strange way when on a hunting expedition. As may be gathered from the following story, he was not very experienced, or such an accident could never have occurred. He and a friend had made up a shooting expedition in the same locality where I had been for Warthog. They separated at one patch of bush, with the intention of meeting on the other side. The young fellow, thinking he would have a lark at his friend's expense, and apparently never dreaming of the danger he might incur, made his way through the bush in the direction of his friend, halting every now and then to emit a grunt in imitation of a pig. The other sportsman, seeing a dark object half concealed in the foliage, and thinking by the noise it made that it was a warthog, fired his rifle. To his horror, as the object dropped, it uttered an unmistakably human cry of pain. He then discovered that he had fired at his friend, wounding him severely in the leg. Under the circumstances, the latter was distinctly fortunate not to suffer worse injuries. He might very easily have been killed, and, of course, no blame could have been attached to his companion. 
The young man had been on crutches for some months at the time I saw him, but luckily the injury would not permanently affect him. Another fortunate point in the business was that the bullet was not a sporting one, but solid-nosed, and simply went straight through the leg, emerging on the other side without shattering the bone, as it unquestionably would have done had it been of a different make. Before I left Mopti, the commissioner returned. He had been to Chennai to buy wood for building the school. It is a strange fact that at Mopti there is practically no wood. Almost the only wood suitable for building purposes in this part of the French Sudan, and indeed for many hundred miles downstream below Timbuktu, is the wood of the dum palm. At Chennai this tree grows profusely. The great enemy of the carpenter in West Africa is the white ant. This tiny creature has a most voracious appetite for wood, but certain kinds, amongst others the dumb palm and the coconut palm, are impervious to his attacks. White ants always work in large numbers. They can be seen traveling along in armies of several thousand, marching in single file or two deep, and following a little groove or channel which they have excavated for themselves. Their presence in wood is first detected, if you are lucky, by observing a narrow streak of earth running along the object they are attacking. This is, in reality, a tunnel which covers them and affords them shelter while they work in the wood underneath. They are most persistent little creatures, seldom abandoning the object they are devouring until they have eaten right through it. If you are not fortunate enough to discover their presence by the appearance of the earthen tunnel, your first intimation will probably be given by the sudden collapse of the particular article upon which they have concentrated their efforts. If this happens to be one of the uprights which supports the roof of your house, even if you have the good luck to escape without personal injury, it is trying to suddenly find the building in ruins. Hence the necessity of using the wood which can resist their onslaughts. Tarring wood will, to a certain extent, keep them off, but it is by no means viable. The only way to preserve wooden boxes and similar articles, which generally rest on the ground, is to put sauces of water underneath, for the ants will not then be able to climb on to the wooden surface. Ants of several species are common in West Africa. Another kind, which is in many ways more irritating even than the white ant, is the driver ant. This animal also travels in big armies like the one already referred to. The driver is only found in bush country. I never came across it in the drier, sandy soil of the western Sudan, where vegetation is not so luxurious as in the countries near the sea coast. He is brown and larger than the white ant. His particular hobby is to bite. He is certainly an adept in the art of biting, as his unlucky victim soon discovers to his cost. The driver is often seen on a bush path in the daytime, when the best way of avoiding a close acquaintanceship is to leap over the track he is following, and then vigorously shake your feet as soon as you have got well out of his range. For despite all precautions, some of his followers in the army will be fairly certain to have succeeded in attaching themselves to your legs as you passed. But when the driver elects to come at night, as he frequently does, you probably have no warning of his approach until you feel his bite. Once they have settled on a victim, they swarm mercifully over him in thousands, and, if left to work their evil way unmolested, they will not leave the object of their attacks until they have devoured it. I recollect on one occasion having a very miserable night owing to drivers. I had gone to bed rather tired after a long day's march, when I suddenly woke up with unpleasant stinging pains in my legs. I quickly realized that I had been attacked by drivers. Leaping out of bed and striking a light, I discovered my blankets were covered with a black swarm of these horrible creatures, several of which had settled themselves on my limbs with some tenacity. On summoning my servant, we tracked the long line for about a hundred yards down the clearing in which I was camped to some dank vegetation out of which they were emerging. The only chance of turning them aside and getting a little sleep that night was to light a fire across their tracks. To add to the general discomfort, it was pouring with rain, and a fire was not an easy thing to kindle. However, at the cost of most of the kerosene of which I was possessed, we managed to light a fire and head them off. In such cases, it is usually the best policy to shift your camp and leave the ants the masters of the field, for they are extremely hard to turn aside. I have seen them put out a fire by sheer force of numbers."
In some parts of the country, where the natives are pagans and indulge in human sacrifice, a common method of killing their victim is to tie the individual up, stripped of clothing, in such a position that movement is impossible, leaving the driver ants to consume the body. The tortures of such a slow, agonizing death must be terrible. A friend of mine once had two puppies devoured in this way. His fox terrier bitch had a litter of three puppies one evening, and the following morning only one remained. The ants had invaded the dog's basket during the night, and the mother had only been able to save a single member of her family from her pertinacious enemies. End of chapter 13「Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara » by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 9th of March we left Mopti, finding considerably more water in this section of the Niger, chiefly due to the increase in its volume caused by the influx of the Bani. On both banks there were now wide stretches of rich green grass springing luxuriantly out of the spongy soil, which, even at this season, was covered with several inches of water. Big herds of Fulani cattle, often immersed to the withers in water, could be seen grazing as we steamed easily past the banks. The cattle had a strange appearance, as not much more than their heads were visible. But stranger still was the cowherd, who, mounted on one of his beasts, also in the water, to better supervise their feeding, urged them on from time to time with weird cries and thwacks from his staff. The grass which grows on the banks of the river, from Mopti and away down the middle Niger, is called Borgu. It is very fattening, as it contains a large percentage of sugar, hence probably the fine condition of the herds in this region. The river was more than ever broken up into creeks and channels. To me it seemed a hopeless task to know which was the correct one to follow, so similar and so numerous were they. Often the wider branches were merely backwaters, running a few miles inland. But the pilots were never puzzled, and evidently knew their work well. Sometimes, on one of the swampy banks, there would be a large open piece of water, upon which could be seen myriads of duck and geese, reveling in their feeding grounds, undisturbed by the sportsmen. As we progressed, a thick mist began to enshroud the landscape. We were approaching the great lake Debu, around which this curious mist generally hangs. About five-thirty, just as the sun was setting, we reached the lake. The entrance is marked by two curious bare sandstone hills, standing out like sentries above the surrounding flat country. As the René Ke suddenly emerged from the river, as far as the eye could see there was a wide expanse of water covered with miniature frothy waves which, except for the occasional patches of reeds peering here and there above the surface, might easily have been mistaken for the sea. The lake, however, is very shallow. In many places a man could wade across without much difficulty. Debu forms a natural reservoir for the waters of the Niger in a singular manner. When the rains fall in the mountains of Timbukunda and Fudujalan in French Guinea, the upper Niger naturally rises and the lake fills up. This continues from about June to October. All this time the middle Niger, which has no tributaries, owing to the dearth of mountains and the proximity of the desert, is getting dry, more especially as rain on that portion of the river is so infinitesimal in quantity as to be of no consequence. Towards the end of the rains the lake fills up and overflows, replenishing the middle Niger. The overflow from Debo continues to fill up the middle Niger, but all this time the upper river is decreasing in volume owing to the cessation of the rains in the Guinea Mountains. Hence the curious phenomenon is observed of the upper Niger subsiding as the middle Niger increases, and vice versa. It is for this reason that when the upper Niger is unnavigable for steam launches, these boats can work on the middle Niger. The Rene Kae had orders to ply only between Mopti and Kabara, the port of Timbuktu, after this journey, as the water in the upper Niger would now be insufficient for her. The bed of the lake is covered with a kind of river oyster, which is said to be excellent eating, but I never tried it myself, 
although we dug up a number of them as we crossed the place. The skipper was anxious to make a port on the other shore of Debo that night, if possible, but we had entered the lake so late that it was dark very quickly. Owing to the width of the lake, it was hard by day, but impossible by night, to pick up landmarks by which to steer. The lake being shallow, and sandbanks numerous, steering by the compass was not of much use. So, after many bumps, it was decided to anchor for the night and continued the journey at daybreak. A cold wind blows nearly all the year round on Debo, so that night I was glad of my blankets for the first time since quitting the Tembekunda Mountains. In the morning I was up betimes to have a good view of the lake. The mist was rising, and I could plainly discern a small village towards which we were steering, and farther ahead still was a wide silver streak flowing northwards out of the lake. The village was a fishing place called Aka, where we were to take in some more wood, while the river was the Isa Bear. At this exit of Lake Tebo, the Niger splits into two large streams, the Isa Bear and the Bear Isa, both of which are navigable and which reunite in a town called al wal Uji, about 120 miles further downstream. The main branch, and the one we were to follow, was the Isa Bear. This flows past the town of Niafunki, whilst the Bear Isa flows past the town of Seraferi, where I was to make its acquaintance later, to the east of the former river. The journey to Timbuktu by either stream is of about equal length, but the route by the Isa Bear is preferable as the channel is wider. At Aka, I hoped for some duck shooting while the launch was getting fuel. It was quite early when we anchored off the village, and I went ashore, gun in hand, accompanied by a couple of the crew. Behind the place were some likely-looking swamps and small lakes, whither we bent our steps. Having secured the services of a local rustic to show us the best spot, I hurried off in order to make the most of the short time at my disposal. The first place we approached was surrounded by a fringe of tall reeds, affording excellent cover for a gun. Near the opposite shore there were a number of various kinds of duck and teal, enjoying the morning air and unaware of our presence. I instructed my followers to maneuver round to the other side, while I cautiously crept into my position in the reeds on the near bank. The beaters soon began to approach the birds, amongst whom there were evident signs of unrest, as they started to chatter and flutter their wings in the water. Presently up rose a cloud of what looked like white plumaged birds, which came flying rapidly towards me. As they circled over my head, I had a right and left at them, bringing down one bird with the first barrel. They now whirled swiftly away towards the opposite shore, but before I had reloaded I saw some grey teal rapidly approaching. I had time for a barrel at them before they were out of range, when some more duck and then some geese hove in sight. As soon as the birds returned toward the beaters, they were driven away with loud cries and volleys of stones hurled in the air in their direction, whereupon they usually circled back towards me, evidently much disconcerted and unable to understand the unwanted report of my gun, with the occasional fall of one of their number. Altogether I had some capital sport, and was loath to hear the warning whistle of the launch, indicating that we must gather up the spoil and retrace our steps. Most of the birds were picked up, and I had collected a nice little bag. The white-plumaged duck which I had first shot proved to be a fine big bird, spur-winged, weighing eight or nine pounds, and although it looked quite white in flight, the back was covered with rich black and dark green feathers. The gray teal's a beautiful little bird, very swift of flight, and quite the most delicately flavored of any waterfowl I shot on the Niger. This teal has a brown beak and light mottled gray breast, darkening to partridge color towards the tail. The wings are beautiful pearl gray, while the back is a darker shade of the same color. The feet are dark gray. It is common in the swamps and lakes north of Debo. There was another gray teal of about the same size as the one described, but of a uniform mottled gray partridge hue. At first I thought it might be the female of the other gray teal, but I am inclined to think it was quite another species and was certainly much less common. The goose I shot 
was a bird weighing about ten pounds. The wings and back were copper-colored, the breast on her surface grayish-white, while the legs were yellow and the beak red. The Bamboras called it Bayolu. This goose was very common north of Mopti. It is frequently seen feeding in the fields during the daytime. I cannot recommend it as a dish. The flesh is extremely tough. Even when well stewed, it was almost too hard to be eatable. Finally, I used to use it only for making soup. The largest game bird I saw on the Niger was a duck which must weigh at least fifteen pounds. It has a black beak with a very distinct red knob on its nose, just like a Barbary duck. The body and breast are black and white, while the wings are black with a dark greenish tinge. This bird is also spur-winged. It was so large that he used to have a joint off it, treating a leg as one would a leg of mutton. After leaving Mopti, we encountered the Niger River winds. These winds blow almost permanently from the northeast, that is to say, the general direction is upstream. The result is that progress upstream is frequently more rapid than when one travels with the current, for in the latter case, the wind on this section is adverse. The wind accounted also for the waves on Lake Gabo, making the motion so unpleasant that I could easily believe the skipper when he said people were often seasick here. One or two barges we passed under sail were spanking along at a great pace upstream. The day before our departure from Mopti, a French gentleman had arrived from Genet in a lighter. Owing to the strong headwinds, he could not make any progress in his craft, so arranged to be towed by us. He was a newspaper reporter who had come out from Europe to study and write a report on certain native tribes of the western Sudan. Monsieur Malbranc had made some interesting investigations at Genet and was now en route to Timbuktu for a similar purpose. His barge was lashed alongside us so that one could easily step from one boat to the other. The roof of his lighter made a pleasant spot upon which to rest and watch the passing scenery. We used to sit together and have many interesting discussions about travel. He was a man with a wide experience of French colonies who had been in most parts of the world in connection with his literary labors. His river barge had done a long journey already. He had started from Kulikuru some three weeks before me, but passing to Genet from the town of Diafarbe and then following the Bani River to Mopti. The Isa Bear is here nearly half a mile wide, and with such a fine depth of water that we steamed along merrily, having no longer any fear of sticking on a shoal. After leaving Lake Tebo, the aspect of the banks changed considerably. The vast patches of Ogu on the banks gradually disappeared, giving way to a sandier soil, well wooded near the water's edge. As we approached Neafunki, the western shore grew more sandy, while the trees and scrub became more scattered. Our first view of the station was a glimpse of three rectangular mud-built houses, standing on rising ground not far from the river bank, with a tricolor waving proudly in front of the center one. The native town was tucked away in a dip of the ground behind the residency, so as not visible from the river. As we came alongside the little jetty, two or three French officials advanced to meet us. I was introduced to the commissioner, his assistant, and the doctor, and invited up to the residency where I was to put up. I had arranged with the skipper of the René Caille to take my surplus baggage on to Timbuktu, as I intended to travel light only taking a month's supplies on my hunting expedition into the bend of the Niger. I had spent a pleasant ten days on the little launch, and now said good-bye, for she was to start off that evening, and would travel day and night till she reached Kabera. The river being now so much wider and deeper, navigation by night was easy. So the René Kay steamed off, and we went up the hill to the station. My host gave me a most palatial room in his house, in which I felt lost after living in half a tiny cabin on the launch for the past few days. That evening we were a pleasant party of seven. Besides the officials, two men from a sheep farm had come to dine, and I had to promise to pay their farm a visit before leaving the neighborhood. The doctor and I made great friends. We had much in common, as he was almost as keen on sport as myself. 
He had a good deal of pleasure time at Nyafanki, and had spent a considerable portion of it in shooting. We arranged for an expedition the following morning, as I had decided to pass two days here, giving me time to settle my best plan of campaign for the future. The next day we were out before daylight, equipped only with light rifles, as we did not expect to see anything bigger than hartebeest, or we would probably only see gazelle. We were evidently on the edge of the Sahara, for the soil was very sandy, and vegetation of the sundant desert variety. The trees were mostly mimosas, and as the sun rose, the delicate fragrance of their golden blossoms was wafted towards us on the morning air. That morning we did not see much big game. In fact, it was not till we were on the way home that we saw a small herd of red-fronted gazelle. We each had a rather long shot, and each of us missed. Small game, however, was abundant. Amongst the mimosa scrub we frequently saw hares darting about, while sand grouse were very numerous. The latter were strangely difficult to see, as they crouched close to the ground, their speckled yellow color harmonizing exactly with the sand in which they lay. They would sometimes get up almost at one's feet, unperceived, until one heard their peculiar cry and the whir of their wings as they swiftly darted away. Here I saw the doctors successfully practice the trick of approaching a greater bustard by stalking it in an ever-narrowing circle. The plan is an extremely simple and apparently effective one. The stalker, perceiving the bird at a distance of about two hundred yards, proceeds to walk round it slowly in a circle of this radius. After completing the circle, he gradually decreases the diameter, moving slowly the whole time until he is within about fifty yards. At this point, he cautiously goes into position with his rifle and has a shot. The bird does not seem to notice the gradual diminution of distance, and in this way seems to be fairly easy to approach. It is certain that to attempt to get within shot in open country is difficult in any other way. On the homeward road we passed a small stream where guinea-fowl and bush-fowl were plentiful. Indeed, it seems strange that in this narrow fringe of country, almost bordering on the desert, there should be such a quantity of small game. We came across several thorn zerabas, used as sheep pens by the natives in order to protect their animals from the lions which prowl round this region. The doctor informed me that no lions had been seen for some months past near Neofunki. However, these animals travel great distances in a short time, and they might turn up again unexpectedly at any minute, so the native is wise to take precautions. Neofunki is the last district under civil administration on the Middle Niger. The remainder of the country is administered by the military authorities. The resident very kindly gave me one of his policemen to accompany me till I arrived at Timbuktu. The uniform of the policeman has a great moral effect on natives, so I was pleased at having this man to assist me in the villages through which I would pass. The last afternoon of my stay the doctor and I went on another shooting excursion. Our plan was to ride out to a place where we would probably get some warthog and gazelle. Then in the evening we were to go on to Galba, where the sheep farm was, and where we intended to spend the night with the two men I had met at dinner the previous day. We had a pleasant ride, but fortune seemed to have deserted us much as she had done the day before. My friend had two difficult shots at a gazelle, but was unsuccessful, while I only saw one warthog when it was too dark to shoot. The sheep farm is almost on the Niger banks. It is purely experimental, being started by government to try to improve the breed of the local sheep. The native sheep of the western Sudan is not a bad little animal and gives a fair crop of wool. The wool is, however, rather coarse, and it was thought that the quality could be considerably improved by obtaining a better standard of sheep in the country. Experiments are first tried by breeding from specially selected animals belonging to the country, but results were not very encouraging. It was then decided to import from Algeria a certain number of rams for breeding with a native sheep. Before dinner we paid a visit to the sheep pen. One of our party was a veterinary officer who had just arrived to investigate some sickness which had recently broken out among the animals. There were forty of these Algerian rams, but unfortunately the sickness referred to had spread to an alarming extent amongst them, and when I saw them 
they were in poor condition. Shearing had been taking place that day, some very fair samples of wool being shown me. In spite of their haggard appearance, the Algerian rams were very decidedly superior to the West African sheep, the latter looking surprisingly small and puny in comparison. The enclosure in which the sheep were penned was a mud wall six feet high, while the only entrance was closed by a stout wooden door heavily barred. I was struck by the thickness of the door, and asked the reason for such precautions. I was told that leopards were common in that district, so it was advisable to secure the sheep against a possible raid. Strange to relate, that very night we were to have an illustration of the presence of a leopard. The natives of this part of the Niger keep big flocks of sheep, the price of one of these animals being ridiculously small. A big sheep can be bought for one franc fifty cents, and the mutton is of quite good quality. Any science in breeding is, however, totally unknown to these people, hence the breed is tending to deteriorate. During the cool season, the sheep have plenty of pasturage, but towards the end of the hot season, food is scarce and poor. The French are anxious to develop their wool trade, hence their efforts to improve the quality of the wool which is produced in the western Sudan. For such articles as rough carpets, blankets, etc., the existing wool is much used in Europe, but a finer quality is required if the trade is to be really remunerative. A white blanket is made from the wool of the Sudan sheep, and is embroidered with red or green threads. This blanket, although rough, is a most serviceable article on the cold night so frequently experienced in this part of the country. The natives use them as a covering for themselves by day, and as a bed wrap at night. This was the only article manufactured by these people with their own wool. Some time after we had retired to bed, I was suddenly aroused by hearing loud exclamations of alarm proceeding from the native quarter close by. I rushed out with my rifle in hand and was met by my hosts, also in night attire, the veterinary officer being armed like myself. A scared negro appeared at this juncture with the news that a leopard had come into the sheep pen, having jumped over the wall and had carried off a sheep. The alarm had been raised by hearing a commotion in the pen, and the leopard was actually seen by one man bounding over the wall with his prey. The vet and I immediately started off on the frail hope of coming up with the animal, but as there was no moon, the tracks had to be followed by a lamp. This tedious process led us eventually to some bush in which the tracks were completely lost. The following morning, the animal's pug marks were distinctly visible near the house in which we had slept. It appeared to have circled round the place several times before it made its raid on the sheep. After this accident, the wall of the sheep pen was raised considerably, the top being covered with a few strands of barbed wire. A mile from Galba is the government ostrich farm. The farm is managed by a European, who was unfortunately absent when I was there, and contains about forty birds. These have been caught young by natives and are kept with a view to breeding. The ostriches give two crops of feathers annually, in January and June. At present, the farm is only in an experimental state, but it is hoped in time to produce a large quantity of feathers from the place. The manager was then on a tour down the Niger in order to try and find a more suitable site for the farm. It must be near the desert, for ostriches are more easily obtained from natives there. Also, it is found that the desert air is better suited to the birds, which produce finer feathers if kept in their natural atmosphere. From Niafunki downstream, and upon both banks of the river, ostriches are found. Sandy country is essential to them. Hence, in the parts where there are widely irrigated areas between the rivers Isa Bear and Bera Isa, the birds are not met with. Although ostriches are fairly numerous in certain parts of the country, it cannot be said that they are at all common. They are extremely shy birds, thus being most difficult to approach. Their eyesight is wonderfully keen. They will perceive you when you are still six hundred yards off, and it requires great patience and energy to successfully stalk them within practicable rifle range. Their commanding height gives them a great advantage when pursued by man, and the speed with which their long legs can cover the ground is astonishing. Ostriches will easily outstrip a galloping horse. Consequently, the only way to approach them is by wile, although 
I have been told that sometimes they can be worn down by persistent pursuit on horseback. Of desert vegetation, they seem to prefer a plant somewhat resembling a pumpkin, which creeps on the ground. On this, they are fed chiefly at the ostrich farm, but of course an ostrich will eat almost anything, and I fancy their diet is not a matter needing much care and forethought. It is a curious fact that ostrich feathers are nearly as expensive in the French Sudan as they are in England. On several occasions I bought some, but they were so high in price as really hardly to be worth buying. The truth is that ostrich hunting in the western Sudan is in such an undeveloped state that the natives who have feathers for sale ask fancy prices and usually get them. The ostrich farm near Niafunke is not well placed, and the situation is certain soon to be changed. My plans were now to try for lion along the banks of the Niger, near a place called Sebe, and afterwards to make for Sara'er, where there was also the possibility of lion, and finally to march to Lake Bambara Maunde, a fine hunting locality for elephant and several varieties of big game. Both of the inhabitants here are Fulanis, and their occupation is tending big herds of cattle. The country is thinly populated, and thus is well suited for game. A horse was essential for shooting, but I was unable to buy one, so he had to be content for the present with hiring daily from village to village, a troublesome and unsatisfactory proceeding. End of chapter 14《Chapter 15 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 13th of March I left Gaba. For the first few miles our way lay through a swampy country, consisting of creeks and backwaters of the Niger, or, to be more accurate, of the Isa Bear. Hundreds of waterfowl of all descriptions were preening their feathers in the morning sun, singing groups on the little islands in the middle of the streams, or floating lazily near the banks, watching us with suspicious looks as we approached. Numerous game tracks led down to the water's edge, the footprints showing clearly in the soft soil. Waterbuck and cob peered to frequent these haunts in the early morning, while warthog were very common. Allowing my carriers to go on, I was able to secure some good specimens without proceeding far into the bush on the higher ground to the west of our road. On arriving at the village of Zebo, I was told that further progress by road was impossible, as the floods had been high that year, and the track was still under water. The only course to adopt was to go by canoe. Hiring a canoe, or any business transaction, is always a lengthy proceeding where the West African native is concerned. The chief of the place had first to be summoned, and, of course, was not to be found for some time. The virtue of patience is, indeed, a golden one to possess in this land. The native's methods are invariably dilatory, since time has no value for him. But it is easy to preach patience, and a great deal harder to practice it when one is in a hurry to get things done. In this case, I was kept waiting a couple of hours before the chief arrived. The policeman provided by the commissioner at Neofunki had, unfortunately, not yet reached me, but was to do so during the course of that morning. When the chief had arrived, a considerable discussion took place between his insubordinate followers as to which one should supply the craft, until I cut matters short by securing the best canoe I could find, and telling the chief I would send him back to Neofunki with a message to the commissioner unless the paddlers were forthcoming within half an hour. Matters were at length settled, and my few belongings quickly stowed on board. Mamadou had secured a large earthenware pot, a very necessary article for culinary purposes in a wooden canoe, as the fire had to be lighted in this receptacle, and we were just shoving off when the policeman cantered up on his steed. As it was not possible to take this beast on the canoe, it had to be left at the village. The canoe was about twenty feet long, lit considerably, and had no awning, so I looked forward to a hot and uncomfortable journey. My expectations were fully realized. In spite of two men being constantly on duty to bail out, we made so much water that at one time I feared we would have to run ashore and patch her up before the voyage could be continued. The sun, too, was very trying that day, 
It poured its rays mercilessly upon our heads, until at last I was driven to take refuge, in a rather ignominious fashion, by lying at full length on my back, and placing my camp table across two seats, I was able to get a little welcome shade underneath it. The chief discomfort of my position was due to the water at the bottom of the boat, so that I was immersed in a perpetual bath. We were now in the Isa Bear. The banks were sandy, and scrub was scanty and stunted. The river is nearly a mile wide in many places, and frequently too deep for poling to be effective. These canoes are manipulated in two ways, either by paddles or poles. The canoemen are expert at both these methods, but, owing to the strong wind which is so prevalent, it is often hard work to make much progress with paddles. The poles are merely long bamboos or palm stalks, and with these the craft can be propelled in the shallower water near the banks. When poling, we constantly found further progress barred by thick masses of borgu grass. This grass has its roots often twelve or fifteen feet deep in the water. It grows so densely that it makes a thick matting from the surface of the water downwards, through which it is extremely difficult to penetrate. The appearance is somewhat similar to sud, found on other rivers in the tropics, and in many of the streams where navigation is not frequent, the whole channel is blocked so that the only successful means of dealing with it would appear to be to have a small steamer fitted with a cutting apparatus to hew a channel for itself as it moves through the water. My servant could not speak Fulani or Sanre, the two languages now required, so I found the policeman doubly useful. Indeed, without him, it would have been hard to get anything done. In several places we saw fish tanks made on the edge of the river banks, where the Borgu was clear or had been cut away by the natives. Fish were first caught in traps or nets and then stored in the tank alive. The riverside people are great consumers of dried fish, live ones being taken out of the tanks as requirements dictated to be dried for local consumption or for trade at neighboring inland markets. At the time these fish were being dried on the river banks, the stench proceeding from them was most unpleasant making it necessary to give the shore a wide berth. My recollections of Sebe are that it was one of the hottest and dirtiest villages of the western Sudan. I camped on the eastern side of the town, but had occasion to enter it several times during my stay in the place. The chief provided me with two hunters who could give me no immediate information of Lyon. There was no doubt, however, that I was as likely to see them here as anywhere for the record of cows and sheep killed in this locality by the king of beasts was far higher than anywhere else in the bend. A week before my arrival there had been a kill, and it was quite likely that Lyon would soon revisit this happy hunting ground. The local herdsmen were told to send me immediate news of any signs of the presence of Lyon which might be observed near their flocks. One hunter was sent to seek for fresh tracks near the river, south of the town, while I and the other hunter went off next morning to a likely haunt to the north. Three days brought no information of lion in the vicinity, but that they had recently been there was certain, for I came across tracks varying from a week to a fortnight in age of three different animals within ten miles of the town. I have not the slightest doubt that had I not been so pressed for time and been able to prolong my stay for a week or two, I would have been certain to get at least one. Knowing, however, I should probably get a chance soon, for all the country in the bend is purely plentiful in line, I made preparations for my departure to Seraferi. My stay at Sebe had not been unproductive, as I had shot a nice cob and a red-fronted gazelle, which in size was within an eighth of an inch of the record, besides several smaller heads of different varieties. At Sebe there was quite the best duck, geese, and teal shooting I found anywhere on the Niger, at the back of the town there were several large ponds and marshy rivulets in which swarms of birds were always to be seen, while at night, about sunset, the waterfall could be shot flooding between the Niger and these places. Each evening I went out with my shotgun and had some capital sport on every occasion. Just when the light was getting dim, the noise of the whir of many wings could be heard in the air, when, on looking up, a cloud of dusky objects might be seen approaching phantom-like in the sky. The first shot would cause them to swerve, passing away out of sight. 
but behind were line upon line of serried ranks, all directing their flight towards the same objective, unaware of the danger below them, until they heard the report of a gun, and perhaps saw one of their number fall to the ground. Quite apart from lion or other big game, the bay was decidedly worth a visit for the sport of its waterfall shooting. From the bay, I was told that my shortest way was by canoe, but I did not place much confidence in my information, for the water in the small creeks by which I must travel was subsiding so rapidly that it seemed highly probable I should find myself stranded before I had gone very far on my journey. Besides, I was anxious to see more of the country, and this could best be done on horseback. I had brought no such luxury as an English saddle and bridle on my expedition, so I had to get accustomed to the native horse equipment. To anyone who wishes to try it, I say most advisedly, don't. Of course, one can get used to anything, but the tortures suffered in accustoming oneself to a native saddle in the western Sudan are such that the game is decidedly not worth the candle. By perseverance, and with the loss of a good deal of temper, I did get used to the thing eventually, only many was the time I groaned at the thought of another day in that saddle, and prayed even for the roughest of English-made saddles. The native saddle is made entirely of wood. Even if the wood were well planed and with a level surface, it would be endurable. But the wood is roughly hewn, and appears to be fashioned in the series of little hills and dales, which are most fiendish contrivances for personally possessed of normal skin. To add to the discomfort, the saddle is seldom made out of one piece of wood, but the seat consists of two or three planks which frequently do not fit over well against each other. A blanket thrown across it can do something to alleviate one's miseries, but at the best it is a poor remedy and a very hot one. Mamadou was very anxious to ride, so I let him hire a horse too. His horsemanship was very inferior, however, and after several differences of opinion between himself and his mount, ending invariably in his discomfiture, he came to the conclusion that he preferred walking. Mamadou certainly did cut a strange figure on a horse, his appearance causing much merriment to the whole party. At this time he had, from somewhere or other, unearthed a long black coat, which had seen better days and was now very threadbare. This garment covered his white coat, coming halfway down his white baggy trousers as well. His head was adorned by a native sun hat, a conical affair, gaily decorated with colored leather ribbons. On horseback, his appearance was even more ludicrous than it was on foot, and when he used to prepare to mount, he was greeted with loud yells of derision from the carriers, who considered him fair game for a jest. Poor Mamadou, his troubles were great in those days, and I am afraid I did not feel as much sympathy for him as I perhaps should have done. I used to ride on with the policeman in the morning, ahead of the carriers, the policeman carrying my shotgun, while I had my rifle slung over my shoulder. In this way, one could get a good deal of sport on the road. On observing any game, I would dismount, leaving my horse with the policeman, and was then free to stalk at my leisure. The country was very open, with no other trees than stunted dumb palms and sandy soil. For miles upon miles it was a flat plain, watered with numerous shallow, slowly flowing streams, which fertilized the country between the rivers Isa Bear and Bear Isa, and connected those two main waterways. The track was ill-defined, so that I found it necessary to take a guide from village to village. Cattle tracks crossed and recrossed our path in every direction, in many cases completely obliterating all signs of the way we were endeavoring to follow. Moreover, wide detours had constantly to be made to avoid inundations, of which only the nearest villages were aware. These inundations were very deceptive. Some were fordable, but others had a treacherous quagmire under the surface of the water, from which it would be no easy matter to extricate oneself. On approaching these inundated areas, we would disturb big flocks of teal, which had been hidden in the rushes, and now circled high over our heads, waiting for our departure to settle down once more in their accustomed haunts. The villages were all Fluani. These people, although in many ways superior to the other inhabitants of the western Sudan, live in far inferior houses. When approaching a place, a glance will be sufficient to tell if it is inhabited by Fluanis. Their huts are the most primitive and flimsy affairs. They are built of plaited straw, which is the stalk of the rice or millet plant. 
there is only one layer of the straw, so that sun or rain can penetrate with ease. These huts are very low, there being only just room for a man to stand upright in the center. At one end is a couch, made of a few layers of sticks, and raised two feet off the ground. The couch is generally covered with grass mats and tan sheepskins. The entrance is by an opening barely three feet high, while, if the ground is rough, it is usually covered with more grass mats. Fulani villages are very dirty. The people live with their cattle around them. In the daytime, the young calves are to be seen tied up to a stake at the front door to prevent their following their mothers, which are sent out to graze with the rest of the herd. At sunset, the whole troop return when the village resounds with their lowing and bellowing. When green fodder is dried up, the cattle are fed on the same straw of which the huts are made. In all this country, supplies are wonderfully plentiful and cheap. Fowls can be bought for fifteen cents. Eggs cost ten cents for four. Milk is about a half penny a quart, and a bullock can be bought for twenty francs. For this reason, living is as inexpensive as anywhere in the world, I should think, so long as the traveler lives on local produce. Freight from the coast is so high, however, that European stores are most expensive. Between Neofunki and Timbuktu, the French reckon that a loaf of bread, baked with French flour, cost them one franc fifty cents. The French, being great eaters of bread, grumble greatly at the cost of flour in those parts. Five miles from Seraferi, we had to cross a wide swamp by canoe. On the other side of this water was a fair road, coming from the west. This was the road from Neofunki to Seraferi, and this we now followed till the town was reached. Seraferi lies on the opposite shore of the river Bara Isa, which here is a couple of hundred yards wide. The river twists and winds around the town in a curious manner, describing a curve resembling the letter W. As the crow flies, the distance between the outer bends of the W cannot be more than a couple of hundred yards, but by the river it must be fully five miles. The town itself consists of a strange collection of mud-built houses a rather moorish appearance. The streets are quaint, narrow alleys, winding in an aimless fashion through the place. All the houses have flat roofs, upon which the better-class citizens take the evening air. Sarah Ferry is called the sister of Timbuktu, owing to the similarity existing between the two towns. The inhabitants are mostly Songhais, but the place is divided into quarters for Arabs, Fulanis, Bambaras, Bozos, and Tuaregs, all of which races are fairly well represented. Besides all these permanent residents, there is a floating population of traders from all parts of western Sudan. Mosis from the south bring native claws and kola nuts, chiefly the product of the big market of Ouagadougou. Moors and Tuaregs bring salt and gum from the desert regions in the north, Sunrise from Janae takes spice and native peppers to Safari Market, while houses from Kano to the east bring beads, sham pearls, and Kano leatherwares. This mixture of different races talking different languages makes Safari Marketplace an interesting scene to the European visitor. The resident's house and those of the two French merchants face the river, occupying a large space in front of the town. Here one gets a foretaste of the desert winds. Clouds of sand envelop the town during the months of March, April, and May, making existence anything but pleasant while the wind is blowing. The sand permeates every nook and cranny of a house. The only thing to do is to shut all doors and windows, enduring the heat in preference to being buried in sand. The soil on the immediate banks of the river is capable of producing good rice and millet, but away from the water it is poor and desert-like. Long stretches of sand with only here and there a few dried-up shrubs or tufts of coarse grass, characterize this rather forbidding-looking land. The Sahara has, indeed, invaded the right bank of the Niger, not content with the havoc it has wrought along the left bank of the river. Much of the country in the bend bids fair to develop into desert in the course of time unless these terrible winds can be checked. Nature opposes no obstacle to them, as the land is so flat, almost uninterruptedly, from the southern floats of the Atlas Mountains across the whole of this portion of northern Africa. But I am rather digressing, for that part of my story belongs really 
to the description of the country near Timbuktu and the other side of the Niger. There are two kinds of canoes on the Niger, the Jene and the Niger canoe. While I was at Sierra Ferry, I had ample opportunity for watching the building of the latter kind of craft. The whole material for the canoe is produced from the dumb palm. It is interesting to observe the uses the different portions of that tree can be put to in the manufacture of a canoe. As the dumb palm is practically the only tree found in the country, it is fortunate for the natives that it has so many varied uses. A canoe made of this palm cannot be constructed out of one piece, as a dugout is hewn from a single tree trunk. This is not possible, because the trunk of the dumb palm is of small diameter, and several trees must be utilized to make a single canoe. Most canoes are made of six separate portions of the wood sewn together, but of course the number of pieces required varies with the size of the craft to be built. The first operation is roughly to hew the different parts of the frame into the required shape. The tools used are an instrument resembling a chisel and an iron-headed hammer. These tools are of native make, forged roughly by a native blacksmith, so hardly the most suitable for the work they are required to perform. However, ever, the result is not by any means bad, doing great credit to the skill of the workman. When the portions of the body have been shaped, they are placed together, being kept in position by logs of wood propped against them. The next operation is to sew these portions together. Holes are punched with a sharp pointed instrument through the pieces near their edges, the local rope being used to bind the parts together by threading it through these holes. The local rope is made out of strips of the stalk of the palm leaf. These strips are plaited together until they form a kind of withy, which is exceedingly strong and durable. The holes in the frame are stopped up by taking as many turns of rope as possible through them, but of necessity there is plenty of space left between the stitches for water to leak through. The next item is to stop these holes more effectively, for it would be impossible to remain long in the water in a canoe which leaks so badly as the unfinished article now would do. For this purpose, the leaves themselves of the palm tree are utilized. These leaves are very fibrous in texture. This fiber is pounded up until it becomes a stringy, yellowish mass, quite soft and easily manipulated. Small bits of this stuff are poked into all existing crevices until no gaps are discernible. It only now remains to smooth off the rough surfaces of the canoe and to put in seats, etc. Even the best canoes leak a great deal, but a constant supply of the fiber referred to is kept on board for the purpose of stopping the more serious leaks, and a man is frequently engaged in bailing out. These canoes rarely last more than one year, but building is so simple and all materials so near to hand that there is no great difficulty in building new ones. The Jene canoe is more elegantly shaped and much better finished. There is no mistaking a Jene canoe when seen on the river. In the actual construction, the only difference is that the Jene people use wooden pegs to connect the separate parts of the body together instead of sewing them. Canoes 60 feet long are frequently seen on the Niger. They usually belong to a native trader or to a rich chief. They invariably are covered over with native mats, forming an awning as a shelter from the weather. The native canoe is a very shallow draft. I doubt if it draws more than three inches. All the river people are expert paddlers and polers. They will, if necessary, travel day and night without more than three hours halt in the 24, and will keep this up for five or six days continuously. Canoes trade for long distances on the Niger. They frequently ply between Timbuktu and Kulikuru, a distance of nearly 600 miles. The Seraferi canoes usually trade only with Timbuktu to the north or Jene to the south. While I was at Seraferi, several canoes came from Jene bringing traders with the produce of their country. The water in the river towards Timbuktu happened to be rather low at the time I was at Seraferi, so only small canoes were trading between the two towns. The women of the place fashion clay pots out of the mud found on the banks of the Bera Isa. These pots are very simple in design, but are useful as water coolers. The finest men found in this country are certainly the hunters. They are brawny fellows of fine stature and hard muscles. Their eyes are keen through long practice in following game, while their powers of tracking are undeniable. 
In the course of my hunting expeditions, I came in contact with a good many of them, and one could not but admire their strength and endurance. The hunters are nearly all bambaras, living in small groups in the different villages. They exist entirely by what they can shoot, although I must own that I was hardly impressed with their prowess with the gun. On one occasion, I recollect seeing my head hunter stalk a gazelle. I and the other hunters were spectators from the fringe of some bushes about two hundred yards away. The gazelle was quietly browsing in an open piece of ground with little available cover between it and a stalker. Nothing could exceed the skill with which she crossed the intervening ground unperceived until he had taken up a position not ten yards from the animal, concealed by a friendly small shrub. It was really a fine piece of stalking. It seemed almost incredible that he could have approached so close unknown to his intended victim. Breathlessly, I watched the scene through my glasses, fully expecting that the unfortunate little animal would be blown to smithereens at such short range. There was a deafening report, but when the smoke cleared, I was astonished to see the gazelle bounding away at the top of its speed quite scathless. The hunter did not appear to be much mortified by his failure, so I could only suppose it was not an unusual occurrence for game to be missed at such close range. These hunters are all armed with old flintlock guns, rather formidable-looking weapons, but often more dangerous to the owner than to the object fired at. They are five feet in length, with barrels made out of old gas pipes or anything that comes handy. Misfires are frequent owing to indifferent powder, and the weapon has to be fired from the hip as the recoil is so violent. The guns are first loaded with a big charge of black powder, extending some itches up the barrel. A piece of old cloth is then rammed down to keep the powder in position. The shot comes next, consisting of a varied assortment of stones, bits of lead, scraps of iron, etc., the whole charge being rammed home with a piece of rag and extending three-quarters of the way up the barrel. The tendency is for the missiles to fly high and scatter, but, if fairly aimed, the damage done is considerable, as instead of inflicting a single wound, possibly some dozen pellets strike the victim. It was while I was near Sarah Ferry that I got my lion. One afternoon I heard news of a lion having been seen that morning, about fifteen miles from my camp. He had attacked a herd of Fulani cattle, making off with one of the cows. I lost no time in setting out for the village nearest to the scene of the kill. I rode off with a guide to show the way, leaving my kit to follow me the same evening. That night I camped at the village to which the cow belonged. There seemed every prospect of my finding the lion the following morning, for he would probably dispatch his meal in his lair hard by and rest there to sleep off the effects for some hours. Accompanied by my two hunters and a native who knew the spot, I set out before daylight. We had to cross a stream which lay between the village and the place where the cow had been killed. On the other side was a sandy scrub country, dotted about with the ever-present dumb palms. These palms here grew in clumps, some of which were a hundred yards in diameter, but the palms themselves were more in the nature of bushes, and not more than twelve feet high. It was beginning to get light, but the undergrowth in these clumps was so thick that one could seldom see more than a few yards inside. These clumps were the lair of the lion, although it was not certain in which one he would then be found. After tracking him from his kill for some distance, we discovered the place where he had dragged the remains of his victim. However, it was soon evident that he had since emerged from there, and we now followed his pug marks of that morning, clearly defined in the sandy soil. At last, he was traced to a certain clump, thicker than the rest, in which he certainly was lying. It being impossible to see inside, the only plan was to try to frighten the brute out. Accordingly, I sent the beater and hunters to different points, where, at a given signal, they were to commence to shout and beat the bush with the object of driving him towards me. The ruse succeeded in causing him to bound out of his hiding place, but unfortunately on the opposite side to me, so that I never saw him. I dashed round on the far side and just caught a glimpse of him disappearing towards another clump of palms. We now ensued a curious race between us and the lion. I knew that, should I lose sight of him for long, he'd probably give me the slip, for these beasts travel great distances when alarmed. We accordingly pursued him at our best speed until he was viewed disappearing into another clump. 
Again, he got away before I had a chance of a shot. This race continued for another mile or so, when I was decidedly winded and the perspiration streaming off me. At last, I came up with the beast, in a palm grove, and, cautiously following his tracks into the bush for a few paces, I suddenly saw him, in a more open spot than usual, about forty yards away. He stood facing me, his splendid eyes glaring wickedly, while he lashed his tails and uttered some low roars. Here was a fine opportunity. So, raising my four fifty rifle, I fired. He dropped with a bullet through his head. Keen as I was, I do not think I could have maintained the race much longer, for I was quite winded and had some difficulty in keeping my rifle steady as I fired, but the range was so close and I could see him so distinctly that the shot was an easy one. The lion of this country is not a handsome creature. The color is a pale tawny, and the animal is maneless. Moreover, it is my firm conviction that he is an errant coward. My own experience, and what the Fulani herdsmen have told me, both tend to support this idea. I have been told more than once of cases in which a lion had jumped on one of the herd with the intention of killing and carrying off its prey, but had been driven off by a single-handed fula armed merely with a stick. It seems rather ridiculous that a lion can be frightened off his victim by thwacking him with a stick, but there is no doubt that it has been often done by these people. The Fulanis hold the lion in contempt rather than in awe, and, I fancy, he only succeeds as a rule in securing his prey because the herds are too large for one man to supervise. These Fulanis, whom one meets so often in the western Sudan, are an interesting race of people. They are certainly not of Negro origin, for they have straight hair, aquiline features, thin lips, and pale reddish-brown skins. There is a mystery about the land of their forefathers, but it cannot have been in western Africa. Some people say they came originally from Egypt. To support this theory, it is stated that the word fula is a corruption of the word fela of Egypt. Their appearance is somewhat Egyptian also. On the other hand, it is not easy to trace a close connection between their language and customs and those of Egypt. Many maintain that they came from the other side of the Red Sea. Their own version of their history is exceedingly vague. Anyhow, it seems clear that they came from the east, as they had left traces of their progress from the east to the west of Africa. They are far superior in intellect to the Negro, having shown their superiority by conquering all with whom they have come in contact. They are essentially a pastoral people, whose chief object in life appears to be to excel in the size of their herds. Their dwelling places are generally temporary ones, where they stay as long as the pasturage is sufficient for their cattle. As soon as the grass gets poor, they shift their dwellings to more favorable spots. The fula counts his wealth by his bulls and cows. All the money he makes is laid out in increasing his stock. He has a wonderful knowledge of cattle and the marvelous power of calling to strayed animals. By uttering some weird low cry, they can recall their beasts even from considerable distances. Fulanis have made their way almost to the coast, they are found in many places in small colonies, generally forming the cattle-owning population of a place. The province of Huta Jalan in French Guinea is inhabited by them. Otherwise, they have no big strongholds until the middle Niger is reached. But from there to northern Nigeria, they are found in certain places in considerable numbers. Except for tending cattle, they do no work themselves, being decidedly indolent. The housework and any farm work are entirely done by slaves or servants. Slaves are well treated by them, and many slaves stay with their masters and serfdom in preference to taking their liberty, which they can do at any time they wish, by making a statement to this effect before a French commissioner. The Fulanis are all fervent Mohammedans. Wherever there are Fulanis, there will be found a mosque. These people have shown themselves able administrators in the places which they governed before the advent of the white man. Their laws were just, while their method of appointing civil administrators to the various districts into which a country was subdivided was sound. It would be interesting to know more about the past of these people, and it is much to be hoped the further light may one day be thrown on their origin. End of chapter 15
by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 21st of March, I left Sarah Ferry. I had managed to buy a horse here, being glad to have my own mount at last. He was a little animal, a dark bay, about fourteen hands, not exactly the most suitable beast for the work for which I required him, but horses were not easy to buy. In any case, the price could not be called exorbitant. I paid the sum of seventy-five francs, or three pounds for him, the saddle and bridle included. I still had to be content with a native saddle and bridle, for European horse gear was not to be had in the western Sudan. His previous owner was a native clerk in the residence office, who informed me that he was selling as he proposed closing his stables. Fortunately, I was a lightweight, and, as he appeared to be a wiry little beggar, in spite of his somewhat weedy looks, I came to the conclusion that he would be good enough for what was expected of him. He was, of course, innocent of any knowledge of trotting. His only two paces were an amble and a walk. He could amble fast, or he could amble slow, but had not much idea of galloping. The country was very similar to that between Sebe and Serafere. In the season of inundations, it would not have been practicable to travel by road, as the existing track would have been several feet deep in water. The only mode of transport then possible is by canoe. Rice and millet are the products of this country, the land near the streams and backwaters of the Bear Isa being eminently suited to the cultivation of these cereals. On the banks of these streams are the villages, but as soon as one strikes into the interior, away from the water, the country becomes more than ever desert-like in character, and human habitations are confined to a few isolated Tuareg encampments. The people in the villages are Fulanis, as usual, possessed of big herds of cattle. The Tuaregs, on the other hand, own sheep and goats, which seem to thrive in a marvelous manner on the poor provender found in the sandy waste surrounding them. A coarse-looking grass, or mimosa scrub, form their fare. These Tuaregs are hardly the same class of that tribe as are found in the desert proper on the other side of the Niger. They are nomads, preferring the isolated life away from villages, it is true, but at the same time they do not so utterly shun all contact with mankind as do their brethren of the Sahara. I suppose being near to civilization and luxuries, they have begun to feel the want of these things, and have, to a certain extent, degenerated. Anyway, they would appear to be now less hardy than before. Their dwelling places consist either of small tents made of sheepskins, or else of little huts made of branches of mimosa scrub and palm leaves. Hut is rather a dignified name to apply to these habitations. They are, perhaps, a dozen feet square, and so low that a man must always remain in a crouched position if he tries to stand up inside. It is strange how they succeed in getting their wives and families into this tiny space. Certainly, their personal belongings are few, for they are very poor, and their wealth, such as it is, is all in their flocks of goats or sheep. One day we met a large salt caravan coming down from Timbuktu, and en route to a place called Doensa, some days march south of Sierra Ferry. The salt is carried in big rectangular bars, and, in this case, was laden on donkeys and bullocks. The loads are usually fastened into a kind of stout rope netting, like a bag. These nets are then fastened, one on each side of the beast of burden, over a roughly shaped pack saddle. These traders were all houses, traveling with their wives and children. They cover about fifteen miles a day in this matter, and are so abstemious in their habits that they generally make a large profit on their transactions. They drink only water as a rule, while their diet is of the most frugal kind, helped out with few cola nuts, of which they are exceedingly fond. The nut has rather a bitter taste, but one soon gets accustomed to it. The houses can exist without food for a considerable time, provided they have some cola nuts to chew. There is no doubt that its sustaining properties are great. While, when water has been scarce, I found it a first-rate plan to keep a piece of the fruit in one's mouth and close the teeth on it. The head of this caravan was a native merchant of some importance. Early next morning, we saw him on the road preparing to start. 
He wore flowing white robes and made a picturesque figure mounted on his gaily caparisoned steed. I was informed he was a regular trader by that route, and that he always personally superintended the assembly of his caravan before the morning departure. He certainly seemed to have a rather motley collection of both sexes who were under him in perfect control. At his orders, they sought out, without much delay, their respective beasts from the grass where they were browsing, and loaded their charges in a most businesslike manner. This place, called Boromaka Yoro, was one of the few spots where I saw any full snipe. About two miles walk from the village, there were some shallow ponds with marshy banks, which were the homes of these snipe, besides quantities of the great heel, which I previously described. Most of the different kinds of duck, which I had come across before, were also well represented, but in comparison to the great teal, their numbers were insignificant. The water was covered with a gray sheet of these little birds, but they were very wild, and rose in the air in dense clouds on observing our approach. The next day we had a long march through a very sandy region to the western extremity of Lake Nyange. We had now left the water system of the river Bara Isa behind us, and the country was destitute of water until the lake was reached. I was riding ahead of the carriers with the policemen, as my custom was, when, as we came round a bend in the track, we espied a big herd of Senegal hartebeest. The animals had evidently been down towards the lake, and, on perceiving us, galloped off through the scrub to a right front. There were at least forty in the herd, and, in the hopes that they had not gone too far for pursuit, I started off on their tracks. The trail was easy enough to follow, so, leaving the police orderly with our horses, I went off alone. The ground sloped gently in front of me, so I cautiously approached the top, expecting to see the antelope grazing on the far side. Working with the wind in my face, I wended my way gradually to the ridge, and taking cover behind a mimosa tree, I peered warily over the edge. Sure enough, about eight hundred yards ahead were the herd, some grazing, while others had their heads turned in the direction from which they had come, evidently not forgetful of the alarm our appearance had caused among them. I now tried to stalk them by a flank movement, making for a hillock within two hundred yards of the game. Here I hoped to be able to select the best head, and should be within fairly good range. My maneuvering was completely successful, until I neared the top of the hillock, and then, by an incautious movement, I foolishly exposed myself to view for a fraction of a second. To my disgust, I had been observed, and away scampered the whole herd, at a pace which I knew meant that pursuit was out of the question. I took a couple of flying shots at the one I had marked down as being the biggest bull, but they were both clean misses, and I was unable to retrieve the blunder I had made by exposing myself to view. I only saw one herd of these harder beasts as big as this one again. I fancy forty animals in herd is nothing out of the ordinary, but here in the western Sudan, from my experience, they are generally in much smaller herds. After the incident of the heart of beast, we continued our march towards the lake. The carriers had, by this time, come up with me, and were eager to get to the water, as the day was hot and they had nothing to drink by the way. Accordingly, we pushed on at a good pace, until suddenly a silvery gleam came into view on the horizon, being evidently the first glimpse of Nyange. As we approached, the water became more visible. Here we were near the western extremity of the lake, which extended eastward as far as the eye could reach, while the breadth must have been about three miles. The shores were sandy, and the banks covered with dried-up grass and small bushes. Occasionally a canoe could be seen speeding along under sail, propelled by a stiff breeze from the northeast. The water was a fine open expanse. There were a few clumps of reeds at times near the shores, but these were not dense enough to interfere with navigation. The wind referred to blows almost constantly from the same quarter. It is strongest from about sunrise till eleven a.m., while in the evening it dies down altogether as a rule. It thus causes a regular tide, with a difference between high and low water of about two feet. The lake is shallow, the bed shelving very gently, there is a considerable difference between the width of the sandy beach available as a road in the morning and afternoon. 
the quantity of water in the lake varies greatly with the season of the year. Indeed, at the end of the dry weather, about May, it is possible to walk across the lake in several places without so much as wetting the feet. Lake Nyange is one of the largest, if not the largest, of a system of lakes and backwaters of the Niger and its affluence in the southwest corner of the bend of that river. Lake Nyange is the most easterly of this system. The whole of this large area is known as the Lake District, and all around these waters game of all descriptions abounds. During the season when water is abundant everywhere, the game has no difficulty about drinking. It is therefore scattered all over this area, and not so easy to locate. In the dry months, from January to May, however, the case is very different. Water gets scarcer every month, and the drinking places become more and more restricted, so that the game has to concentrate around the immediate shores of the lake to get water. Consequently, this is the best time of the year for shooting, although one disadvantage is that the heat gets very intense, and, under these conditions, tracking game becomes a very exhausting pastime. The sandy soil surrounding the lakes for many miles scorches the feet, while the sun beats mercilessly down upon the sportsman's head. Of course, many kinds of animals retire when the sun gets up in the heavens, about nine o'clock, but this is often the best time to find such game as Senegal hartebeest and gazelle, which can be discovered resting from the heat of the day in the shade of a mimosa tree. These animals are sometimes very shy and unapproachable in the early morning or evening, and frequently one's only chance of a shot at a beast you have been tracking for some time is during the middle of the day, when he is not so much on the alert. The village we entered near the western end of the lake was called Kaniume. I was particularly anxious to stop a few hours here in order to interview the chief. He was the most influential man in this region, all the villages on the southern shore of Nyanke being subservient to him. This man was a fola, and, as he had had constant dealings with the commission of the district on account of his influential position in the country, I had been recommended to make arrangements for local hunters, supplies, and so forth through him. I had been given the names of the best hunters in the district, was told that this chief would be able to furnish me with them. The chief was most obliging, providing me with everything I required without delay. But the hunters were not forthcoming. They were, he said, at Duenza, several days' march away, and the headquarters of the French resident. Fortunately, I had taken the precaution, before leaving Seraphere, to write to the resident of Duenza, informing him of my intended hunting trip in this country, and at the same time, mentioning that I wish for the services of these particular hunters. I therefore hoped that they would soon reach me. This chief informed me, and I subsequently discovered that the statement was perfectly correct, that there were practically no native hunters in the region. It appeared that the Fulanis, who formed almost the entire population of this part of the lake district, never themselves hunted. Hence, the difficulty of securing a man who knew the haunts of the game in the neighborhood was great. It seems strange that these people, living in the midst of a country inhabited by wild animals, should not care to hunt them, but so it is. The chief, however, relieved my worst apprehensions to a certain extent, by assuring me that at Bambera Mande there was one hunter. I therefore bade him send at once to the man to tell him to be ready to meet me there the next day. At the end of the palaver, I rejoiced the chief's heart with the present of a head of tobacco from my now dwindling store of the leaf. The chief and a cavalcade of his retinue accompanied me as far as the next village, some six miles further along the lake, where I was going to spend the night. Having made all arrangements for our comfort there, he took his departure. After leaving Kani Ome, the lake widens considerably. The opposite shore cannot be seen until within about three miles of the eastern extremity. The total length of Nyange is about thirty-five miles. Near Bambera, one day, the eastern end is divided into two forks by a high ridge of hills. The width of the neck of the land at the foot of these hills, and separating the two forks of water, being about five miles. The southern shore is much more wooded than the northern shore, but even on the south there are frequently stretches of sandy country without any vegetation other than a coarse grass. The northern shore 
is also covered in many places with dense reeds, making navigation more difficult. On both sides of the lake, the ground rises rather rapidly, until a plateau, two or three hundred feet above the level of the water, is reached. Most of the game is on this plateau on the southern side of Niange, merely coming down daily to drink. For a few days I made Bambera Monde my headquarters, leaving camp early every morning and returning at midday, then going out again in the afternoon. I found the hunter, who had been ordered to be ready at the village, awaiting my arrival. So far there was no news from Duenza of the two hunters I had sent for, so I sent another urgent runner to the resident for them. The day after my arrival I shot a fine Senegal hartebeest within two hours of camp, and this was the occasion when I lost my horse temporarily. I had ridden out with the hunter, as was my custom, when we got on to the tracks of a fine solitary bull hartebeest. I dismounted to follow it on foot leaving the horse with the hunter and my second rifle bear. I soon perceived him about six hundred yards away, browsing at the top of a little rise. The ground was very open and sloped up gradually towards him, so I had to be very cautious in stalking. Fortune favored me this time, and I was able to get within comfortable shot unperceived. The first bullet dropped him, mortally wounded through the lungs. My hunter came up with the horses. These he tied up while we were skinning the animal, having secured the end of my horse's bridle to the branch of a mimosa tree. We were busily engaged with our hunting knives when I suddenly looked up and saw my steed, having slipped his head collar, trotting quietly down the hill. He gradually increased his pace to a gallop before we had time to stop him, until he was lost to view. I sent the rifle bearer after in pursuit, thinking he would catch him grazing quietly at the nearest spot where he could find some good grass. To cut a long story short, the native lost the horse's tracks on some hard, rocky ground, returning about two hours later with the news. There was nothing for it but to walk back to camp and send our powdies out to search for him out, if he had not returned, as I hoped, to the village. He was not at the camp, whither I returned ignominiously on foot, so I told the chief to send out search parties. All available horses were collected to mount the tracking party, and when the men were assembled, they were really a rather picturesque group. The fulla on horseback looks quite his best, for these men have a good seat and are good horsemen, but, like most natives, they are bad horse masters. There was a collection of some twenty men, armed with a national weapon, a spear, looking more as if they were going out to fight than to look for a lost horse. It was not till long after nightfall I had heard a great stir outside, and, by the light of a bright moon, I could perceive mounted figures rapidly approaching across the plain. On they came at full gallop, brandishing their spears and uttering wild cries until they arrived opposite my camp, when they drew rein so suddenly as to throw their steeds onto their haunches. By triumphant cries I guessed the horse had been found, as, indeed, he had. I think he must have lost himself as, when they discovered him, he was lying down, tired out, and apparently only too glad to be caught and led back to camp. After a few days' good sport, but still without news of the Duenza hunters, I determined to wait no longer, but to start for the elephant country with my local hunter at once. My so-called hunter was really not of much use, except as a guide to show me the road home at the end of the day, for his knowledge of the whereabouts of game was decidedly limited. He was also hardly an experienced tracker, but still, in this respect, he might have been worse. In these circumstances, I had to go and ascertain the place where the elephant were now to be found for myself, before I could decide where to pitch my camp. On one of my shooting trips, I had come across some old spoor leading down to the lake. I now went to this place with a view to making it the base of my tracking operations, intending to work backwards from there in order to try to find the feeding grounds of this herd. All this country is so thinly populated that for miles there are no habitations, and therefore I could not expect to get any information from natives. That day I camped temporarily close to the place where these old tracks existed, near the brink of Nyange. It was here that fortune smiled upon me for a change. That evening, just as I was retiring for the night, 
I heard a low, thundering noise, and noticed the peculiar strong odor which is found with elephants. I at once came to the conclusion that they must be coming down to bathe at the lake, and, moreover, could not be far off. Hastily seizing my rifle and throwing on some khaki clothes over my light-colored pajamas, I went out of my tent at the same instant that the local hunter came to tell me the elephant were indeed approaching the lake. It was a beautiful moonlight night, and the animals sounded so near that I was afraid that they would see the camp and take alarm. So I gave instructions for everyone to keep perfectly quiet and for the fires to be put out. It did, indeed, seem a strange thing that they should almost run into my camp the night I arrived there. As I cautiously crept through the light bush, making a wide circuit to avoid giving them my wind, I shall never forget the splendid sight that broke on my view. In front of me was a herd of some forty elephants, drinking and bathing in the water of the lake. A bright moon shed her rays on the scene, making the water sparkle in a silvery sheen, while thousands of stars twinkled in the deep blue sky overhead. These splendid creatures appeared to be thoroughly enjoying themselves, and I waited under cover to feast my eyes on the sight for a few seconds. I could see them reveling in the luxury of their bath, douching themselves with water taken up with their trunks, splashing and disporting themselves in high frolic. At this moment, how I longed to be able to take a photograph of this remarkable scene, of which, though it is so vividly pictured on my memory, I have no other record. I carefully singled out the best tuskers and waited my opportunity for a shot. To advance any further would have been fatal, for I was now on the edge of the scrub, and between me and the elephant was a narrow strip of open sandy beach, while they were some thirty yards further in the water, possibly altogether eighty yards from me. Having drunk their fill, the great beast proceeded to retreat leisurely homewards. Now would be my opportunity for a shot. Maneuvering to keep the best tuskers in view, I had no difficulty in shooting down one as he stopped within twenty yards of me, while he reached at a branch with his great trunk. I hit him through the ear and the brain, and he fell on the spot. At the same instant, I saw the other tusker close at hand, and gave him two bullets in rapid succession. He was hard hit, but did not fall. The whole occurrence had not taken more than a few seconds, but before I had time to reload, the noise was deafening. The huge herd, evidently more frightened than enraged, except perhaps for the wounded elephant, by the report of my rifle and the fall of their comrade, stampeded. They charged violently forward in all directions, trampling underfoot all that came in their way, screaming and trumpeting as they went. Some half-dozen came careering towards me, there was neither time nor space to evade them, and I must own my life seemed not worth a minute's purchase just then. I thought I must inevitably be crushed to atoms under their massive feet. There seemed no chance of escape. In the hope of making myself as inconspicuous as possible, I flung myself flat on the ground, knowing all the time that though they might not notice me in their impetuous flight, those gigantic forms could hardly avoid running over my prostrate body. By great good fortune, something, I cannot for the life of me think what it was, made them swerve aside, passing within a few inches of me where I lay. I can hardly describe what a tiny, impotent creature one feels at such a moment. How powerless was I against one of these animals, should he by chance brush against me. I suppose that, that is about the narrowest escape I ever had, and an experience I am not anxious to repeat. In an incredibly short space of time, the whole herd had disappeared, the only sign of their recent visit being the clouds of dust, the trampled soil, and the dead elephant. While the scene had been going on, the hunter, my servant, and my following had bolted in all directions, alarmed, I suppose, lest the elephant should rush through the camp. When quiet had been restored, the natives began to return. The excitement had been rather trying, and there was nothing further to be done that night. I gave orders for an early start in the morning in pursuit of the wounded elephant, while the men left in camp were to cut up the dead animal. Accompanied by the hunter, I started before daylight, following the tracks which were fairly visible. The wounded animal had cut company with the rest of the herd, for, within a mile or two of camp, all the separated tracks of the scattered elephants reunited. As the day dawned, it became clear from the blood that he had been severely wounded. I thought that the first shot 
had hit him in the head, and the second a little below the heart as he turned broadside to me, but of this I could not be sure. We were able to follow the tracks at a gentle amble, so distinct were they. After proceeding thus for about seven miles, we arrived at the top of the rising ground and on to the plateau which I have previously mentioned. The scrub now got thicker, but there was no difficulty in riding anywhere. Proceeding another five miles or so, we suddenly came across the wounded elephant standing under a small tree, sheltering from the sun, for it was getting hot, and it was now nine o'clock. There had been nothing to indicate that his footsteps were lagging. However, he must have got tired and been unable to keep up with the rest of the herd any longer. The hunter was carrying my big rifle at this time, while I had the three o three slung at my saddle. Seizing the four fifty from him, I rapidly dismounted, while all this time the elephant appeared not to have noticed us, having his back turned in our direction. I skirted through the bush in order to get a shot at his brain, the big animal being, I suppose, not more than thirty yards away. As I faced it, it suddenly perceived me and lifted up its trunk as if to charge. I was then not twenty yards off. I fired under its uplifted trunk when it swerved aside, the blood streaming from its mouth. A second shot penetrated its brain, and it fell to the ground quite dead. The tusks of this elephant weighed fifty-two pounds each, while the other had ivory weighing just over forty-five pounds on either side. The ivory was not big, but I was given to understand that, for that country, the tusks were very fair, and that it was rare to get tusks weighing even sixty pounds, so, under the circumstances, I was fortunate. It is a curious fact that the elephant of this region do not carry big ivory, although possibly the explanation is a simple one. There are no big trees in the country, which is an extraordinarily open one for elephant, consisting of sandy soil, light scrub, and, in places, mimosa or other trees, never more than thirty or forty feet high. Such is the district in which these animals are here found. Besides, water is scarce. Away from the lake, there is no water of any description for nearly forty miles. Having found the line of retreat of the elephant, and knowing that it lay through a waterless tract of country, I decided to provision myself with water next day and attempt to come up with the herd again. Accordingly, the following morning, very early, equipped with three days' water supply, I set out in pursuit of the herd. It seemed evident that they must have a permanent feeding ground which could supply them with a better provender than was obtainable in the country I had seen, and the chances were that, if I could discover this feeding ground, I should also find the elephant. The tracks were plainly discernible nearly the whole way. Only once did we lose them for a short time on some stony ground. Proceeding for about six miles beyond the place where I had found the wounded elephant, I noticed the country becoming much more wooded. We were now about eighteen miles from Lake Nyange. Here the tracks of the elephant branched off in various directions, and it was without doubt their feeding ground. Picking up the biggest tracks we could see, we followed these for some distance through this wooded region. The ground here was quite rocky in many places, the sandy soil having disappeared. I had noticed that the ivory of my tusks was chipped, and it seemed that this must be the solution. Probably these elephants broke their tusks on the hard, rocky surface of their feeding place. This wooded country appeared to extend for a considerable distance in a southerly direction. Still following the tracks of this animal, which led to a place where he had evidently slept the previous night, we suddenly crossed some perfectly fresh tracks of another elephant. It was some hours later, when, following this elephant, which I had wounded, that I came across a strange tribe of people who dwell in caves. The elephant's tracks had led me to the foot of the Hambori Mountains, and it is here that these people live. They wear practically no clothing, and are very timid. Probably they had hardly seen a white man in those parts before. They are called the Habes. They live chiefly by hunting round the shores of a lake called Kororua, lying at the foot of the hills. I could not understand their language, and being short of provisions, I had to curtail my stay in their country. This place is about forty miles from Lake Nyange, and it seemed that the elephant used to drink at one or other of these lakes, according to circumstances, their feeding ground being nearly halfway between the two. The Habes use bows and arrows, but also have old-fashioned guns, 
which they manufactured their own powder out of saltpeter found locally. Their bullets are more often made of small, sharp stones than of lead, but any rough missile will serve them. Between the feeding ground, which I discovered was called Tinseda and Lake Korua, the country again becomes sandy and sparsely covered with vegetation. In all this sandy country, the violent wind from the northeast, which I had experienced at Niange, blows. This wind raises sandstorms, which are not only most disagreeable, but are also very bad for the mechanism of a rifle, should it be at all complicated. However careful one may be, it is exceedingly difficult to avoid getting sand into the breach, with the result that a jam may occur. This actually happened to me at a very awkward moment when hunting elephant. I had to abandon my 450 and fire with my 303. Fortunately for me, the animal did not charge home, or I should probably have had some difficulty in stopping him with the light bullet of the small rifle. This was not the only occasion when I had a bad jam on account of the sand, and later on, when crossing the Sahara, I found matters still worse, as the sandstorms were more frequent and more violent. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 3rd of April, I returned to Bambera Maande on my way north to Timbuktu. My first plan had been to march due north, but I could get no guide to show me the way. The Fulanis declared that the route was impracticable at this time of year, owing to the scarcity of water, and, in any case, they had no man to serve as guide who knew the route. I had grave suspicions of the truth of their statements, but unfortunately was not in a position to prove they were lying. In the end, I had to go the way they recommended as being the only way possible at the time of the year. This route entailed a two days march, followed by three days by canoe. Carriers were not to be had, as the Fulani is much too proud, or too lazy, to carry a load, so I had to hire bullocks for my baggage. Bullocks and camels when obtainable, do all the transport in these regions. Bullocks can, at a pinch, march two days without water, carrying a load of about 150 pounds. They are humped oxen, very slow and sure in their movements. The driver, there's one to each animal, sits on the front of the hump with the loads behind him, guiding his beast with a kind of rain passing through its nostrils. At first we passed along the shores of Lake Niange, meeting on the way some camel and bullock caravans coming into the village, for the place is on the route from the north to Duenza Market, and a fair amount of trade travels this way. A curious feature of this end of the lake is the number of pelicans seen on the water. They all congregate on the opposite side to Bambera Maande, appearing to breed there in some quantities. In the evening the birds collect together, uttering strange cries, reminding one rather of the waterfowl on the seashores in the wilder parts of the British coast. They are uncouth-looking creatures, with their enormous beaks, but seem to thrive wonderfully well on the fish of the lake. I suppose when the water here dries up, they migrate to the Niger and its tributaries. I shot a few geese at Niange, but duck and teal were very scarce. The surrounding country is well stocked with sand grouse and lesser bustard, but other varieties of game birds are not plentiful. I think I saw only one bush fowl, and the few guinea fowl I shot appeared to be very tough. Indeed, I always noticed that the guinea fowl shot in sandy districts was tough, irrespective of the age of the bird. I often wondered if possibly this was due to the semi-desert diet which they have to live on here. We had to cross the high ridge of ground which separated the two easterly forks of the lake previously mentioned and, when finally quitting the farthest fork of water, our journey took us through a patch of desert land. It was in this desert patch that I saw several ostriches. The huge birds were on the skyline about half a mile away when I first noticed them, and, strangely enough, did not appear to have perceived me, for they moved in quite a leisurely manner out of sight, instead of striving off, as they usually do when alarmed. I decided to try to stalk them, Provided they did not move too rapidly, the chances seemed to be in my favor, for the slope of the ground was such 
that I should be able to advance almost to the top of the ridge in front of me, unperceived. The wind helped me, as it was blowing directly in my face, so I was able successfully to carry out my plan, and, on arriving at the summit of the ridge, I got a fairly easy shot lying behind a small hillock at one of the birds. The feathers were not in bad condition, and later I found some of them invaluable for bartering with Arabs. Judging by the tracks, there appeared to be a number of these birds between the Niger and Lake Nyange, although most of the ostrich hunting is done on the other side of the Niger and some hundred miles lower down. By questioning my native followers, indeed, I found that these ostriches do not seem to be hunted at all. That day we did a long march, as I was anxious to get across the desert and camp by the water on the far side that night. The water was a swampy stream called Tango Mare, which was one of the tributaries of the river Bera Isa. I camped by its shores, where the sand flies and mosquitoes were worse than I had experienced for a very long time. My servant and the police orderly both got a severe attack of fever in consequence. I passed the most uncomfortable night. There was an encampment of wandering Tuaregs close by, who made things look brighter by a very acceptable present of camel's milk, accompanied by protestations of friendship. This gift, and the message accompanying it, seemed so unlike the usual custom of the Tuaregs, where Europeans were concerned, that I made inquiries on the subject. It transpired that the last visit they had had from white men was when the French troops had visited this particular tribe and punished them severely for some misdeed. They evidently had a wholesome respect for the European now, or they would hardly have taken the trouble to offer presents to a single individual. After leaving the stream where I had spent the night, we emerged on a country intersected by small lakes, swamps, and marshy streams. I had sent on my baggage and servant early, staying myself behind to enjoy some duck shooting close to the camp of the previous night. The guide who was with me professed to know the route our loads had followed, but I hardly wonder he was at fault on several occasions. Sometimes this network of waterways became practically one wide sheet of water, so intimately connected with the swamps and streams. On arriving at a place of this description, it became a matter of great difficulty to know where the water was fordable. The only plan was to try at a likely-looking spot and go on until the water became too deep when a new direction must be struck. It would have been dangerous to attempt to swim owing to the thickly packed reeds which grew in profusion everywhere. Many times, after proceeding about halfway, and congratulating myself that we had found a passage, a hole or dense reeds prevented further progress, and we had to beat a retreat, endeavoring to find another ford. By the time we finally got to the other side of these huge morasses, it was getting late, but fortunately the track was now dry and fairly well defined, so we were able to move at a good pace. I fully expected to hear, when joining the baggage, that half of it had been lost in the water, so it was cheering to be told that, beyond a little wetting, not much harm had been done. The guide with the baggage party appeared to have found a better crossing than we had done. I had now reached a place from which I could get a navigable way to Kabera, as the port of Timbuktu is called. The name of this village was Sari Amu, and it was on one of the main tributaries of the Bera Isa. After negotiating with the chief native trader of the place, I arranged for a canoe with an awning of palm thatch to be ready for me the following day. I had a crew of five men so that I should be able to travel fast. I estimated my distance from Kabera at seventy miles at the crow flies, so it was probably quite eighty by water, a distance I could not hope to cover in less than three days. Moreover, I could not arrange for the canoemen to accompany me more than one day, so that there was certain to be further vexatious delays in getting relief crews. In one respect I was lucky, however, that I should be able to keep the same canoe the whole way. Besides, this canoe was a fairly comfortable one as they went, and, should I have been obliged to change daily, I should have had to put up with a very inferior craft. I occupied the center of the canoe, while my servant and baggage were at one end and the crew at the other. There was just room to put up a camp table under my awning, where I could read or write, and at sunset we used to halt at the nearest village so as to get a night's nice rest ashore. The route was rather intricate, as the main stream was frequently blocked by impenetrable borgu, necessitating a diversion through some side creek, and thereby lengthening our journey considerably. I found out also 
that very often the natives only knew the way from one village to the next, so that a guide had to be taken at almost every village we passed. These villages were inhabited by the Songhais, who possesses a big herds of cattle similar to those owned by the Falanis on the Niger. There was also in each village a certain proportion of bozos, who were the fisher folk of this country. The swampy banks were the haunts of numerous warthog, and one could often get a shot at these animals from the canoe if they stopped to watch it in their stupid fashion before scuttling off into the bush. Cobb were also plentiful about these marshy streams, as were their near relatives, the Bohor reedbuck. For almost every kind of West African game which frequents marshy tracks, this was a splendid shooting country. The natives themselves hunt little, so that the game is not so shy and scared as it often is in places thickly populated with these hunters. The sunrise are too much given up to cattle and horse raising, while the bozos are quite as devoted to their fishing for either tribe to care for hunting game. The horses in this locality were some of the finest I had seen. These people make rather a speciality for natives of horse breeding. When the land is inundated and pasturage is rich, the horses are left for several months at a time in the fallow ground at the waterside. I noticed large droves of horses as we passed the banks. There were a large number of mares with foals on the higher ground, while the stallions were usually nearer the water. I had dispatched my horse by a more circuitous land route, so he would be several days later than I in arriving in Timbuktu, if indeed he ever arrived. He had been consigned to the care of the headman of the village, and was to be passed on from one to the other en route. In any case, the little beast had done me good service, and I had certainly had a good three pounds worth of value from him. On the 7th of April, we entered the Niger at a point some miles below the junction of its two branches, the Isa Bear and the Bera Isa. A short while after stopping for breakfast that morning, we passed a barge flying the French colors. The occupants were the officer in charge of the ostrich farm at Neofunki and his wife. They had been down the river for nearly three hundred miles to decide on a more suitable site for the farm, and were now on their way back to Neofunki. The lady was certainly the only European representative of her sex on that side of Kolikaru, and was regarded with great astonishment by many of the natives, who naturally had never seen a white woman before. Soon after midday, we sighted a small building on the river banks, built at the point where big backwater of the Niger quits the main stream. This was Koryomi, and is used at the port of Timbuktu instead of Kabera during the driest months of the year, as vessels are then unable to get nearer to Timbuktu owing to the lack of water. Kabera lies about five and a half miles further on, being approached by a canal. This canal is being enlarged to allow the passage of larger craft than can use it at present. Kabera consists of a collection of mud huts forming the dwellings of the transport officials and the native population. Alongside the quay lie a variety of river craft, barges, and steel, as well as wooden canoes. It is not an imposing-looking spot, but is important as the headquarters of the navigation service for the section Kabera to Ansango, a distance of nearly 400 miles. I landed and presented myself at the transport office, where I was provided with donkeys to carry my kit to Timbuktu, and I was informed that the commandant had very thoughtfully sent a horse for me to ride up to the town. All baggage is conveyed by donkeys to Timbuktu, and there are a number of men in the town who make their living by letting out donkeys for this purpose. The country immediately assumes the presence of a desert on leaving Kabera. There is a wide track worn by thousands of animals' feet leading through the soft sand across the five miles which separate Timbuktu from her port. Beyond a few scattered gum trees, mimosa, and a little coarse grass, there is nothing but sand on all sides. A short distance to the right of the road is the desert, and about halfway to Timbuktu is a monument erected to Commandant Ab, the first Frenchman to try to enter Timbuktu. He had only a small following of twenty, and perished with all his gallant men in the attempt. The monument is placed at the spot where he fell. The town was at that time in the hands of the Tuaregs, who swarmed in hundreds round his small band until they had annihilated it. Several subsequent attempts were made to capture the town before they finally succeeded. Curiously enough, the capture of Timbuktu was eventually made by a mere handful of men under a French naval lieutenant, 
and was effected by surprise. Since then, although it has several times been threatened by raiding bands of Touaregs, it has never been out of the possession of the French. On ascending a slight rise in the road, Timbuktu, the mysterious city, suddenly comes into view. As I saw it, the scene spread out before me was a strange one. In a slight depression was the town itself, a conglomeration of sandy brown buildings with flat roofs, while here and there a minaret obtruded its pointed head. Most prominent of all were three mosques, one at the east, another at the center, and the third at the west of the town. At the extreme western corner were three solitary palm trees, behind which the sun was dying, and, as its last rays caught the somber-hued houses, they were lit up and stood out more clearly from the surrounding desert, which they so closely resembled. There was something rather fascinating about this quaint desert city, so solemn and subdued did it appear to be. But on the whole, my feelings were those of disappointment, for I had expected a far more imposing-looking place. I had pictured to myself a town of fine Moorish buildings, minareted palaces, and the bright appearance of an oriental city. It had seemed to me that the influence of the Moorish occupation must be strongly impressed on Timbuktu, but this is not so to any marked extent. In point of fact, except for the three mosques, the general appearance of the town was very much like many others I had seen on my journey through western Sudan. Anyhow, in the distance, Timbuktu's chief difference lies rather in her surroundings than in her individuality. She is alone in the desert. The desert surrounds her on all sides. The Niger is no longer a feature of the scenery. All her water is obtained from wells. As a matter of fact, sometimes, when the floods have been heavier than usual, a small backwater occasionally runs up from Kabera to Timbuktu, but this soon disappears as the floods subside, and to see water above ground is a rare sight. Some of the wells are very deep, going down as much as seventy meters. The water is very good, however, and is seldom filtered. After presenting myself to the commandant, I was shown to the house of the military officer administering the district where I was to stay. My host, Captain Ferrier, was most thoughtful and obliging during my sojourn at Timbuktu, and I look back with pleasure to the pleasant days I spent with him. I was much disappointed to hear that there was no possibility of being able to cross the Sahara from Timbuktu direct, as I had arranged. It appeared that, owing to some raiding bands of southern Morocco, having descended recently through the very country by which I wanted to pass, the guides were afraid to go that way. In addition, the heat had this year been more severe than usual, and many wells were dry. At one stage, it was necessary to march ten days without water. This being the case, I had to abandon all idea of starting the desert journey from Timbuktu, as I had intended, but across the Sahara without a guide is an absolute impossibility. There was an alternative route open to me, however. This debouched from Geo, a place 270 miles further down the Niger, was considerably to the east of the route I had proposed to take from Timbuktu. In addition to the annoyance of having to alter my plans, I was now somewhat anxious whether I should be able to arrive in England by the date my leave expired, for my journey would now be lengthened by some seven hundred miles altogether. I was further delayed a few days at Timbuktu before transport could be arranged for me to go down the river to Geo. I was told that I could have a steel canoe or a barge, but the former was much faster, although not so comfortable. Before deciding, it was suggested that I should take an experimental trip in the steel canoe, as the motion in these craft is rather pronounced, and has the effect of making some people seasick. On Sunday morning, two French officers and I, having arranged a shooting picnic on the river, embarked on the steel canoe. This particular canoe was built expressly light to carry mails rapidly between Cabera and the Down River ports. She was rather narrow in the beam, and traveled at a great pace when propelled by her six paddlers. For the first half hour I did not feel much inconvenience, but after this the violent rocking motion made me feel very uncomfortable. Besides, owing to the constant shaking, reading or writing was out of the question. Finally, I must acknowledge that, on the return journey, I succumbed, and indeed so bad was I that I had a violent attack of fever before I got ashore. On landing, the transport officer at Cabera very kindly gave me a bed in his house, with plenty of blankets and quinine, so that, by the next day, 
I was much better. But this experience with the steel canoe decided me against that particular form of conveyance, and at the risk of taking a few days longer on the journey, I gave an unhesitating vote for the barge. During my enforced stay at Timbuktu, I had ample leisure to explore the sights of the place. I was introduced to an interesting freshman, who was popularly known to his friends and the natives as Yakubu. Yakubu had the reputation, which he thoroughly deserved, of knowing more about Timbuktu than any man. He had previously been a Roman Catholic father in the town, but some years ago had given up mission work for private life. He now taught native children purely from a love of teaching. Besides his knowledge of Timbuktu, he had an intimate acquaintance with Bamberas and Sonrays and their languages, which he spoke fluently. It was with Per Yakubu that I made my tour of exploration in the city. Timbuktu and the exploration of Africa during the last century are very intimately connected. Most of the principal explorers of that time paid a visit to this historic city. This was perhaps all the more natural as, at that period, the course of the Niger was a problem which puzzled everyone, and many of these travelers had in view the exploration of that river. At Timbuktu are to be seen the houses of most of these explorers, which have been identified by the French since their occupation and kept by them in a good state of repair. Starting with the earliest date comes the house of a fellow countryman, Major Laing. This British officer made an adventurous journey in 1826 from Morocco to Timbuktu through the Sahara Desert and through a land peopled with lawless fanatical Mohammedans. He accomplished his journey there without mishap, but on his return by the same route he was waylaid and killed on the desert north of Timbuktu. He is said to have been killed by the Kunta Arabs, who inhabit a portion of the Sahara north of the town, but it is a point difficult to prove. Some people say that the present chief of the Kuntas has actually in his possession Laing's diary and papers, which were never recovered, but that he is now afraid of restoring them to the French for fear of punishment. If this is the case, it must have been the present chief's grandfather who was responsible for the deed. The next traveler to pass that way was René Calais, a Frenchman and, I suppose, the most renowned French explorer of Africa. He did a wonderful journey in 1828 from Conakry in French Guinea to Morocco. He traveled down the Niger for many hundred miles on his way to Timbuktu. After him came the very great African traveler, Barth, whose house is in better preservation than any other. He was the man who traveled from Tripoli, through our British protectorate of northern Nigeria, to Timbuktu and back in 1853. Barth spent a considerable time at Timbuktu, disguised as an Arab trader, and known by the name of Abdul Karim. He had several narrow escapes, but came successfully out of all his adventures. The next house to be seen is that of Lentz, an Austrian, who journeyed from Morocco to Dakar in 1880. The interior of these houses, as of nearly all the houses in the town, is of Moorish design. There are generally an inner and an outer courtyard on a very small scale. Most of the houses have two stories, and all are built of sun-dried bricks, made of the clay which is found under the sand in the desert. The streets are narrow and tortuous. They twist and wind in such a curious manner that a guide is necessary for some time before it is possible to find one's own way in the place. At one or two points, great clay ovens are to be seen in the street. These are public property, and here the local bread is baked. It is a curious sight to watch a crowd of people gather round an oven in the daytime, each one putting in his or her loaf to be baked. This bread is made of a wheat grown at Gundam, near Timbuktu, and is black. The wheat is, I believe, the same as is grown in many parts of North Africa, making a very wholesome and nourishing food, which is the staple diet of the inhabitants. The history of the mosques brings me to discuss the origin of the greatness of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was originally the capital of a great black empire. The inhabitants were Songrays, whose territory extended practically all over the Middle Niger. The Sonre kings were men of great influence, and the town was the center of a large trade. For many years, Moors from the north and the black races from the south, east, and west used to bring their wares to its markets. The Sonre empire was far the most powerful in western Africa, 
continuing to be so till the Moorish invasion in 1482. The Moors defeated the sun rays, driving them to take refuge on the other bank of the Niger, in the Ben. They were in turn driven out of the town by the Tuaregs about the 17th century, and the Tuaregs remained in possession until the French finally captured the town at the end of last century. Timbuktu was the center of the traffic in slaves in this part of Africa, and there is no doubt that at that time it was a far larger place than it is now. The remains of old houses are frequently discovered under the sand at some distance from the existing boundaries of the city, while it seems very probable that the Niger once flowed past its walls. The sun rays certainly extended in olden times from Jenei in the south to Es Souk in the north. The latter place is now right in the Sahara, about the 21st parallel north latitude. But now this once powerful race had greatly degenerated. Since their conquest by the Moors, and then by the Tuaregs, they have been in perpetual slavery. Thus their spirit appears to have become quite crushed, and the race has been split up into little groups. We have met them in fractions all over the bend of the Niger, and they are again to be found in small parties lower down that river. They have intermarried a good deal with their last conquerors, the Tuaregs, whom they frequently resemble in features. The Negroid type of the pure song ray has in many cases almost disappeared, while they have become paler in complexion, although they are still much blacker than the Tuaregs. The mosques date from the 11th century and have curious pyramidical minarets. During the 16th century, they had arches of Moorish design added to them by the Moorish chief Mali, who then occupied the town. Here, the remarkable influence of the desert sand is noticeable, for, to get to the arches which are inside the mosques, a descent of three or four feet from the level of the street outside has to be made. This shows sand to the thickness of several feet has gradually become heaped onto the ground outside, thereby heightening the level of the surface. The chief trade of the city is salt. This is brought by large caravans periodically from the desert mines of Todene, 300 miles north of the place. The salt is cut in rectangular bars, or flat slabs, weighing each about 60 pounds. When the caravans arrive, from November till March, the price of salt is down to five francs a bar, but it rises rapidly as the hot weather goes on, so that by the month of August, a bar of salt will often cost 25 francs. These salt caravans are frequently attacked by desert highwaymen. Desert bands have been known to travel immense distances in order to attack one of them. Frequently, they make a descent from southwest Morocco, over 800 miles of the Sahara, with the object of looting the camels of the Azalai, as the big caravan of November is called. At Timbuktu, one experiences the true Saharan Sirocco, a violent wind blowing from the northeast. This wind is said to originate in the sand hills, called the Great Erg, southwest of Tunisia. It blows straight across the desert for over 1,800 miles, driving clouds of sand in front of it. There is nothing to obstruct its progress, for no mountains of any consequence lie across its path. Hence, this wind appears to be gradually pushing the Sahara further south in the vicinity of Timbuktu. It has probably been the means of isolating the town from the Niger, for it has caused the desert to encroach on the left bank of the river, converting the land here into a sandy waste. The sand I experienced hitherto was nothing compared to the sand at Timbuktu. The streets are several inches deep in soft sand, it is nearly always blowing gales of sand, and as a result of all this, every corner of a house and all one's possessions are invaded by sand. But on account of this dry atmosphere, Timbuktu is a very healthy place. Sickness of any sort is uncommon, and natives are said to be remarkable for their longevity. The only domestic animals seen in the town are camels, horses, and donkeys. There are no cows, sheep, or even goats, for the simple reason that there is nothing for these animals to eat. Camels never stay long at Timbuktu, but are sent out to pastures some distance away, where there is more desert vegetation. Donkeys seem to live on what they can pick up at Kabera, where they go most days to carry loads. Horses are fed on imported forage. Camels, of course, come in hundreds to Timbuktu, as they form the bulk of the animal transport for desert caravans. It is a strange sight to watch these hardy desert people trudging in with their camels from the vast unknown waste, 
their faces half hidden in claws to keep out the ever-blowing sand, looking weary and worn after the hardships they have had to endure on the way. Lack of water and want of food, besides the anxieties of keeping the right direction, tell on these men, imprinting on their faces a stern, careworn look. The camels are generally the property of Arabs, either the Quinta tribe, who are the nearest to Timbuktu, or the Barabish, who wander farther to the north in the desert. The best animals belong to the latter tribe, possibly because they are farther from the river, and the Niger water does not agree with these animals. Moreover, camels which live near the river naturally get into the habit of drinking more frequently than otherwise, thus losing, to a large extent, their powers of existing many days without water. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Through Timbuktu and Across the Great Sahara by Austin H. W. Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Fisher. On the 12th of April, my barge was to be ready for me at Kabara. I had asked the commandant to send a telegram to the authorities at Gao, advising them of the probable date of my arrival there, and asking that the necessary camels and guides should be ready for me. I thus hoped to avoid further delay, as time was of such importance to me. While at Timbuktu, I had gleaned some information about the probable line of wells I should follow from Gao, for I had not previously studied this part of the Sahara, but only that portion I had intended to cross from Timbuktu in accordance with my original plans. The information at Timbuktu even was very scanty, and I was told that before arriving at Gao it would not be possible to find out any more. Before leaving Timbuktu, I arranged for the dispatch of the heads and skins I had collected since leaving Bamako. They were consigned to a French firm who agreed to have them sent through their head establishment in France to my home address. They would, of course, go up the Niger and down the Senegal River to the coast. On arriving at Bamako, I had similarly arranged for the dispatch of the trophies I had collected on my way from Sierra Leone. As the Senegal River would be at its driest during the next three or four months, it was probable that my things would not arrive in England for several months. Another important matter was to cast my drafts at Timbuktu before leaving, and to lay in a supply of the most useful articles for barter en route. Below Timbuktu, very little money is used on the Niger. Salt and a blue cotton stuff are in great requisition for the purchase of anything. The cotton stuff is called Guinea by the French. If it is required to buy a fowl or sheep, the procedure is to break off a piece of salt from one of the big bars, or to tear off a small portion of the guinea and give that in exchange for the article to be purchased. The guinea is measured in coudes, or forearm lengths. Between Gao and Timbuktu, a sheep can be bought for two or three coudes, but as one gets farther from the river, on entering the desert, the price of everything naturally rises rapidly, while in many places, even untold, Guinea coudes will not tempt the native to part with his produce. I therefore converted a portion of my cash into salt and guinea. I was also advised to get in a stock of a certain kind of food, which is very useful in the desert, and not obtainable at Gao. This is called couscous. It consists merely of the wheat used for Timbuktu bread, prepared in a particular way. The wheat is unhusked, and then steamed for some hours. It is dry and very portable. At the same time, it softens quickly in a little water and is easily digested. Couscous can be carried in a bag slung across a camel and will keep for months in this manner. Frequently, there is not time to stop for a meal in the desert, when a handful of couscous can be conveniently moistened in a tumbler of water without dismounting from the camel. I took a large quantity with me and found it invaluable. It lasted me all the way across the Sahara. My barge was about sixty feet long, with a well-covered portion about thirty feet long in the center in which I lived. The rest of the space was for the crew and my servant. I had my bed pitched in one end of my room, my baggage being ranged all around it, while the table was in the center. There was plenty of room, and it was not uncomfortable. The covering was made of strong palm thatch and was high enough to give plenty of space for a man to stand upright in the room underneath. 
The barge was worked by a crew of eight and a boat swain. They generally used poles, but sometimes paddled the craft. In the early morning, until the sun got too hot, I used to sit on the top of my awning with my shotgun and rifle beside me, often getting a shot at a bird or crocodile. It was very pleasant in the fresh morning air, watching the changing scenery as we glided steadily past the banks. In the middle of the day, I used to halt, near a village if possible, for lunch. This plan gave the crew a rest and was welcomed by everyone as a chance of getting ashore. In the evening, I also used to halt for dinner, but it was then often dark before we got ashore. Sometimes, when the banks were favorable, we would tie a rope onto the mast and tow the barge, while the boatswain sat at the rudder, shouting out directions to the men on the tow line. During the heat of the day, when sitting in my room, I found ample time for an occupation in writing up my notes, which had not had as careful attention as I could have wished while I was hunting in the bend of the Niger. I cannot say that I ever found the time hanging heavily on my hands, although, of course, there were moments when I should have been very glad of a companion. At Timbuktu, I had not been sorry to part with my servant Mamadou, and had got a far better boy in his place. My new factotum was called Musa. He was a Hausa from the Zabrama country, northwest of northern Nigeria, who had been for time employed by a French officer at Timbuktu, but was now out of work. Besides being a better and more trustworthy servant, he had some experience of the desert. He had been for two years the boy of Commandant Gadel, a distinguished French officer who had traveled considerably in the eastern Sahara. Musa was a hard-working and devoted boy. He had some fairly rough times while in the desert with me, and bore all the hardships and discomforts uncomplainingly. He was a fine type of native, standing a little over six feet, with a broad chest and sturdy arms, and, like most houses, was an excellent marcher, a most indispensable asset for my servant. My crew were bomberas, who were preferred by the French as boatmen on their Niger craft. They are very strong and wonderfully enduring. My crew worked day and night for seven days continuously. By day, the whole crew were on duty, while at night they worked in two reliefs, one half resting and the other half working. We seldom halted for more than three hours per diem, an hour at midday and two hours in the evening, so that they really had very little rest. The Bomberas hold the Songhais in great contempt, forgetful of the day when the Songhai was a far more powerful individual than was the Bombera, and indeed held many of that race in slavery. But times had changed, and it was amusing to hear the scathing remarks of my boatswain as we passed a Songhai canoe or habitation. He used to say they were a miserable people, more like sheep than men, because they ate grass growing on the Niger banks. The Bomberas are rather proud and great spendthrifts, they like to live on the fat of the land, considering a man who is content with humbler diet as a miserable creature, not even worthy of pity. The first few miles of the journey, after leaving Kabera, lay through a shallow stream, which was the waterway connecting Kabera with the Niger on the east. This stream was so shallow that we had considerable difficulty in moving at all. The barge only drew about nine inches of water, but in spite of this she kept sticking on the mud. When this happened, the crew had to get out and push until we got clear. Progress was very slow. Finally, about half a mile before reaching the Niger, there was practically no water at all. Our efforts to move the barge were fruitless, and unless we got help, we seemed likely to stick for months until the water rose. Accordingly, I sent some of the crew to seek out the nearest village and bring assistance. It took some fifty men to get us out of our difficulties, and then, it was only affected by digging a trench under the barge, through which she was hauled by the triumphant, yelling mob of natives. Owing to the delay caused by the shallow water, our progress that day was not great. In twelve hours we had covered only eight miles. But during the remainder of our voyage we averaged thirty-five miles in the twenty-four hours. As this included a halt of about three hours daily, and only half of the crew were at work during the night, the result was not bad. The whole way down the river from Kabera to Geo, the banks are populated by Songhais. I must own to rather agreeing with my friend the Bombera boatswain. 
these people are certainly very wretched specimens of humanity. The Songhais on this portion of the Niger seem to have degenerated more than those whom I had hitherto met. They are absolutely poverty-stricken, and apparently make no effort to ameliorate their position. They possess practically no cattle or sheep, but live on rotting fish and grass. The former is in great evidence all down the Niger. There are tanks where the fish are caught, and drying places close by. In the latter, the fish are left to rot, when they are taken away and eaten. The stench from these places is truly disgusting. Even the Bomberas used to turn up their noses at it. The grass they eat is of two kinds, the borgu, with which I was now so familiar, and which is eaten raw, or in a kind of soup, and cram-cram. Cram-cram is a grass peculiar to desert vegetation. It is intensely prickly, and it is the seed of this that is boiled and eaten by the Songhais of this locality. Cram-cram is a very nourishing seed I was given to understand. The flocks of the desert are very partial to this grass, as are also camels. It has the annoying habit of sticking to one's legs as one walks through it, just as burrs do in England. Cram-cram is worse, however, than a burr, because it breaks up into countless little prickles, each one so fine that it can hardly be seen. These prickles have points as sharp as a needle, which stick into the fingers of the hapless victim, and are hard to extract because they are so hard to locate. I once saw a French officer who had a little dog which was suffering from cram-cram. The poor little creature was in tortures, and unable to withdraw these miniature daggers from his toes. It took some time and patience on our part before we could relieve him of all of them. In some places we would pass a temporary village of Fulanis who had come down to the waterside to allow their cattle to graze on the luxuriant borgu. Occasionally, also, we would see an encampment of Tuaregs who had selected the spot as favorable for their flocks of sheep and goats. These people generally stay on the higher ground to the north of the river, but at this season, when the grass is scorched by the hot sun and grazing is poor for their animals, they approach the Niger in order to find pasturage for their flocks. The river here is more than half a mile wide in its navigable channel, but there are besides several hundred yards of borgu swamps on either side. Near the villages, a channel is cut through this stuff by which canoes can approach. Otherwise, it forms an impenetrable mass on the edges of the water. In the hot season, the borgu is left isolated at the river falls until it dies away for want of moisture, for water is a necessity to the existence of this grass. On the left bank, the desert seems to commence almost as soon as the water is left. Stretches of sand, with a little stunted vegetation, characterize the country on this side of the Niger. The ground rises in a series of parallel sand dunes towards the interior. On the right bank, there is more vegetation and apparently more human life. On the 15th, we arrived at the post of Bamba. This little place is practically the most northern point of the bend of the Niger. For this reason, it has been a favorite objective for the marauding bands of the desert in the past, and even now is sometimes ascended on by a party of these intrepid highwaymen should they find a good opportunity. It is naturally easier for them to raid the place geographically nearest their desert wilds and then escape before retribution is visited upon them. At Bamba, there are a French commissioner and a European in charge of the post and telegraph office. One curious feature of Bamba is the existence of a few date palms. These were planted by the Moors during their occupation of the country about A.D. 1500 and are practically the only ones in the western Sudan. Dates seen in the country are generally imported from the oases of the Sahara, many hundred miles to the northward. Here, much to the delight of my crew, I gave them a present of a sheep, and made a longer halt than usual that evening to give them time to cook it. The commissioner, with whom I had dined, came down to the river to see me off, as I started about 9 p.m. The effects of a heavy meal of sheep had evidently been too much for my bamberas, for I found them one and all sleeping soundly and snoring lustily. We had great difficulty in arousing them from their torpor, so that it was considerably after the appointed hour when we got under way. There was a fair breeze blowing, of which we took advantage to hoist our sail. 
The river in this section runs almost due east, and, as the wind is usually from the east or northeast, we had not previously had an opportunity of trying to sail. Under the starry sky we sped rapidly along, and I sat outside for some time, enjoying the cool air and the beautiful tropical night. In the early morning the wind shifted to its accustomed quarter, and we found ourselves opposed by a strong easterly gale. Generally speaking, this wind lasted from 5 a.m. till 11 a.m., and we made but little progress during these hours. Small wavelets would play over the face of the Niger, and heavy spray would be blown on board. The river was now at its widest, and from shore to shore must have been well over three miles. How strange it seemed to look at this vast, broad stream, and to think of its appearance when I first saw it at its birth, near the Tembekunda Mountains. It had traveled far since those days, having covered about twelve hundred miles. This portion of the river contains many islands, which are covered by water when the Niger rises, but are the habitation of Fulani and Tuareg with their herds and flocks at this time of the year. Landing on these islands for the evening halt, one was always sure of finding some duck and teal in the ponds and swamps upon them. The red-fronted gazelle and cob are plentiful. The former is found chiefly on the left bank, as being more sandy and desert-like, while the latter has its favorite haunts on the right bank, where the marshy ground is suited to its habits. On the left bank I was informed there were giraffe, but I never saw their tracks. I think, however, that it is very probable giraffe are found between Bamba and Borum, where the country seems well suited to them. Senegal hartebeest are on both banks. In the river there are a few hippo pools, but hippopotami do not seem as plentiful here as they had been higher up the Niger. The stately marabout and the picturesque crown bird were both familiar objects of the Niger landscape. The latter bird was particularly common about here and was easy to approach. The crown bird, or crested crane, is certainly one of the handsomest birds found on this part of the Niger, for its fine plumage and quaint straw-colored crest at once distinguish it from the ordinary waterfowl here seen. On the 16th of April, about 7 a.m., we approached the Defile of Tosse. This was rather an interesting point in the Niger scenery, for here, for the first time since the rapids of Kienafalo, near Bamako, the river gathers a more rapid current. On the whole, the Niger current is sluggish, as the fall of the land from the Tembukunda Mountains to the sea is so gradual. But at Tosse, the stream is forced through a narrow defile, and the water, which as before was spread over a breadth of at least two miles, is compressed into a width of five hundred to six hundred yards. The rush of water is remarkable in comparison to the slow, steady flow to which we had so long been accustomed. The entrance to the defile is a pretty sight. On either side there begins to appear a low ridge of laterite rocks, which gradually rises to a height of forty feet above the level of the stream in a precipitous mass. The whole length of the defile is three miles, while three distinct rocky barriers cross the river transversely. These transverse barriers render navigation dangerous and arduous. A fourth barrier, passing longitudinally up and downstream, divides the waterway into two nearly equal passages. The current flows at a rate of six to eight knots an hour at this time of year, but when the river is in full flood, the rush of water must be tremendous. In the channels themselves, there are numerous jagged rocks projecting or half hidden under water. Navigation, therefore, is a risky business, and the frail native canoes often get dashed to pieces against one of them. There is an old French fort at a bend in the defile, perched on the top of the rocks on the right bank. The place is now disused, but was built originally to command the Dossé defile when the French first occupied this portion of the country. Except for this narrow fringe of rocks on each side, the country is of a sandy nature, covered with the usual sparse desert-like vegetation. On emerging from the defile, the transition is almost as rapid as it was on entering Tosse, for the rocks rapidly disappear, the river quickly resumes its former width, and the current reverts to its normal pace. About twenty miles below Tosse is the post of Borum. The chief interest of Borum lies in the fact that it is at the mouth of the Wad Telemsi, 
or wood Tlemcy. This is a dried-up watercourse, descending from the heart of the Sahara to the river Niger. In olden times, it must have been an important tributary of the river, but now water does not flow in it above the surface. Below the surface, however, there is water, and for this reason there is a well-defined line of wells along the watercourse, and it forms a trade route for caravans traveling from the Sahara to the Niger. It follows that Borum is a place frequented by caravans, although it is not of much importance in itself, and these caravans merely use it as a halting place and route to the bigger markets of Gao or Timbuktu. At Borum there is found a curious colored clay which is used for houses. There are three colors of this clay, pink, violet, and white. The town itself lies up a small branch of the Niger, about five miles from the main stream. When the river is at its fullest, the main stream covers all the intervening land, making one wide expanse of water with a small branch, and at this period, Borum has a Niger flowing at its very walls. The town is built on a high rise of ground, so it is at all times clearly visible from the Niger. Soon after leaving Tasse, and before arriving at Borum, the river takes a decided turn southeast as it enters on its course down the big bend. Between this point and a prominent spur on the left bank, called Mount Tondibi, the width again increases to over four miles. As Gayo is approached, the width decreases to about two miles, and the channel is interrupted by several islands and large masses of borgu. On the right bank, a ridge of sand hills makes its appearance, running close to the water's edge. This part of the country is the center of a large rice-growing population, the quality of whose rice, if not the quantity, compares favorably with that grown in Messina. At the landing stage at Gao, I was met by a French officer, who conducted me to the commandant. As it was late that evening, the commandant would not hear of business being discussed till the following day. I was given a comfortable dwelling in the officers' mess quarters, who, with their usual hospitality, insisted on my remaining their guest during my stay at Gao. On landing at Gao, the first sight which strikes the visitor is a number of huge skulls of elephant set up on high pedestals adorning the front of the fort. These animals have been shot at various times by the officers stationed at Gao, and their skulls have been put to this rather singular use. Gao is quite the best planned station on the upper and middle Niger. A fine avenue of trees has been planted along the river bank. Behind this lie the commandant's house, the fort, and the native quarter, respectively. The native quarter has been built some distance away from the Europeans' houses, so that there is a fine open space between them. The houses are substantially built, with big rooms and lofty flat roofs. The desert is behind the town, so that its well-to-do appearance is all the more striking. I came across a class of people here whom I had not previously met. These were the Armas. They are a fusion of the Moorish and Songhai races, and are found in small groups between Bamba and Gao. Apparently, they are lazy, good-for-nothing people, who consider themselves superior to the Songhais and refuse to work. Now that slavery and serfdom are rapidly dying out, this tribe will find existence somewhat difficult unless they change their habits. The officer administering Gao told me he had given them notice that if they did not shortly show some intention of working, he would turn them out of the town. In appearance, they are more like the Moors than the Songhais, but are darker than the former. They have their own quarter in the place and also have a mosque to themselves. There are two fine mosques at Gao one of which is three centuries old. At Gao, I used to stroll in the evening on the flat roof of my abode and gaze over the vast desert stretched out in front of me, wondering what adventures that solemn, forbidding expanse held in store for me. The commandant had arranged for camels for me and a guide, but they would not be ready for a few days, so I had a little time to complete my preparations. In the meantime, the commandant did his best to dissuade me from attempting to cross the desert, wishing me to return to Europe through Dahomey, which was the quickest way from Gao. His reasons were that my journey would be difficult and dangerous, my chances of arriving at the other end of the Sahara in safety were remote. He said that quite recently 
They had had reports of the movement of a marauding party of Arabs, who were within easy reach of the line of wells I should probably follow. Further, there was a bad stretch of desert to be crossed, called the Tanzeruft, in which there were no wells for seven days, and at this hot season of the year, the passage of this waterless tract would be particularly arduous. I dare say he felt that it was his duty to try to dissuade me from my enterprise, and probably thought besides that he might be held responsible should any mishap befall me. With some difficulty, I explained that before leaving the Sierra Leone, I was aware of the hardships and dangers likely to be encountered, and that I should be extremely foolish to turn back at this point of my travels. Moreover, having obtained permission for the journey, I had no intention of abandoning it now. I think he was finally convinced that I was firm in my resolves, and he then gave up further attempts to shake them. To avoid any possibility of blame being attached to him in the event of any accident to me, I signed a paper stating that he had tried to make me abandon my desert journey, but in spite of his warnings, I decided to carry it out. He was particularly distressed because he could not send an escort with me, for in the hot season most of the camels with troops were out of pasturage, and many had not recovered from their hard work of the previous cold season. However, I told him I had never expected to have an escort, and he must not be anxious on that account. As it happened, he was sending some stores and ammunition to a French detachment at a place called Kedal, about 170 miles north of the Sahara, and so it was arranged that this escort should accompany me as Kedal lay on my route. In the meantime, we arranged a small hunting expedition to occupy the time till my camels should be ready. One of the French officers and I planned to go out to a place about one day's march distance to hunt giraffe. We pitched our camp a few miles from the Niger on its right bank. It was a place with a reputation for being frequented by giraffe, and I had great hopes of getting a shot at one. The country was of the usual sandy nature, with a certain amount of mimosa and scrubby vegetation. The giraffe is extremely fond of the mimosa tree, so it seemed likely that I might find them at their feeding time about here. This interesting animal is very hard to see, as its curious speckled color assimilates well with the sandy surroundings, while its long neck peeps through the leafy top of the mimosa and is hardly discernible. Giraffes come down to the Niger to drink at night, returning before dawn to their feeding grounds in the interior, and for this reason, they are difficult to come across. Besides, they are very shy. A giraffe will usually perceive you long before you have perceived him, and he can travel both fast and far in a day. A curious fact about the giraffe near Gao is that they are often said to break the telegraph wire with their long necks as they go down to the Niger to drink, for they do not notice the thin wire as they pass it. It seems a pity that large numbers of the giraffe are slaughtered annually by the natives for their skins, which are used to make shoe soles, purses, etc. The giraffe is only found in comparatively few places now, and it is to be feared that it will soon be exterminated in this part of Africa should stringent measures not be adopted to prevent its wholesale massacre. The giraffe here seem generally to be in small numbers. I never notice the tracks of more than three together. In those cases, there seem to be one a great deal smaller than the other two, which makes one imagine that they do not breed much, there being only one baby in most of these families. The natives hunt giraffe on horseback, pursuing them many miles inland until they get weary when they are easier to approach. A horse will generally wear down a giraffe, although the latter has a greater turn of speed. Our camp, Ganga Bear, was suddenly broken up by the news that the camels and guide would be ready two days sooner than I had expected, so we returned to Gao at once without getting a shot at Giraffe. End of chapter 18